live? Already are we live? Already are we live? Oh. And do we have an issue with the neck? We have an issue with the neck. We have an issue with the neck. We have an issue. Okay. Are we good now? Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is November 18th, the regular meeting of the Santa Clara Unified School District uh, Board of Trustees. And um, we are starting with a um, work study session uh, this evening. So we will start with our um, roll call. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, Trustee Canova. Trustee Fairchild. Here. Trustee Gonzalez. Okay, Trustee Lieberman. Here. Trustee Raderman. Here. Trustee Ryan. Absent. And I am here, so um, we are missing Trustee Canova, Gonzalez, and Ryan. Uh, introduction of our translator. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Veronica Eros Navarro. Angelica Benitez y yo seremos los intérpretes en español de esta noche. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams Navarro. Angélica Benítez Navarro. Angélica Benítez y yo las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprima el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma en español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, next we have and the and Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Dr. Kemp, do you mind? Good evening, everybody. If you please stand and put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so next we have our district uh, mission and vision statements. So I will read those, the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. And our vision is that graduates at Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda or any changes to the agenda. Motion to approve, Rotterman. Okay, so we have a motion by Trustee Rotterman and a second by Trustee Lieberman. And do we have any um, comments? Yes, I would like to pull four items from consent. Item 15, 18, 31, and 32. Okay. Uh, Those numbers, please. 15, 18, 31, and 32. Okay, so just so we are all on the same page, those are consent items. 15 is service provider agreement between San Andreas Regional Center and Santa Clara Unified School District. Number 18, consulting service agreement within Envision Learning Partners. Item 31. Consultant contract renewal with leadership associates for coaching services for business partnership manager and 32 amendment to the 21-22 consulting contract with Glenn Ishiwata for principal coaching services. Did I get that right, Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Okay, so we will um, take those after um, we are done with con the consent approval. Any other changes? Okay, is the uh, maker of the motion, Trustee Ratterman, are you okay with that? I'm okay with it, but it doesn't really matter because per board policy, any board member any can, board pull, member can. Uh, consent item at any time. True enough, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a motion on the floor. Do I need to repeat the motion for those just arriving? 
You're okay. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor to accept the agenda, except with pulling consent items, which would mean it is L.15, L.18, L.31, and L.32. Um, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes unanimously. Um, that would be, sorry, one, two, three, would, that would pass six to zero with Trustee Canova absent. Just for a point of clarification, what will those become in terms of uh, the regular agenda? Um, well, I said we would take them right after consent. So I was, I was going to leave them at L. That's what we did last time. That's fine, great, thank you. So they'll stay L um, dot and um, we'll just take them. So no one then show up, so thank you. Yep, that sound good? All righty. So then uh, next on the agenda is our board study session 2020-2021 district student data review. So I will um, turn this over to Dr. Kemp. And good evening trustees. Uh, this evening for the first time in nearly two years, we're bringing to you uh, student data uh, at performance report um, regarding the um, elements which we report to the state and also um, to the feds uh, for student performance. I wanna say thank you to the team. As you can see, we have a lot of staff in the room this evening who've been preparing uh, tonight's report. And I wanna thank them for pulling this together for you um, this evening. We have a process uh, and there is some engagement for you as trustees this evening in the presentation. And so we will um, have an assignment to you later on uh, as we go through the presentation. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Mr. Stam. Thank you, Dr. Kemp and uh, good evening board. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to, along with uh, Liz gordon Stoll, our coordinator of data assessment accountability, with support from Dr. Brenda Carrillo, our Director of Student Services and Kathy Knievel, Assistant Superintendent for Education Services, to engage you in an interactive study session tonight around the current state of student engagement, social emotional well-being, and academic progress. Um, I believe you have a data packet, which was also posted on the board agenda, which parallels the slide presentation tonight. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Before we get to our goals for tonight and to the data itself, I wanna ground our conversation in our three district priorities. These priorities guide and align our work as a district staff, regardless of department or school or discipline or program. They reflect our core district values of students first, excellence through continuous improvement, equity and social justice, and world leading and future ready. They are used data to improve adult practices and student outcomes focus on our most vulnerable students first to close the gap and create high performing systems. With regards to the second priority, I do wanna acknowledge that we support the term furthest from success or furthest from opportunity as an alternative to most vulnerable in describing our students um, and are considering updating language in the priorities for next year as well, because we wanna be assets and strengths focused in our language. Next slide, please. We realize we actually have less than an hour in which to cover a wide range of data. And so we've settled upon a participatory divide and conquer approach. We are inviting individual board members to each analyze a particular area of student data and to share two or three data observations and inferences. I believe that uh, Dr. Kemp has a, a data focus area for each board member and we'll get to that process in just a minute. Next slide, please. One of the system elements in Vision 2035 is the creation of a data-driven improvement culture. The bullets on this slide reflect key strategies we're pursuing to create that culture. We want data to be accessible and understandable to all stakeholders, and especially our students. We realize that we do have a ways to go in this regard. Like most school districts, we've relied historically on annual summative data, especially standardized test scores. We've also realized and as an education community that this type of data has done little to help teachers make informed decisions about student learning needs. We're shifting our focus to invest in diagnostic, formative, and progress monitoring data that are usable or actionable in real time. We're engaging with teachers around collecting formative assessment data daily from their students and using tools like iReady to get a clearer picture of what students have learned and what misconceptions or gaps in learning they may have to inform instructional decision-making. 
And we're identifying more sources of data related not just to achievement, but also access, opportunity, and disproportionality to inform our planning and decision-making at the school and system level. Our collaboration framework and our PLCs are grounded in the collaborative examination of a range of student data to inform planning and next steps. And while most of the data we'll be sharing tonight is quantitative, there is some qualitative survey data. We're working with our teachers and administrators to build their qualitative data collection muscle through survey, classroom, and student observations and interviews of various stakeholders. Currently, as an example, our administrators will be interviewing three to five students who they have identified as being furthest from opportunity to hear their perspectives, their voice, on what it's like being a student in our district, their successes and challenges, hopes, fears, needs, and dreams. We look forward to seeing what we learn from all of that student voice data in the new year. Ultimately, we seek to empower students to be more at the center of their own learning, to know their strengths, their areas of growth, and their learning progress, and to be able to communicate that to their family members, their teachers, and their peers. This helps them set goals, make decisions, and take hold of their educational careers as empowered learners. This is the ultimate goal of Vision 2035. Next slide, please. So Liz has passed out to you a copy of the data inquiry tool that's also on pages four to five of the study session packet that was attached to the board agenda. You can use this copy to record your data observations, interpretations, and questions. It's essentially the data analysis tool that we've been introducing around the district to support PLCs and school leadership teams to use as part of their data inquiry cycles. So the next slide. And so this is where I think we have, um, these are the different areas uh, for data inquiry. And you can see the packet uh, page number and then the title um, for the data. And then we just need uh, the board members to know which area. All right, so trustee number one, so focus slide 11 will be Jody. Uh, well, the well, number. Could I ask the question? Oh. I'm a little concerned. This is really important information that I would love all input from all the board members. And if we don't have time to really discuss it tonight, uh, we should have planned more time. I mean, to come here and say that we're gonna, you, you're gonna look at the, these pages and you get to discuss them. I really value my uh, other trustees' opinions. Um, and so I'm, I'm just kind of taken aback right now that we're not doing a, a real deep data dive. This, I, I'm just trying to process the way you're, you've structured this. We're gonna have you look at individual data sets and then you're going to share out with, your, with the other trustees what you see in the data and have a discussion around this. Yeah, so it, it's not precluding any deep discussion. It's just asking each board member to take the lead in starting the discussion on a particular focus area. So we'll be able to have discussions on all of the pages. It's just um, having one person sort of look at it to start the discussion. That's correct. I just wonder why staff isn't starting the discussion. I'm just, and it, that's fine. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. I see the nod. All right. So number one, Jody. Number two, we'll have Vicki. Three, Bonnie, uh, Jim, you're number four, Andy, number five, Michelle, number six, and Albert, number seven. Albert, number seven. So, Andy, you'll be looking at slide number 22. And there also are related slides 23, 20, 26, and 27 for you. Just to clarify, I don't think this slide is in the printed set that we just received. So, um, so how much of this information do I need to write down to make sure that I'm doing so that each trustee is doing the right thing. Do I need do I need the whole row when we get to that point? That's that's me. So there's no staff presentation on any of these areas. 
Okay. Can can you use a microphone, please, for the audience? Yes. We will we will be discussing and presenting. We were going to take a, just a few minutes to allow you to dive in on a slide and look, uh, make some observations, have some questions, and so that the presentation could be more interactive. And just to confirm with, um, since our packet might be a little bit different than yours, when it says packet page 10 uh, for attendance and absenteeism, I'm showing that as the page that says current attendance and chronic absenteeism. So that is the right page, right? Okay, great. So everyone should make sure that they write down the packet page number for their area and uh, the data title and the related page. Um, so the order again was... So, so let me go back through this. So sure. Jody is um, packet page 10, you're number one. Vicki is packet page 12. Bonnie is packet page 14. Jim, you're packet page 17. Andy, packet page 19. Michelle's 21. And Albert, you're 23. Okay, thank you. So uh, please continue. Okay. This is an experiment. <laughs> We're trying to engage in the, the type of data inquiry process that we, we do with administrators and with teachers and all of that. And in the spirit of a study session versus a, a just a straight, straight up presentation. Um, so apologies in advance if, for the awkwardness. Um, next slide, please. So just a very quick overview of uh, demographic information. Um, this is a snapshot as of October 25th in comparison to October of 2020. Um, the enrollment of white students has continued to decline from 19 to 18% approximately. Hispanic Latino student enrollment has increased back to the 2018 enrollment level and all other enrollment by ethnicity has stayed about the same, less than a one point increase or decrease. English as primary language continues to increase up a point from last year. Spanish as primary language remains stable and is by far the largest primary language after English and other primary languages remain about the same compared to last year. Enrollment or identification of economically disadvantaged students has declined significantly from 40% to about 25%. Students with IEPs have remained about the same and emergent Bilingual English learner students have shown an increase of 11%. Additional uh, other student groups enrollment foster youth showed uh, close to a doubling from 15 to 28 students. McKinney Vento eligible students uh, showed a decrease of about 25% from 68 to 52. And migrant youth showed a decrease of 32% from 63 students to 43 students. Next slide, please. So with Vision 2035 and the rollout of the strategic plan, we're deepening and redoubling our commitment to an integrated approach to supporting and measuring the progress of the whole child, eventually to be aligned with our graduate portrait. I realize that many of you who have been on the board for some time recognize patterns in the data, all too familiar, equity gaps between subgroups. And we also see in the data, the adverse impact of the pandemic, in particular on our student groups currently furthest from opportunity and success. You're probably wanting to ask, so what are we doing about it? One answer to that question is on this slide. It's about making a shift from a reliance solely on a myriad of programmatic solutions that may address a specific need to systemic solutions that empower and equip both teachers, other staff and students themselves to better understand student learning and wellness needs in the moment and in the classroom, set goals for improvement, apply tailored supports and monitor progress at frequent intervals. This is a whole child continuous improvement focus that is inclusive and grounded in a multi-tiered system of support with a clear equity imperative. We anticipate having a district MTSS plan in early January 
with a focus on tier one interventions in the classroom and evidence-based practices, and a framework for high quality MTSS implementation that will create a common language and understanding for how we structure specific supports in the academic behavioral and social emotional domains across schools, something that we have not had before. It will allow schools to self-assess and set goals to further develop their system. And it will align our professional development offerings and help us to identify gaps in that support as well. The MTSS framework encompasses not just three tiers, but three domains, social, emotional, behavioral, and academic. And we've organized the data around these three domains this evening. Next slide. The first domain in which we're reporting data is social emotional. We traditionally shared data on attendance and absenteeism, and it's been a while since we've reported on cell survey data. A new area of wellness includes the academic counselors counseling needs assessment. Our academic counseling department has administered this survey to sixth through 12th grade students in the first quarter of the school year for the last two years. The counselors use this data at the site level to tailor their services to students. And the data is used at the district level to guide resource allocation, planning and professional learning needs in the area of social emotional learning and We're wellness. Still We're still getting better as a system at collecting data and integrating the data to get a better picture of students' health and wellness in their, pro in their progress in this domain. So I'm gonna turn over to Liz, so and she's going to give us some time uh, for everybody to dig into their data in parallel as well. Next, so we can go into, if we can move on to the next slide. And Jody, if you'd, how to, if you wanted to take a minute or we can take a couple minutes for everybody to look at their individual sites, because again, in, in the spirit of being interactive and engaging in some conversation, that's, we just wanted to start the conversation. Um, so the slide that we actually asked you to look at was, has, is the next slide, um, which shows current attendance and chronic absenteeism. And then we can also look at this, our attendance patterns over time um, and again, you can see the effect um, in particular this year of um, what we are fairly certain is our, our COVID um, requirements um, of students missing more school. Um, and if you look at how that's affected our current year to date attendance um, on the, we can actually go to the next slide, Greg. Well, um, on the le top left hand side, 95% um, is considered, below 95% is considered not satisfactory. And you can see year to date, we're getting close to the not satisfactory attendance overall. And you can see the effect of um, number of days absence on the top right, um, that it's primarily affecting Hispanic, Latino, Latinx students, and the student groups that are below 95% average daily on the left-hand bottom and the student groups with highest chronic absenteeism, which is defined as students missing 10 or more days for any reason at the year to date. So, so we'll let Jody, since that was Jody's slide, if that's, if that's okay, we can, if Jody questions, observations, and then I don't think I, we, didn't, I mean, we didn't really have time to dig in to look at our slides individually. So okay. are we gonna, if we're gonna do that, we probably need time. Let's, so let's take five minutes to look at your individual slides and then we'll, have, we'll start the conversation. That's okay, the then I'm ready in five minutes. Just to ask one quick question. The absentees here for any reason, including excused absences like we've got COVID. Andy, could you Andy, turn you on your mic, your mic and speak into it? on it, I'll talk into it. There we go, thank you. So just to clarify, these are for excuse, absences for any reason, including excused absences, like if you got ill and you had to stay out for two weeks to COVID or something like that, Correct. it would also reflect here. Correct. Um, the research on chronic absenteeism is that students being out of school for any reason has a, has a detrimental effect on their education. Thank you. Yes, and you can jot notes on your tool if you'd like to do that while you're looking at the slide. So we'll take five minutes to do that and, and come back to our conversation, starting with attendance and absenteeism.
Does anyone need another minute? Okay, then why don't we continue? Okay, so am I up okay. first? Yes. So um, looking at the um, attendance and absenteeism information, I mean, you, you summarized a number of things. So the things that popped out at me is one, uh, you mentioned that at 95, under 95% is considered unsatisfactory and we are very close to that. So that, um, that is concerning that so many people are out, so many kids are out and, and um, we're close to that number. Um, I, I, it, it's always um, dismaying to me um, when our Hispanic and Latina, Latinx numbers are so high and they continue to be, and throughout this whole document, those numbers continue to be high and that's troubling. We need to get that under control that um, if they're not in school, they can't be learning. And that, you know, so that can carry you all the way through. Um, and then, and I'm, I'm being very brief here because we don't have much time. I ask everyone to be really brief, but, and then the, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting was when you look at the chart in the upper right that says number of days absent by ethnicity year to date and Hispanic is quite high. They are the highest by far, but then the next highest is Asian. And I thought that that was very surprising because um, I don't see that affecting that population uh, academically as much as it does others is my guess. And so how is it, why is it that this group has these high numbers what's behind that and um, you know, is there something going on there, but you know, and why doesn't it affect them? Maybe there's, there's other factors of course involved, but um, if we got more Asians and whites as well as Hispanics to be in class, then our total um, absenteeism rate would go down. Yes, I think that in the same way that the, that COVID and distance learning may not have affected certain student groups. Um, that that the effect, the educational effect, may not be the same on student groups as it is for, in particular, for low-income students, mm -hmm. um, at, which tends to overlap with Hispanic Latinx students as well. Yeah. Okay. Comments from other board members, um, Trustee Fairchild. Thank you. Um, when you look at the attendance um, and you take out the COVID years for both 2018, 2019 and 21, 22, your satisfactory attendance numbers are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And what you have is a difference in the at-risk moderate and severe, particularly an increase for the moderate and severe. So um, I find that to be interesting. But my question to you, because I know we're looking at what the state has mandated in the past, is what are the averages when we look at other districts? Because certainly that data is available. And is our data um, consistent with what we're seeing statewide? That's a good question. Most of that data we get in arrear, it, it will, we won't know that until next year. So that year to date data is not something that's published um, from other districts. I mean, we could certainly ask. And so I guess the follow up question would be um, Have you heard things from our county superintendent or state about how they plan to handle absences this year, especially with the mandated absences for COVID? This is part of the part of our um, uh, work through the superintendent's council to advocate to the state for. Uh, relief on the accountability measures that we have. Um, all districts are dealing with similar uh, problems across the state. And so to hold us harmless for another year has been the ask that's been put out there to the to CDE. We don't have any, any information on that yet, Vicki. Okay, any other comments on this page? Uh, Trustee uh, Ratterman? Yeah, the I, I appreciate the all absenteeism hurts our kids. What is more important to me, some of this absenteeism is, re, is necessary, it's required. If you've got a highly communicative disease, you need to not be at school. The question I have, what, what, what jumped out to me at the page isn't on the page at all. And that is, what do we do for this kid that's been out for two weeks or three weeks 
and he comes back in, what type of what type of recovery process, what mitigations do we do to get him back up to speed so that that absenteeism doesn't really cause a continuous, I mean, this kid's now behind. And so he's always trying to play catch up all year. He's trying to catch up unless something is done to bring him back up to speed quickly through extra, probably extraordinary efforts. <laughs> so first off, I do want to say just on um, the instructional and student services side that the county is um, pulling together a community practice of practice around attendance because we're all in that same situation. Um, as far as mitigate, mitigation when they have been out right now, what we're doing is um, students, if they're out uh, because they're and they're well, so we have a process and a procedure for teachers. If they're out and they're well because they're waiting for their test. My granddaughter has been out three times for three weeks waiting for COVID tests. Then they actually um, can participate in their Google Classroom and, and continue to try to keep up with work if they're feeling well. Of course, if they're not feeling well, we don't want them working. And so then we slip into the protocol that we've always had based on our um, board policy that work is collected for them that wherever possible, our, our AR says that teachers will give um, um, an assignment that is uh, aligned with what they had done. It can't always be exact because they're not there and that they would have that amount of time that they were out to go ahead and make up that time. Now that does not talk about acceleration and we're just trying every way we can. Some of it is the after school programs. Um, and with all of that, we face um, trying to find teachers that are willing to do that. And we do have some that are stepping up to do that. And we don't have an issue with teachers refusing to do makeups or anything like that. That's all covered. Well, hopefully I would love to see us come up with something extraordinary to take care of those kids. It's not their fault. And we wanna make sure that they get good opportunity and, and bad luck doesn't cause them harm. Yeah, I think the greater the greater challenge is for students who are disengaged from school um, and where COVID has exacerbated that disengagement, how we make school more inviting and more engaging for those students so that they wanna return and can see themselves as successful in school. And that is a, a challenge that we are continuing to grapple with. Hopefully you're gonna to want to invite us back. <laughs> An hour is clearly not enough time. Um, Vicki, do you wanna talk about the increase in wellness needs slide? And then, <clears throat> and I believe that um, Dr. Carrillo is gonna to speak to the, the strategies around re-engagement um, from student services, which is that slide 21. Um, Greg, you can advance, um, I think two, two slides and feel free to ask about the social emotional learning. Again, that's a whole, that could be at least an hour presentation just talking about the um, social emotional learning survey that we now have three years of data for. Um, yeah, I was actually wanting more information on what was actually covered in those various categories. And so I really, can we get that? <laughs> yes, I will share. Okay. In fact, the document itself has live, live links in it. Okay. And so I, if we can get, have permission to share that with you all with the live links, it has the links to all of the questions in each of the categories. Okay, because it, it was, I mean, it's like, okay, that's interesting, but I don't know what is in there. As far as the increase in wellness needs, this is not a surprising. My questions though, I have some questions. Um, does this include the data from the school psychologists? who also do threat assessments, have drop-ins, um, case? Yes, it includes um, comprehensive threat assessments. Okay, um, and what about the drop-ins and check-ins from in that department as well? The drop-ins the drop and check-ins that are reflected here are related to wellness. Are only wellness, only. Only wellness. And this is one of the things that I, I know I've struggled with as a board member is that we tend to think of wellness as, as one location. And we have various professionals on each school site that are handling wellness needs. And sometimes we ignore those that are um, the students who have maybe some learning needs and 
wellness needs who may go to the school psychologist or their case manager, and they're not reflected in the numbers. And so um, I don't know, I think that might be an interesting thing to look at because I do know as far as the threat assessments, I've done threat assessments myself, um, that they are being done by, by both parties. Um, as far as the drop-ins and check-ins, it would be helpful to know, it's nice to see the numbers as far as uh, the referrals, like there's the top reason for the care referrals, but what's the top reason for the drop-in drop-ins? And because I do know that like when I've visited the wellness, there was a drop-in lunch group and is all the 10 kids that show up and hang out at lunch, is that considered 10 people every day they show up? I would like to know a little more data, uh, information about what this number represents because it could represent a lot of things. And so, sorry, I am a school psychologist. So you, you put this in front of me and there's just not a lot of good information here, sorry. Um, and, but again, it's not surprising that we have seen these referrals. We know the kids are struggling with the depression and anxiety. I'm glad to see the classroom presentations. I would love to know what the classroom presentations have been about, you know, um, and to what grade levels. And so that would be the type of information that would give me more to comment on. So I don't know if that makes sense. I will, I will say that our classroom presentations, um, given COVID and even the return to school, have really increased significantly because the one-on-one -on -one the one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, counseling referrals have sort of, sort of decreased. So we're trying to hit more students in classrooms. We're trying to provide those tier one interventions with teachers and model that behavior and provide a lot of coaching. So we can certainly provide you with more information on what that looks like. Thank you. I also just okay. wanted to mention that the integrated approach that you're advocating for is something that is being developed um, and with strong leadership support as well on the counseling side as well as side for an, a case management approach where information is shared uh, around students. So, and I know Matt Baldwin has been playing a, playing a role in that as well. So we're, we're optimistic about the, the potential of that as it continues to evolve. And um, Trustee Ratterman, you have a question? Yes, um, I just wanna make sure I understand um, the little notes at the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna read the very last one. Before the pandemic, our district had an average of 30 counseling associates every year. This year, the number of counseling associates dropped to 14, having fewer than half. You know, obviously this is a staffing issue. This is a resource issue. So um, we know that we need, we're going to have an increase in, in, in this area. I mean, it's just obvious to anybody that the pandemic is gonna create more, more need. So. I'm curious about why we have a resource issue. Is it lack of availability? Is it we're not paying enough? Is it, you know, that to me should be something when we have only half of our resources to something this important, I would think we need to, that needs like a crisis level. Let's, what are we gonna do to fix this? What depth, if we have to give bonuses, if we have to give more money, if we have to do whatever, there should be a full court press in my mind to get these, these folks on board and servicing their kids. So I don't know if you've got a comment or if that's a safe one for you to comment on, but because it's kind of falls back to us to make sure those resources are available to you. And um, I wasn't aware that we were, maybe I just not listening, but I wasn't aware that we're this severely uh, depressed in resources. Right. Yeah, the, the issue of mental health um, personnel across not only our county, but across the nation is, is an issue. We have more mental health needs in our communities and our hospitals and our healthcare facilities. And so we're, we have a lot of competition for our healthcare um, and mental health care providers. We also have people who have left and moved on, folks who no longer wish to provide um, services, uh, you know, uh, different things like that. We are well aware and have been working since the summer to replace some of those positions, including assessing whether our salary schedule is, is competitive um, and other ways that we can incentivize uh, recruiting staff. We do have a social work intern program that we brought in this year to try to fill in some of those gaps, which I'll talk about in just a, a little while, trying to be as creative as possible in meeting the needs um, that we know exist out there. I see some creative ideas there. I, I'm, my hope, and this would come from us or from superintendent that we uh, collectively, this team, 
uh, put some resources there to assist you, whatever it takes to let's get the right people on the job in the seats so that our kids aren't suffering. So one of the things I wanted to yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> he, she'd already pointed to me. Sorry. Um, one of the things I want to point out is our counseling associates are um, what we used to call the counseling interns. And so they are not uh, yet credentialed, fully credentialed. And so what happens often is they get credentialed and they go away. Some school districts have opted rather than have the revolving door of counseling associates to have fully credentialed counselors. And we do have those in the form of our wellness coordinators at all of our school sites, but they also have counseling associates. So I believe we still have wellness coordinators at all of our school sites, but we're down the counseling associates, which are the interns. Okay, continue. I think we're ready for Brenda to talk, talk about, Dr. Carrillo, you're gonna talk about the um, response. Yeah. You could have the, the next slide. slide. Yeah, next slide. So this year we've been really focusing on the on reengagement strategies that are using and using a tiered uh, support model as well as deepening our coordination of current services, but sort of understanding what we currently have and how can we strengthen and leverage those resources and then how do we re, sort of repurpose those as well. So some examples of what we have been doing in terms of a tier one intervention is that we did expand our social work intern program. We had a social work intern program that uh, we started a few years ago. This year, we have expanded that intern program and placed our interns um, at elementary schools based on data that we collected around attendance and engagement. We looked to see which schools had the lowest rates of, uh, of attendance and um, offered the social work interns there. The social work interns are there two to three days a week providing uh, support to get those students back into school. They're currently at Scott Lane, Pomeroy, Maine, and Montague, and working really closely with our counseling associates, as well as our wellness coordinators, the counseling team, the whole wellness team that exists on, the, on those particular campuses. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we are also uh, providing more whole class presentations, as well as group work, really pushing into the classrooms because we have less staff. But one of the ways that we're being creative is to have the staff that we do have go into the classroom and serve students in those spaces. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, provide support, modeling, and coaching to the teachers in the classroom. We've also uh, shifted to a school-based counseling model, um, which means that in the past, we had students that we would see for longer periods of time. Um, now, what we're doing with the school-based counseling model is having shorter-term goals and assessing students more frequently to make sure that the services that we're providing are appropriate. We are also um, utilizing our Care Solis uh, program. We started that last year, which is an online 24 seven, sort of a concierge resource where a parent or a staff person can actually contact Care Solis via email or uh, by phone and immediately reach somebody in multitude of languages and be connected to a community resource for support. Um, and we have staff that have accessed that as well as, as students. We're also uh, really focused on coordination of services. Like I mentioned earlier, we have our counseling uh, wellness coordinators and our counselors, school psychs, um, SPED staff that are meeting on a regular basis to talk about the work that we're doing and how we can really support each other and leverage the work that's happening across those various departments. That is uh, fairly new, but has already proven to have a lot of benefit in terms of, of looking at our student services. And we also have our wellness and our MTSS coaches that are working together to provide tier one strategies and really focusing on those grade levels where we know there was the, the greatest transition in our returning to in-person learning. So those are some of the strategies and um, different uh, um, programs that we've been providing using that MTSS model. Before you move on, Dr. Kemp, the... Um... Slides that are being presented are not the same as what's in the um, board agenda or that the board members have been given. So can you make sure that it that the board agenda gets updated and the updated presentation gets sent to all the board members? This presentation, there were two attachments to the board agenda. One was the slide deck and one was the 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 deck of uh, the deck of data slides. So this is the slide presentation that's attached to the board agenda. Page 14. Page 14. Okay, so it's all out there? Yes, it is. Okay. Found it. My apologies. Took me a bit. 
So are we, we're going to ready to move on to talk about disproportionality and discipline. Board member Lieberman. That's me. <laughs> and, and we are going to finish up it at six o'clock. So because we do have the rest of the meeting. So um, I think we need to set up another session. Agreed. Um, maybe. Um, well, Dr. Kemp and I'll talk about it if we want to do it on a Saturday morning where we can have several hours. I think that's what most districts actually do is, is set aside a chunk of time because this is super important for us. So um, Dr. Kemp and I will, will have to work that out about how we hear the rest and see the rest of this data. Thank you. So we'll, we'll wrap up on probably on disproportionality. Well, I think we need to stop because I don't think we can get into it. So okay. we've, I think we've seen uh, how this works. Yes. Um, and um, we do have the materials so that board members can look at it, but I, I do want to come back to it. Um, but I don't think it makes sense to start another one because we won't get very far with it. Um, is that um, okay, Dr. Okay, I see Dr. Kemp um, nodding. Uh, Trustee Fairchild, do you have a comment about ending this? Uh, well, I have a comment about the information. Is there any way we could get it printed larger? I'm the youngest one on the board. And I would like to say that some of these yes. are too hard to read. I, I don't think we need to have all of the information on the same page. Um, we can do, we, we've in the past, we've done 11 by 17. Okay. I think we need to go back to that. Yes. Yeah, that would be, that would be very helpful. As I said, I tried to use my own computer. I do better on paper to print it and it did not work on eight by eight and a half by 11. So right. this is a little better, but thank you. Agreed for next time. You can also zoom in on the, you know, if you're looking at it online, but if you, I know several of us like to have it printed. Okay. So is there any sort of wrap up that you want to do on what we've talked about so far today? Um, is there any further comments you want to make? Well, uh, just that wanted to thank the board for indulging us in this exper interactive experiment. Um, and we're hopeful that, that we can continue to figure out how to engage a more interactive um, discourse. We'll take to heart the request for additional more granular information to make sure that our definitions are clearly laid out, for example, labels in the cell survey, what do they mean and that kind of thing. So we'll, we will go through and scrutinize that and, and come back with um, uh, more complete data sets um, and, and clearer definitions. Um, I do, I do um, uh, hope that we'll be able to do this, you know, in, in within a, a, the next couple months. I know that, um, Liz tells me that there's more data coming. Um, there's data coming all the time. So we may find an opportunity to enhance it with even more up-to-date data um, from the fall semester. Does, does that mean it makes sense to wait until um, after the first of the year? I, I, I think we're going to anyways. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Trustee Ratterman? Yeah, I did have a question. I mean, when I'm looking through these, sometimes I end up with so I'll look through and it'll, it'll talk about 11th grade, uh, the caps and there, these are snapshots of various things, but then like, if you look at page 27, where it shows, it's showing that this is a district aggregate and you can clearly see that there's an opportunity to dive deeper in. So I don't know if there's a mechanism, I don't want your print them all. We'd have several encyclopedia size books. Um, but I was wondering if there's some way to get access to this so that if we wanted to look at this, we're starting to, hey, well, you know, is that skewed because of XYZ school or, you know, how's this school? Where's the extreme? So we could pop in and look at the various pieces of data. Um, you know, I think that would be really useful because often the averages, the aggregates hide a lot of stuff. I mean, you've got highs and lows and things. So I, I don't know if that's doable. It, if, it actually is. It, it's actually there. You can see in the print where it's blue and it's got the HTTPS. It's got the website on at the top of page 27. And I'm not sure if it if it's a live link when it's linked to the board docs. That's what I'm not sure how that works. But if if we can get the 
copy to you with all of the live links in it. Yeah. All of that information is there. And that is, that is a, our public Tableau site because it does not have individual student data in it. Okay, that would be great. And then, yeah, if you do it with links, I mean, I probably could type that long thing in here. But no, it's a live link. I've got it's a live link. You can't issues. see it, um, Trustee Ratterman. It's where it says "link to Tableau" at the very top. Right. So, um, so are you going to send us then um, a live document that then the board members can click on the links? Great, thank you, um, Trustee Fairchild. Uh, thanks. Um, so, I submitted a some questions uh, about the um, the study session and. One of the things that I've thought about in looking at this data and which I would love to see addressed is what are we gonna do differently? Um, I was really impressed with a teacher once who, who talked about how a neighboring school with, with a similar demographic was getting higher test scores. So she took a personal day and went and observed the teachers to find out what they were doing differently and then implemented it in her classroom. One of the things that I see over and over again is, an, is we, we continue to do the same things and expect something a little different. And I would really like us to say, okay, there are some great things that we're doing. We're doing some great things, but we know that there are districts with these type of demographics that are scoring higher, where their kids are learning various things better than our kids. So what little things are they doing that we could maybe tweak or add to really impact our scores. I mean, it takes us some courage to look and say, maybe we're not doing, I mean, I do it every day as a parent when I mess up, but to look and say, what could I do differently to change the situation? But if, when we're talking about this data, I would really like us to look at what is this data? How is this data gonna change what we're doing? Because if it's not gonna change what we're doing, then there's really no purpose of doing a deep data dive. And I think that's that's part of what we're going to be sharing at the end of the presentation is how did the data inform the shifts that we've been making this year through our uh, professional learning network, through our principal PLCs, and through our site level teams. So you'll hear uh, information when we come back later. Great, thank you. Um, Just all one so note, much. Oh. I did I did try the links. They are live. They do work. I did ring them up. Thank you so much. I just didn't think they would be live. And I like the fact you've got some I ready links to talk a little bit about that. So, were you clicking them from the um, version that you downloaded from the agenda? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Then the public can do that as well. That's great. Um, okay. So thank you all so much. Um, you've just touched the surface. I'm looking forward to doing more. And um, Vicky's comment was is well taken that um, it's not just looking at the data, it's what do we do with this data and how do we move forward? Uh, it's very important. Um, okay, so thank you so much. Um, at this time, that is the end of our um, board study session for today. So uh, at this point, the board will be going into closed session in just a moment. So uh, I have a uh, time now for public comment on closed session agenda items. So I will look in the room to see if we have anyone who wishes to make comment on our closed session agenda. And then I will look out at our webinar to see is there anyone in our webinar who wishes to make a comment? Then now would be the time to raise your hand. Um, I don't see any. So um, we will be going to closed session to talk about uh, item D.1, uh, conference with legal counsel on existing litigation. Uh, item D.2, public employee discipline, dismissal, resignation, reassignment, release. Item D.3, public employee appointments. Uh, D.4, D.5 are also public employee appointments. D.6, conference with labor negotiators. And D.7, discussion regarding expulsion of student 111821A.1. And um, when we are done, we will come back um, by. Um, approximately seven or 7.15, um, that is our goal for tonight. So um, we will see you when we come back uh, from closed session. Thank you.
Yes. Okay, welcome back to our regular board meeting on November 18th of the Santa Cruz Unified School Board. We are back from closed session. So first thing coming back, we'd like the introduction of our translator. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams Navarro. Angélica Benítez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio en inglés. Thank you. Okay, we are back from closed session and in closed session, uh, the board talked about item D.1, the board received information and gave direction. For item D.2, the board received information. Item D.3, the board received information. Item D.4, the board received information. Item D.5, the board received information. Item D.6, the board received information and gave direction. And for item D.7, in the expulsion case of student 111821A.1, the administrative hearing panel recommends that student 111821A.1 be expelled with a suspended enforcement through November 11th, 2022. Student 111821A.1 can apply for reinstatement at the end of the expulsion term, November 11th, 2022. The Board of Trustees was a motion by board member Ratterman and seconded by board member Fairchild uh, to accept the recommendation of the administrative hearing panel. The board voted unanimously to approve the expulsion with a suspended enforcement of student 111821A.1. Okay, our next item is our public hearing. Um, I am wondering if we want to do our difference makers recognition first before the public hearing, if uh, the lawyer will indulge me. Um, so I am going to pass it over to uh, Superintendent Kep. All right, trustees, I'm gonna ask you to come down and to form a semicircle here in the front because we will be taking pictures this evening. So it is quite an honor to be able to stand before you, our public for the, this is, this is the best attended board meeting in person in two years almost, so it's exciting. So before I start, I just wanted to read out to our community, um, really what the Difference Makers is. So our Difference Makers program recognizes staff and student members who support our district's core values. They've been updated. These are the old ones. Students first, integrity and ethical stewardship, connected families and collaborative community, equity and social justice, empathy and respect, world leading and future ready. The Difference Makers are nominated on a quarterly basis by administrators to a selection committee comprised of representatives from our classified and certificated employee groups. Difference makers are recognized before the Board of Trustees as they are here tonight, where they will receive a certificate of recognition and a difference maker pin for your lapel or your, your lanyard. A special feature story will be released through our district-wide publications and social media following the announcements. We have four of our winners here live in the room tonight and others are tuning in to live stream and we are mailing them their certificates and pens. Difference makers, if you're in the room when I say your name, we invite you to come and stand up here in front of the podium. We're gonna go one at a time um, and we'll have a, we'll have a photo afterwards. I just wanted to say that this, uh, this quarter, we received 23 nominations from 13 sites into four award categories, certificated, classified, community and group. So here are our difference makers for the first quarter. All right, so the first one is certificated staff members. So I'm gonna invite um, Jose Pancheco Velasquez and Principal Donnell Sontag to come forward, the certificated staff member. So Jose is a Huerta Middle School counselor, 
come over here in the front. We want to get you on camera so the community, yeah, right here in front of the, in front of the, you know, you can turn around and look at the audience. No, don't worry about me. Okay, Jose, see this, there you go. For embodying our core value of students first, we believe that preparing students to adapt and thrive in a rapidly changing and global connected world should inform every decision. We believe that incorporating student voice is essential to our success in understanding and meeting each student's needs. Principal Donnell Sontag says, Jose is committed to a well being of our students. In addition to meeting with every student at the beginning of the year, to establish a positive relationship and identifying areas for growth, he also meets individually with students who are struggling, runs a social skills group, supports students in conflict resolution, presents classroom lessons, does home visits, and is a member of both of our instructional leadership team and our MTSS team. He supports students in developing social and emotional competencies, is an advocate for equity and student agency, and approaches decisions from the lens of what's best for students. He is absolutely student focused and an integral part of ensuring that students feel safe and connected at Huerta. So Jose, I have here for you. Our district placard and a pen for you as one of our district difference makers. So yes. This is always my favorite meeting when we have the difference makers. In the next category, so we would like to invite James Gentry and Wayne Leach to come forward. So in the category of our classified staff member, this quarter, this goes to James, congratulations James, for embodying our core value of empathy and respect. We believe that empathy, the ability to understand and share our feelings of another, is crucial for, the va for valuing diverse perspectives, effective collaboration, problem solving, and leading change. We believe that everyone has value and deserves to be treated respectfully. Principal Wayne Leach says that James Gentry is a Bracker SAI paraeducator working with our K-1 students. He brings high expectations with a gentle spirit as he works with small groups of students or one-to-one -one in the learning environment. Known as Mr. James on campus, he supports staff and students wherever he sees a need from classroom behavior or academic support to technology. If there's a need, Mr. James can be counted on to assist. He serves the Bracker community. Beyond the classroom, James has been a member of our school site council and sits on our site leadership team. He brings the perspective of a parent a classified, and classified staff to each meeting, always advocating for children. He requests resources and makes suggestions to meet our students' different backgrounds and needs. He is a champion for our special needs students. Our students know Mr. James cares for them uh, even, when they are, even when they have moved up grades and can be seen around school seeking them out to talk or hang out with them. James can be found out front of the school each morning welcoming students. At the beginning of the year, he is often seen holding hands with nervous kindergarten students, walking them to breakfast and checking them in with them at recess. He is a caring adult that kids know they can go to for support. James Gentry is a valued member of the Bracker staff who treats everyone with respect and love. If there's a need, seen or unseen, Mr. James will be nearby to help. Congratulations to you.
Okay, and so Adriana and Mary Grizzle, let's have you guys come forward now. In the category of community member, this quarter's difference maker is Mary Grizzle, Bauer Elementary School community member for embodying our core value of connected families and collaborative community. We believe that a community action is essential to achieving our vision and having a positive impact on student outcomes, including their health and wellness. We serve as a catalyst for a call to action with our parents, families, and community. Through support and involvement and collaboration, we leverage our multiple perspectives and collective genius to develop better solutions and deepen our shared commitment to success. Principal Adriana Reyes says, it takes a village to raise a child. Ms. Grizzle, a Santa Clara community member, knows this too well. This year, Ms. Grizzle began working as a city crosswalk and lucky for our school, was assigned to Bowers. She is such a, has such a pleasant disposition and is very supportive of our school. She keeps our school safe and is a wonderful role model for our student safety patrollers. Most recently, Ms. Grizzle organized a fundraiser in honor of her birthday. She raised over $2,000 for our school. She tapped into her many community connections and helped raise money to fund student activities. With a generous donation, we opened a game and an art and craft room during lunch recess. We will use some of the funds to establish conflict resolution student teams and student leadership. These endeavors will support our goal of promoting a healthy, positive school climate. Playing games allows students to learn something new. It helps their physical development, boosts their creativity, social skills, and it also helps to develop a positive attitude. These are the things will help. These are all things that will help booster our school community and support students' social emotional well-being. Ms. Grizzle has also reached out for additional support to our gardening program and to assist families with Thanksgiving dinners. Ms. Grizzle is a valued member of our community. She understands the importance of community partnerships and we are grateful for her support. Thank you so much. All right, so the last group is actually not here in person. This is our, um, and we'll take a picture with their plaque when we're done so that they can have that, okay. Oh, I know, yes, oh, true. Yeah, the last picture I was, I think I was, yes, it was the first, the, the night my contract was approved and we had different board members at the time. <laughs> so now we have Bonnie, okay. So this last group virtually out there, hello. This group is uh, for the category of group or organization. The difference makers are the Hughes Elementary School Office and Health Team for embodying our core value of excellence through continuous improvement. So we believe that achieving high performance and full potential for, the organ for both the organization and the individual comes from a relentless commitment to excellence and the courage to adapt, change, and improve based on results. We believe in fostering a growth mindset by defining features as opportunities for learning and continuous improvement. Principal Joe Young says, as we know, this year has brought a lot of processes and structures to deal with the effects of COVID. As our staff and students come back in person, the need for clarity, consistency, communication, and confidentiality are vital to ensure the safety of our student staff, families, um, and student staff and families. Hughes office and health teams comprised of Ms. Christine Lutka, the school secretary, Ms. Merrick Carr Wan, the attendance clerk, Ms. Julie Lee, the school nurse, and Ms. Peachy Aquino, the health assistant, truly exemplified the core value of excellence through continuous improvement. Due to consistently evolving protocols due to COVID, the office and health team saw the need to create a structure with some sense of consistency for, with expectations. 
With the right to privacy and the importance of confidentiality when students and staff members were absent for a variety of reasons, and there was a curious and concerned response by others, the office and health team created a system that fostered clear communication while maintaining confidentiality. Our health clerk, Ms. Peachy, along with our office team created and began using a clear to return to class pass. This slip of paper is used when students were sent to the front office or health office with medical concerns from staff members. After assessing and triaging the student, the clear to return to class pass was a simple and effective way to communicate with a staff member that the student is safe, along with talks about professional trust in our colleagues and a need for confidentiality, our staff has appreciated the clarity of communication that students are safe to return to class. This is especially true for students who've been absent for a few days and the resulting questions and curiosities about those absences. Another example of the core value, excellence through continuous improvement, is Hughes office and health teams have scheduled daily meetings to check in about the absences on campus, the communication with families about those absences, and the next steps for the record keeping and communication with staff members. These daily meetings have had a positive, significantly positive effect on tracking student attendance and the homeschool connection. As we all continue to encounter and experience constant change during the pandemic, Hughes office and health teams definitely exemplified excellence through continuous improvement with their open mindset, courage to adapt, and commitment to improve based on needs of results, results and needs. So congratulations to our Hughes team. I think they're going to need more than one pin. Yes. Yeah. Already, congratulations to all of our difference makers. We really appreciate all that you've done uh, within our district. Um, and uh, it's so nice to be able to recognize some of you in person, um, finally, after all these many months. So we, um, we need to move on with our meeting. So the next item is our public hearing on transition to a by trustee area election system draft maps public hearing. So um, I have one moment. I have language on this. Okay, the governing board will convene a public hearing to receive public testimony concerning proposed trustee voting area plans associated with the tra district's transition to a by trustee area election system. So can I? Get motion it. to open um, the public hearing. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by uh, Trustee Lieberman and a second by Trustee Ratterman. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes uh, seven to zero. So our public hearing is now open and we will start with a presentation from our uh, attorney, uh, Mr. Salt. 
Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Kemp, district staff, and members of the community. I'm Jonathan Salt, and I'm, I'm not joined by Justin Rich from Cooperative Strategies tonight, but um, have no fear. I've done plenty of these kinds of public hearings without the demographer here. Um, also, it's great to finally be here in person and meet all of you today. Um, Zoom has been very interesting, but I'm glad I can finally um, see you in the flesh. Slide. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll stay here for a second. Um, we're in the kind of final countdown here with this transition. It started a long time ago, and then once the census was released, it really kicked up. Uh, we had two pre-map public hearings. Maps were drawn about a month ago. Now this is our second map public hearing. Uh, three weeks from tonight will be a third map public hearing, and then the item after the public hearing will be a resolution for the board to adopt one of the available options. There's also a series of community meetings that are uh, been occurring both in person at school sites and virtually yesterday I hosted one um, for folks to really let the board know what they think and ask any questions that you might have if if this kind of format at the board meeting may not be your favorite you can come to the community meeting and have as much time as you want with um, legal or the demographer so with that let's just get back into the background of kind of why we're doing this slide so what is the California Voting Rights Act and kind of why does this matter here um, the CVRA I took Took effect about 18 years ago so it's old enough to vote and i'm allowed to make dad jokes now because i just became one five weeks ago um thank you the cvra um, prevents the use of an at-large election system if that system impairs the ability of members of protected classes from influencing the outcome of the election or electing candidates of choice you might be thinking well john we don't have an at-large system um, unfortunately, the district's sort of hybrid trustee area at large method counts as an at large election system. And so it in theory is eligible for CVRA challenge. Next slide. Another reason that this issue is popping up in the county and around the state is that the way the law is written, um, if a plaintiff were to file a claim against a school district or a city or a county alleging that their election system violates the CVRA, and they prevail, they're entitled to significant attorneys and expert fees. But if a school district or a city successfully defends at large elections, not afforded that same right. Slide. So the only safe harbor from a CVRA claim is the transition to what the district is currently switching to, which is a by trustee area election system where the board, uh, the district will be divided into equal population areas. Here it will be seven because there are seven board members and a board member will be ultimately elected um, by the voters in each area uh, that in which they reside. So um, yeah, I know in all of the maps, I think there are trustees paired together. So eventually there will be one trustee per trustee area. Everybody serves out their full term, regardless of where they live, you've all been lawfully elected. Slide. Um, and again, this is just a the current sort of hybrid system now where there's four trustees elected from one of the areas, two from uh, a second one, and then one from a third. I mean, that hybrid system, since folks are still elected at large across the district, again, um, is not safe from CVRA challenge. Slide. Um, this slide talks about just sort of um, looking into some of the demographics of the district. In particular, this particular slide focuses on the citizen voting age population of the district's Asian community. Um, citizen voting age, really just 18 years and older. Um, and a US citizen. These numbers are a rolling estimate that the census puts out in their American community survey on a five-year rolling average. And so district-wide, far away from me, 33% uh, um, Asian citizen voting age population. Um, and we'll talk about some of the others in a moment, but just as you can kind of see on the map here where, where the, the kind of the dense concentration of this protected class happens to live in the district. Um, kind of ignore the upper portion where that's uh, water and sort of marshland. Um, but really kind of right in the center of the district and then Sunnyvale on the southern border of the district um, has higher concentrations of um, Asian citizen voting age population. Next slide. Similarly, um, a different color for the Hispanic Latino citizen voting age population in district wide about half of what it is for the Asian protected class about 16 and a half percent. And again, you can kind of see where those concentrations are the darker the color, um, the more concentrated it is with the exception of at the extreme northern portion. Uh, these are all, all these little shapes are census blocks and they can vary from having zero or one person living in it to a couple thousand living in each census block. And so um, at the north there, obviously it's very dark, but I don't believe a lot of people live in that particular area. Just something to consider really kind of the center southern portion of the district is where um, there happens to be a concentration of this group. And why we look at this 
Uh, it's one of the factors in consideration when the maps are being drawn. Uh, so you don't wanna break up an area of strong protected class grouping because then that would in theory dilute the voting power of that particular protected class. Similarly, you also don't wanna try to draw crazy lines to try to stuff everybody into one area because it does the same thing, um, only giving kind of the strength in one area, for example, slide. So again, we're in the draft map stage. Equal population based on the most recent census is the most sort of non-negotiable criteria. Um, and that makes sense when you think about it. If um, I was a trustee and I lived in an area that only had 1,000 people, and then if somebody else was a trustee and they had 100,000 people living in their area, a lot easier for me to get elected, but also folks who live in my neighborhood, their vote counts a lot more, one out of 1,000 people, than it would if you were one out of 100,000 people. And so the point of this, similar to Congress and the redistricting that's going on now is to kind of create equal to the extent possible, um, kind of equal population per trustee area within an acceptable range. Next slide. Other criteria uh, include um, complying with the Federal Voting Rights Act. And that's what we're talking about when we look at the citizen voting age population, not intentionally discriminating against the protected class. Um, the areas have to be geographically contiguous. And by that, I mean, you can't start an area in one corner of the district and call it area one, draw several other areas. And then on the entire other side, say this is still also area one, you can't do that. Um, communities of interest is also a consideration, geographical compactness. Again, you can't split census blocks because then you don't know how many people live there. And sometimes those blocks are kind of funky shapes, but to the extent that it's possible they that the area should make sense and be relatively compact. I and mean, you cannot favor or discriminate against an incumbent political candidate or political party. So this is scenario one that was uh, created by the demographic team. And I'm, I'm just gonna turn so I can see it a little more clearly here. A couple of things I wanna point out about the map and sort of the slide first in the top left portion, you can see the very first column is total population based on the most recent census. So district wide is about 171,000 people, which means the ideal size for each trustee area is about 24,000 and change. Um, I say ideal size and I say and change because it's not going to be exactly perfect. The next uh, column shows a variance. And so that's kind of the percentage off from perfect. Um, and that's okay as long as it's under 10%. So again, they're never gonna be perfectly exactly even based on how census blocks are. This one is 3.2% off of the perfect number. That's okay, it's allowed, um, but just wanted to point that out. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, if you look at the map, um, the election sequencing, um, and this is essentially, should the board choose, choose this map, this sequencing of elections would be how board members are elected. So for example, in the 2022 election, four seats would be open for election. And that would be areas one, two, three, and six on this map. It's different on others. And then areas four, five, and seven would be open for election in 2024. Um, part of that is based on where you folks live now, because again, um, just looking, for example, at trustee area five, the purple area in the bottom center of the map, there's two trustees who live there. One's term expires next November and the other one um, in 2024. Obviously, you wouldn't want that area to be open for election next, because that would mean you'd already have a trustee living there for the next two years, plus a new trustee would mean that another area would have no representative. So Ideally, as soon as possible, and here it'll be by the next election, there will be one trustee per area, even though on the map right now, there's a few um, areas with no trustees residing there. So on all of the maps, yellow is area one, and here it's in the sort of northern portion of the district. Uh, area two is in green, three red, four blue, five purple, uh, six orange, and seven, and kind of that aqua color in the bottom left portion of the district. Uh, next slide. Additionally, um, the citizen voting age population, we show that per, uh, per area on each map. I just wanna kind of highlight when you're looking at this and what this really means and why I kept the other chart there for district-wide averages is because ideally, if possible, you want to be able to increase influence for protected class groups in trustee areas. So um, for example, if you look at um, trustee areas three and four, the Hispanic Latino citizen voting age population there gets up to 22.8 and 20%. That's above the district wide average of 16 and a half. Similarly, um, the Asian citizen voting age population district wide is 33%. 
And here there's a handful of trustee areas that get up into the 38, 39%. Um, and so again, an increased influence for that for those groups in those areas. Next slide. Map two, a little bit of a different look. Um, again, the color scheme is the same. The variance is a little bit more um, spread out on this map. Again, still within the permissible range. All of the options are legally viable options, um, but just uh, there's a, a larger and smaller kind of population-wise area on this map. Um, sequencing is different than the previous map. Uh, there would be an election if this is the map in areas one, two, three, and four in 2022, and then another election in areas five, six, seven in 2024, and then obviously every four years thereafter. So there's always a trustee per trustee area. Next slide. Uh, similar here, uh, if you look at area four, for example, for the Hispanic Latino citizen voting age population, it gets up to over 23%. So um, a seven or so percent increase over the district wide average. And then the Asian citizen voting age population, specifically in area two, gets up to almost 50%. So you create almost the majority, um, majority minority uh, area by citizen voting age population uh, in area two, for example, on this map. And I know that at the last board meeting, there were some input received about potentially creating a new version of this map. And so that, that exists, it's on the next slide. Uh, we're calling it scenario 2A. And really it focused on the Sunnyvale area and getting um, one of the school sites that uh, wasn't in um, the Sunnyvale area kind of slid over. And really it's, it's hard to kind of describe it on the map, um, but just kind of where the 62, if I can read that appropriately, uh, road sign is that little square there used to be orange in scenario two. Now it's uh, aqua in scenario two A. And that to clarify that's the Laurelwood attendance area or Laurelwood School. I guess. Thank you. Um, and so Laurelwood is now put in with the um, rest of the majority of Sunnyvale on this particular map. Um, again, sequencing exactly the same as it was proposed on scenario two. And actually, if you look at areas six and seven based on total population, they actually are now almost even um, by shifting that um, block over, whereas it was a pretty big gap between those two areas size-wise on the, the scenario before. So better balance in that part of the district. Next slide. And again, because it was just a minor change, a lot of these numbers stayed pretty close to the same. Again, uh, the kind of the most significant number here is the CVAP for the Asian community in area two, 48.4%. Next slide. Scenario three uh, is again, just an entirely different look. And again, still seek the colors are, are the same area, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, based on the, um, the legend on the side. Election sequencing, also a little bit different here. If this is the map the board chooses, areas one, two, four, and seven would be open for election uh, in the next election for a four-year term. And then the remaining uh, areas four, five, and six, sorry. Uh, three, five, and six will be open for election in 2024. And so again, um, there will be a trustee in each area by the next election, regardless of which map the board selects, which is not always the case in every district. Sometimes it just ends up being that there happens to be an open area or two, not the case here. Uh, everyone will be represented uh, by somebody by uh, next November. Next slide. Uh, this map, again, very similar in terms of kind of where the concentrations exist. Um, the largest on this map for CVAP, um, for Hispanic Latino CVAP is area three, gets up to 22.6%. For the Asian population, again, area two, um, not quite a majority, at four, almost 47%, but certainly a plurality in that district. So um, increasing that voting power for that group in that area. Next slide. And again, I know that there's a lot of lines being drawn on maps and just not to confuse anybody, this does not change where anybody's child goes to school. It doesn't change um, really anything about the district other than um, how board members are elected and when. Um, each board member owes the same duty to the district, the full district as it does as you do now. Um, it's still one district with common goals and challenges. I know there was also a request to see an overlay of elementary school areas on the maps. We just got that today. So uh, sometime in the next couple of days, we'll update on the website the maps that will overlay elementary attendance boundaries so the folks can see, oh, this is Laurelwood, for example. Next slide. We're, we're, we're steaming towards the finish line here. Um, 
you know, we've had the other public hearings I've mentioned. The next one is on December 9th. I think there's one more community meeting um, later this month, right after Thanksgiving. I hosted a virtual community meeting yesterday, and I just want to share some of the feedback that I heard at that meeting. Um, one, obviously, there were just a few general questions about the process, what CVAP is, what, what do we mean when we talk about variants, and we answered all that like we did tonight. I actually just did the same presentation, so I got, I got practice. Um, but one community member shared their preference. The others did not have a preference. A community member shared that they happen to prefer MAP 2A. I wanted to share that with the board. Again, it's one person. But just so you know, as we field this information, you'll get all of it before you make a decision on December 9th. Everything that was said, regardless of if it was one person or 50 people. Next slide. Um, also wanna direct folks to the district's website. Um, I was zoomed in. Uh, home, About Us, Board of Trustees, CVRA. There's information, there's presentations, there's copies of the maps, there's a schedule of all of the hearings and an email address. Um, CVRA at csusd.net. If you have any questions or comments about the maps, you can't come to a meeting, you still want to let the board know what you think about it or what your favorite map is, please let us know specifically before December 9th so that we can make sure the board hears it before they make a very big decision. Next slide. Um, before we jump to the public hearing, the map that is ultimately adopted by the board on December 9th will then need approval by the Santa Clara County Committee on School District Organization. Um, once that takes place, which will probably occur in January, that map will be implemented for the November 2022 election and will serve as the district's map until the 2030 census comes out in 2031. So it will be five elections with that map. And then there will be a um, review. As the law stands now, it's a lot easier to do the review and it's much different than city or county redistricting. It is as simple as in 2031, whatever map you have, the demographer will just put the new population data on and sort of see what happens. If it's still within the 10% variance, the board can just readopt that map for the next decade. If it is outside of the 10% variance, meaning that you don't have a balanced population, and this is a key term in the statute, the board must adjust the boundaries to regain population balance. So it's not a clean redraw from scratch. Um, so this is a redraw from scratch, but but prospectively, depending upon how far the variance is moving forwards, this could be the map for a long time, or it could uh, change with some tweaks here and there. Just wanted to let everybody know this isn't this doesn't change every year, and potentially doesn't change even every ten years. With that, I will hang out and answer any questions that community members or board members have. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we are going to start with public comment from the community, and then we will take public comment from the board. And um, because we have multiple locations, we'll be um, starting with any public comment from people in the room with us here. And um, then once that is complete, we will go out to um, the webinar. So if you are out in the webinar, now is the time um, to raise your hand if you want to give a, a comment about the maps. Um, so I don't have any slips. Is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak on this item? on this item about the maps. Okay, we will do other comment later. Okay, so I don't see any comments from somebody in the room. So uh, we will end the in-room portion of the public comment. Then I will go out to the um, webinar. And um, I just want to remind uh, everyone who makes comments tonight um, that the board has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable, a safe harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of the district, as well as the community, as uh, Santa Clara Unified encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. The um, this district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. Okay, so at this point, I will turn it over to Mrs. Drico to handle the public comment on the webinar. Thank you, President Muirhead. 
Our first member of the public to speak is Teddy Duffy, but for those who are attending virtually to speak, we do have a two minute timer to help guide your comment. Each member of the public is given two minutes and at two minutes we will need to move on to the next speaker in order to ensure equitable speak time. Uh, Teddy Duffy, you should be prompted to unmute your microphone. Good evening board members and um, thank you so much to the firm that has done all of this hard work. I really appreciate it. Um, excuse me for my voice. I just had an operation yesterday, so um, I'm a little foggy or froggy um, and maybe a little foggy. <laughs> um, the map that I really um, am interested in is 2A because the lines seem to be um, really like keeping communities together. And that seems to be um, a little bit more organized in my mind and make it easier for um, um, <clears throat> trustees to work within that um, area. And some of the other maps I was just looking at, it, uh, one of them just like kind of, it just, even though it split, it, it just didn't look as organized for me. Um, and I just think that that two way was they really looked at, you know, what you what you have suggested. And I really enjoyed that. So um, I hope you I hope the board takes that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Beth Stamper. Good evening, Dr. Kemp, President Muirhead and school board trustees. My name is Beth Stamper and I'm a school counselor at Peterson Middle School. I'm a UTSC cluster director and member of the UTSC leadership team. I'm speaking tonight in support of scenario 2A map um, in the by trustee area election system currently before the school board. This scenario is the best fit for our district as it supports the history of when two districts were merged into our current unified district as addressed by trustee Canova in a prior board meeting. Thank you for this opportunity to address the school board in this important decision. Thank you and the next member of the public to speak is Mary Clink. Mary Clink. Can you hear me now? Okay, so nodding. <laughs> um, um, my name is Mary Clink. Um, I am currently uh, within Santa Clara Unified School District. My kids go to Laurelwood Elementary School as well as Peterson Middle School. So um, my concern um, in looking at these maps is um, regarded to that area because I don't know enough about the rest of the maps and I'm eagerly waiting to see the elementary school boundaries overlaid on the rest of the maps so I can make a more educated decision about the district as a whole. But um, I'm calling tonight to um, put my favor with map 2A um, based on the recent uh, issues that we've had in terms of response from the city of Sunnyvale um, as well as Santa Clara with Laurelwood being on the edge of the campus and then moving over to Patrick Henry, which will be um, solidly in Sunnyvale, as well as Peterson Middle School um, with traffic incidents that we've had two years ago and working with the city of Sunnyvale to get um, safe routes to school, uh, better parking um, and traffic control in that area. Um, it's very important to me that we have a board member that is um, vested in communication with the city of Sunnyvale and representing those schools. Um, the only other thing I would like to add is that um, as you guys were talking, I checked through my emails that come from Santa Clara Unified School District. If this redistricting is this important, I strongly suggest that you be sending out more emails about when the public hearings are. The last email that I have uh, is about 49ers STEM um, team something or other. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the redistricting 
takes a uh, higher priority than that. Um, so I would suggest that you start sending out more emails so that we get better response from people. Thank you. Thank you. And the next member of the public to speak is Ada. Good evening, board members and Dr. Kemp. I too, I am a Laurelwood and Peterson and Wilcox parent and think that the 2A map for all the previous um, reasons stated um, by previous callers is the one that makes most sense. It's cohesive. There's continuity between the schools. Um, so yeah, 2A um, is the one that makes the most sense for our district. Thank you. Thank you. And the next member of the public to speak is Lizzie. Hello, board members and Dr. Kemp. Um, I do want to say the same. Thank you for all the hard work that has go gone into this. I know it's not an easy task and it's nice to have options and see options. I will reiterate, I'm also excited to see the um, elementary schools overlaid. I'm also a Laurelwood and Peterson parent and found the borders on some of the maps concerning for many of the issues that were already pointed out. Um, I think having a co someone that is representing Sunnyvale well is very important and map 2a does a great job of that i also think it's important that it sticks with the historical mapping that we've had it does a good job of balancing everything but not making too many major changes so i thank you guys for putting the options forward i look forward to the new maps and that's it thanks thank you and president muir that was the final comment Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna to mention to my fellow board members, there are comments coming in from emails, through emails, so you'll wanna check those out as well. Um, so now we'll do um, board member comments. Uh, Steve Fairchild. Oh, wait, point of order, oh. we need to close the public hearing. No, no, we're still in the public hearing because we're still talking about it. We usually close it after board comment. Okay, go ahead, Trustee Fairchild. Good close public comment though. Then we're closing the public hearing. We can we can close public comment and keep the public hearing open. I guess if you if somebody feels the need, I, I see our attorney. I, I'm up here to answer questions, but either way works. I've I've seen districts keep it open till the board finishes or ends it, and then the board has. To well, I'm just uh, I'll make the comment that we're closing public comment at this point because we've heard from um, both in person and uh, on the webinar. So now we'll move on to board comments. Can I go? Yeah. Oh yes, Trustee Fairchild. Okay, thanks. So um, I had a question for Mr. Salt. Um, one of the things that you have emphasized on each of the slides is the election sequencing. And the election sequencing seems to be determined by where the various trustees live and when we were elected, correct? Right now, yes. Right. And it just happens to work out. Oh, sorry, I'll let you finish. And I'll okay. So what if between now and like, December or January, one of the trustees were to move. How, because if we're putting forward a map to county council, how, county committee, how would we, would you need to have that information because we're supposed to vote next board meeting, right? Correct. Correct. I don't, I don't want to, if you still have more, I'll, I'll, I'll hold until, okay. So um, a couple of things. Uh, yes, because you're all on the board, we don't want to um, intentionally have an area open for election when there's someone who still has term left thereafter, because that would unnecessarily force an unrepresented, for lack of a better term, area for at least two years thereafter. Um, we look at where you all live for purposes of figuring out that sequencing. It's not the only factor, but it just kind of works out here based on what everyone's term is. Um, if, for example, there were two or three trustees paired together who all had uh, terms expiring in 2024, for example, there would be open areas. And then you'd have to sort of determine um, potentially which areas would come sooner than later um, if the sequencing worked out that way. And what the law says is in making that decision, 
you should take into consideration the intent and purpose of the CVRA. So for example, um, if there were two areas where there was um, potential for only one of them could be open for election and one of them was, let's say that area two that had 49% Asian citizen voting age population, I would recommend that that one be the, be the one, for example. Um, that said, the, while we're looking at that now for the sequencing, um, that's gonna continue regardless of if all of you stay on the board for 10 years or all of you drop off the board tomorrow. And so this is sequencing that's going to exist regardless of the current makeup of the board. Um, so right now on the, on the ninth, when the board makes the decision, that's gonna be the sequencing, even if board membership changes thereafter. So you all serve in at-large seats. And so um, if somebody were to leave the board before the next election, it would just be filled under the previous uh, vacancy filling process, which I think is either at large or based on the current criteria. Trustee Fairchild, do you wanna ask your question again? I'm not sure that you understood or, or is there somebody else who, um... Is the question basically what happens if we pick sequencing in three weeks and then all of a sudden now some- I, I'm gonna let Trustee Gonzalez ask the question. So basically <laughs> I'm in the process of uh, getting a lo location in the, uh, I guess it, it, it would be in the green sections of two, two and three. This might be in the, in the type of uh, area. Uh, so uh, my residency would be changing from the current from the green area. So as as far as sorry. So as far as uh the sequencing I think it would matter as far as you know I, I wouldn't want to uh I mean, I, I, don't, I don't care if I had to run in, in two years, but that's not a problem. But I just think that just for sequencing, it might be better to, to make sure that we take that into account. We can set it up to have both scenarios in the hypothetical, let's okay. say you move tomorrow. Yeah. You can present that to the board because you can do what you like with the sequencing. We generally recommended this based on where you live right now because mm -hmm. you don't want a scenario where you have open areas for an extended period of time. And this has sequenced on these current slides would do away with that. And by next election, there would be one trustee per area period. That might still be the case if you move and we want to look at that. So um, I will look at how that would work and potentially add an option so that when the board makes a motion on the ninth, mm -hmm. part of the motion is also filling in the sequencing. And so we can, that discussion could occur then. So, so we should wait until the next meeting to finalize the sequencing? Well, we'll we'll create it and throw it onto the next PowerPoint, and maybe even put a, something on the website that shows the options for each um, for each map. If it's true that Trustee Gonzalez is going to move relatively soon, um, then that is something that you can consider. Um, obviously, you want to consider that before the board votes on it, because once the board votes on it, you're going to pass a resolution and send it to the county. Mm -hmm. so right, and change it after that. And I want to be very transparent with our community that since he knows that he's moving, I, I'd like to see if we can get that indicated in these maps so that it's it's clear what we're doing we're not trying to do something that you know we're not trying to slide something through that they don't aren't aware of this is something that we're aware of and we want to make sure they're aware of when we're why we're doing the sequencing the way we're doing sure, and we'll put something on the website for example that makes it clear the sequencing per map and kind of why there's two options and mm -hmm. okay so um trustee fairchild had a, another minute left so i'll let her finish her her time uh, so thank you. So I guess um, most of my question has been answered in my brain, but I, I need to ask another part. So even if, because no one wants to put pressure on Albert to find housing in this market by the three weeks, okay, <laughs> there's no pressure. So even if Albert hasn't found housing, um, we can still alter the election sequencing knowing that like kind of taking hit him out of that pool as far as, because that's that's the thing is he and he and, Tre and President Muirhead are in the same area. And so we can uh, consider that area as if he's not in that area, correct? The, the board has a good amount of discretion. Okay. I'm speaking for, for sequencing. And so that's something that can be done potentially. Okay, I just, I want to make sure that we do things very cleanly. So um, I, I, that's why I'm asking that. 
Um, it's something that a lot of us have known about for probably about six months or longer. So, but it, we are just now talking about it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Trustee Canova was next, and then Trustee Ryerman. So you, you've had an opportunity, obviously, to look, look at these maps in detail. And you remember some time ago, uh, I've gone to the history that the, the current three trustee areas are effectively the boundaries of the Alviso, um, Jefferson, and Santa, Santa Clara school districts that unify to create Santa Clara Unified. So out of all that, those maps, and I've heard some comments from the public that have kind of alluded to it, which map to you um, most closely honors that history in, in your mind? Well, I have not studied the maps as closely as the demographer, and so I, I can't answer that as probably as best as you'd like to. Um, we can probably put them side by side and take a look, or if you're not satisfied that it does that, um, the demographer could add map four, uh, you know, if you really want to see something like that. Uh, well, we've heard some comments from the public that some are of the opinion 2A does. Okay, well then, um, I'm not going to dispute the public. Okay. I think that if, if, if that's what the community thinks is, is makes the most sense for the community, then that's something the board should certainly consider. Uh, again, I don't know, I don't remember offhand the exact boundaries of the original map. And right. again, forgive me, I, I'm getting up every two hours or so to feed the baby. Since, <laughs> since you're going to be doing overlays, is there a way to do an overlay of the existing uh, trustee areas over the different map options? That, that would be a nice visual. Probably, it maybe wouldn't be transparent, but possibly someone to the effect of that the demographer could maybe just draw the current three areas over the other ones. Just I, I would like that. I'd like to see that. Sorry, Trustee Raderman. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've looked at these before, um, and I think we actually had an example of one of the, the values of keeping communities together. Um, I think 2A is the superior map. Um, I think the changes made by somebody who was in, which is Trustee Lieberman, made suggestions that were very beneficial, I think, helping keep the Sunnyvale community together and and because um, I think communities of interest staying together are really important. When you look at um, some of the other maps in three, it splits up uh, the Rivermark area, which is into almost three groups, depends on how you take a look at that. Definitely two. When you look at map one, it splits Sunnyvale right in half into two different groups. And so that leaves us with either two or two A. And I believe the suggestion made by uh, and, and implemented uh, for uh, Trustee Lieberman sort of proves the point and it turns out to be that 2A is, I think, probably the best choice of anything there. Um, and I think those, I think the communities of interest are the overriding uh, factor in terms of choosing a map. Thanks. And that's absolutely a completely, perfectly fine way to think about it. I mean, a lot of districts do, you wanna keep communities together. Other districts intentionally want to see them split in half so that the community, uh, you know, is represented by maybe two or three different board members. So there's nothing wrong with either way, and so it sounds like this community likes the idea of keeping Sunnyvale together as much. Okay, Trustee Ryan. Yeah. So um, I have a lot of concerns. Uh, I, I I still in favor of of Map One, and I have a lot of concerns with both Two and Two A. Um, as I look at the considerations um, based on the constitutional requirements. So achieve population equality as nearly as is practicable. So the two and two A are not, are the least equal. So clearly there are two other maps that are more equal. So two fails that test. It, I get that there's the 10% threshold, but we're getting very close to it. Um, and it's not, equal is nearly as practicable because we've got two other maps that are more equal. Um, voting district should be geographically, geographically contiguous. You've got four trustee areas, parts of four trustee areas north of 101. That's not geographically contiguous. And I get what they mean is they don't want an island somewhere, but you have pieces of four trustee areas above 101. That's not as closely connected as possible. Um, that's also not, again, this is, this is from the constitutional things in your presentation, geographical compactness. When you've got pieces of four areas north of 101, those are not as compact as they can possibly be. And then local communities of interest, um, 2 and 2A divide up the old quad neighborhood. Um, and I've gotten a lot of concerns about that from people. 
Um, and I have heard the word gerrymandered for 2 and 2A. The other thing that concerns me in the discussion we've had talking about where Trustee Gonzalez may or may not be living um, and when is that also in this presentation, it says we cannot favor or discriminate against an incumbent political candidate or political party. And the more we talk about, oh, where certain people live, the more I get concerned that we're trying to favor or discriminate against an incumbent. So I have a lot of concerns about two and two A. Um, I think one has the geographical compactness is the most equal and to be most compliant with the constitution, that's what we need to go with. Thank you, Trustee Ryan. I think also um, you did hear you mentioned the comment you got at the meeting. Have, uh, we haven't seen any comments that have been submitted online, have we? Is it? A There's an additional attachment to this item on the agenda that has all oh, there. The comments. Okay. I see that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, I. Uh, I, I, I'm the trustee that is in Sunnyvale. Uh, and so I've received a lot of feedback from residents in Sunnyvale from the kind of Laurelwood, Peterson, Brawley area. Um, and overwhelmingly um, um, maps, where am I looking? Um, maps um, one and three are concerning to them because it split, they split Sunnyvale, particularly map three um, is, is, is of concern. Um, we could have a scenario where um, there is no trustee from Sunnyvale on the board. Um, and I think that um, part of the concern is that um, because Sunnyvale is in, because the Brawley, Ponderosa, Laurelwood, and Peterson are in Sunnyvale, we tend to be overlooked because we're in Santa Clara Unified. So the city doesn't really pay us much attention. And then because we're in Sunnyvale, we tend to get overlooked by the district in certain ways. So we're kind of in this no man's land. And I think in terms of being able to advocate for our schools and our students, it's really important that our communities feel like they have a unified voice to advocate for their kids. And so my main concern there is to make sure that Sunnyvale is not split. Um, and so any scenario where, um, it like trust, like uh, th scenario three, where it gets split at, I think, what is that? Oh, um, um, Dunford, I believe is the street. It's just a random street to cut. And, and, and the, the geographic area that trustee area six covers is so diverse. It just, it, I, yeah. So that's one of my concerns. And then I, I also am concerned about map one because um, it splits Rivermark. Um, and I know Trustee Ratterman has already said that, but I, I just, I don't see the benefit in splitting that, that area because it's, it is one contiguous community. So um, I'm, that's my time, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think everyone has gone, so I will take a turn. Um, the, I, I like to a, um, I liked two, and I'm and I'm kind of sad that uh, Laurelwood won't be in my area, um, but that's that's okay. I can deal. And um, uh, so I do like um, how two A is still contiguous, um, and and the the areas really do seem to make sense. I don't I don't see the the gerrymandering part. Um, I did um, hear what. Trustee Ryan was saying about the north of 101, and I'm wondering um, if the blue area north of 101 is sort of separate, um, but I think that that's mostly commercial. So um, I don't know if it makes, if there was enough residents there that it made a difference in the numbers, if, if we might wanna make that area north of 101 that's blue, maybe move that into the green area, if it makes sense. I, I don't see any real reason to do it if it's mostly commercial, but 
if it makes sense, I mean, 101 is definitely a, a, a major thoroughfare and it would make sense to split districts um, across 101. So if that makes any sense, we could do that. Um, but I don't, you know, you have to look and have the numbers work because that's what all this is about. What number was that again? Um, well, I was looking at map uh, two or two A, which at this point should be the same at that section. Um, and I'm looking, oh, let me make sure that two A is blue. Yeah, it is blue. The blue area north of 101. I'm not looking at the red area that split because that's too big of an area, but blue doesn't seem as big. Um, so that's one thing. And then, um, you're not telling me anything. That's okay. Um, and then the, <laughs> the other item is, is clearly about the sequencing because it, it seems like I am the one that is affected by that because it would mean that I could not run for re-election next year when I'm up, um, which seems a pretty serious oversight, um, especially when it doesn't have to happen because um, trust, uh, Trustee Gonzalez is not gonna be in that area. So there's no reason why my area couldn't be up in 2022 because that would um, make me uneven with everyone else instead of it being a, um, a negative. So um, I could definitely see um, you have in, in scenario 2A, which is my preference, um, you have the um, area number two, the light green area up in 2022, which is where Trustee Gonzalez says he is moving to. And so we could have that one be the 2024 and we could have trustee area six where my little star is be up in 2022 and just switch those two. Um, I, I feel uncomfortable asking, asking you to make that change. So I would like to ask other board members to ask for that change. So it, so it doesn't look like it's me that's trying to manipulate this. Um, so when it, when it comes to somebody else's turn, maybe they can um, push for that. Um, because I think it makes a lot of sense. And if I could respond to some, there are a couple of trustees in a row I haven't had a chance to answer their question. Jed, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have. Uh, no, yep. no, no worries. But I think they all kind of tie in with one another. So first, the the issue about um, can't favor or discriminate against incumbency. So what that means is in the map drawing process, if say all of you lived on the same street and the demographer found a way to put you in three separate trustee areas, and the only reason that line was drawn was so that you'd all be in your own area. That's what that's talking about. Um, but here, um, I don't think the demographer had any idea that Trustee Gonzalez, I didn't know, was going to move. And so um, in every one of the map options, there's at least one pairing. And I think in a couple of them, the pairings are different. And so that shows that they were not drawn with the kind of evil G word of gerrymandering, but rather just, again, based on population. Um, you are right that obviously the closest to the perfect number for variance is ideal, but all of them are still legally viable options. There are some districts that get it as close to zero as possible. And others will approve a 9.89 for a variety of reasons. Might be that you know there's new development coming in. And so you want to have that area have less people now because you know there's going to be more by the time the next census comes out. There's a lot of different reasons for it, but all of them are good. And then lastly, I've heard some general comments about, you know, there's like, oh, this, this is the line on this street and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, that all comes back to population. So population and census block sizes. So um, you know, I didn't draw the maps, but I'm going to imagine that the reason there is a random line here or there is because they ran out of people to be able to fit into that one area. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I think the demographer gave different looks, some grouping communities together, some intentionally splitting them to see which the community likes better. And all of the thoughts here from everybody, for every one of the maps, completely valid and well thought out. Thank you. Okay, so um, we can do a second round. So I saw Trustee Fairchild and then Trustee Woodman. Um, thank you, Mr. Salt, for clarifying that. Um, Dr. Ryan, I brought that up. I brought it up not uh, because I wanted to know how that would affect sequencing, which was not the map, but the sequencing. And we wouldn't want an area not to have a representation. Because if we had the it for 2024 and Albert's, sorry, Trustee Gonzalez no longer lives there and Jody's not allowed to run, that's that's the whole purpose. So I would I would love to see the two alternate sequences sequencing. And can I finish? Yeah, thanks. And so th I, I think that's important because we do need to look at the sequencing because we do want each of the areas represented on the board. That's the whole purpose of going 
to trustee areas is to have representation for each of those areas on the board. So we would want to have representation for that area. Um, I would like to say that my, where I live, is uh, doesn't take into account all the new housing on Kiefer because they weren't moved in for the census. But if you would like to take a drive down Kiefer, know that there's a lot there and it's also of north of 101, there's a bunch flying there. So I expect to have the greatest population growth and have to have a line or, or whoever represents this trustee area, it will have in 10 years, in 10 years <laughs> it's going to have to have some changes. I do, I worry when we say that, um, I've heard comments where people look, especially I, my kids go to Ponderosa, we're very concerned about the line, um, why it wasn't down El Camino. I mean, sorry, Lawrence Expressway. That felt very gerrymandered to them, but everyone looks at it differently. The fact that it came in and cut out and they were like, why are they doing that? And so I think everyone looks at the maps through a different lens. Luckily, we didn't draw them. We had someone else draw them. We have to look at them and choose the best one we think that represents our district and will represent the people. And it's exciting. They're gonna be able to have trustee areas. And I think some of our populations that have been underrepresented, underrepresented will have representation. So that's exciting to me. Already, uh, Trustee Lieberman. Next. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, Mr. Salt, um, I'm, this might be a dumb question, but I, I'm, I'm wondering why, so if we look at map 2A and trustees Gonzalez and Muirhead are in area six, if trustee Gonzalez moves to, oh, okay. Um, if he moves to trustee area two, why doesn't his sequencing go with him? Why, why is there gonna be a discussion about sequencing? Why wouldn't trustee Muirhead keep her, trustee area six would be 2022 and wherever trustee Gonzalez moves would be 2024. There's no one in that area now. So why would there need to be a separate discussion on sequencing? Can I clarify your question? You're wondering, does the sequencing go with the trustee versus the area? Right. Yeah. The sequencing goes with the area. Okay. But when we're setting them initially, we're setting them be because we want to make it so that the system is fully implemented as soon as possible. Um, and again, that sounds like that would work potentially. Let's say this, if, if trustee Gonzalez happened to have already lived wherever he might move to, I would have made that area 2024 when I wrote up the draft sequencing. Right. Um, so, but but if you were to then move again, it, it doesn't follow him anymore once the board picks it. But if it's we- not following him, it's the, the area. So it'll be area one is 2022, area two is 2024. That's gonna be it. That's the four year sequence until there's a new map potentially or potentially for several years. But once that's done, the trustee moves, the trustee, moves, you're all at large elected. Once you're elected by trustee area and you move out of your area, you're not on the board anymore. Yeah. yeah. So can I provide you an example so that everyone gets clarity? Yes. So let's say that trustee Gonzalez moves from trustee Muirhead's area across the El Camino and into the lovely over near me. So I'm up in 20. 22, he's up in 2024. We would then change my, the area where I live would then probably become a 2024. Only if that's what the board picks on December. Okay. So if, if trustee Gonzalez, if, if the board picks a map and a sequencing and, and sequencing is part of the equations, you have to pick a map and you have to pick a sequencing. Um, and a lot of times, again, it, it's sort of done for you based on where you all live, but sometimes it, it's not done that way. Um, so there's a little bit less discretion than, than some districts might have, but um, once you pick it, once the county approves, the sequencing is because that's when that area has an election. And that's when that area is up for election each time. So because you're all at large still, if sometime between now and the next time that you're individually up for election, you move, that's fine. But the sequencing of the area doesn't change after that. However, let's say it's 2022 and let's say trustee Fairchild wins re-election and then you say you know what I really want to move to Sunnyvale you're off the board if you move out of your area 
Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So it doesn't follow the trustee unless you already live there. No, we're just looking at it now right. for how to set for how to set them. It's setting it for the area. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can you turn your mic, please? Yeah. That you since you can't shorten anyone's term, you you want to try to make it so that they would have that time there. Right. Well, right. And, and so that there wouldn't be or as few as possible open areas. Because right. again, some districts end up with a with a map that is drawn in such a way that there may be a trustee area or two that has no election in it for two or four years potentially. And granted, all the board members serve the entire district, but still the kind of goal is to get it so that it's one to one as soon as possible. Okay. Um, trustee Fairchild. So if Albert moves into my district, I would recommend that we follow 2024. Well, we have to decide that by December 9th. I understand that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying we're, we're I, I, I don't, we don't know where Albert's moving. He hasn't told us, but just to clarify, um, Mr. Salt, you're giving us these maps and the sequencing is recommendations. The board can make the decision that we feel is right. We don't have to use the sequencing even that you come up with, even if you make changes to it. I'm gonna pull up the statute so that um, I wanna make sure that I'm being clear. So it's election code 10010. For those following along at home. 10010. <laughs> Again. Yeah, go ahead. Can you use the mic, please? Our IT person is yelling. Um, yeah, sorry. My apologies to everyone. So the question is, does this work in reverse? So if somebody, for instance, was a uh, 2022 trustee and they moved into a 2024 area, would their term extend two years? No. no. So once the board picks a map in the sequencing, the sequencing is for the area specific. So for example, if I, I don't know where anybody lives, so let's say I'm on the board and uh, I live in area one and my term expires in November, 2022. And so we end up as a board because now I'm on the board in this hypothetical, we pick a map, map 10. And uh, I, my area, area one is open for election in 2022. And then in uh, May of 2022, I say, you know what? I wanna leave area one and I wanna move to another part of the district that has been, let's, say area six, and let's say area six is for 2024, my term runs until my term expires. And I can't run for board in that area because that area is not open for election where I live. Oh, let me, let me clarify that question a little bit. Let's say there's two trustees in the area. One is a 24, one is a 22. Okay. And so the 24 moves out of the area, leaving the 22 in an area that's now designated for 24. What happened? Once the board has adopted the sequencing for the areas, those are the sequencing for the areas. So if, so if. No, it would just. No, let me let him finish yeah, answering yeah. the question. So I, I, again, for you, let, let's trust you, Adam. And let's say, are you a 2022 or 24? I don't remember. I happen to be 22. That's immaterial. Okay, so we'll say I'm the 24. Right. Let's just say you and I are next door neighbors. Right. Let's just say that we live in area one just for ease, ease of the conversation. So because I'm a 2024 and you're a 2022, we're going to make the sequencing that area one where we live um, is not open for election until 2024. Mm -hmm. And then after the board picks the map, after the county approves of it, six months from now, I say, you know what? I don't like this part of the district anymore. Or, you know, I, I now you move closer over here. So I move out of the area. That area is still open for election in 2024 because I was still elected at large. So you have a two year period you have a two year period then with nobody in the office. But, but no, because I have not been elected by trustee areas in that scenario. I was still elected at large. So if you've been elected at large, you can live anywhere you want in the district until you've been elected by trustee area. So we'd go down to six trustees? Well, I would just still be on the board living, li living wherever because I was elected at large. But in 2020. You please use your mic. She's in this scenario with you and Andy, you're next door neighbors, you're 24, you're 22. We set trustee area one 2024 election. And then you decide I want to go live on the other side. 
in a different district. But as soon as you move out, how, how I was elected, which is the old system. And if you're saying that if I were to move from the old, it, let's say you move next door to Jim, because Jim's in a different and area, then if that would mean ordinarily that someone would lose their seat on the board, then yes, would be the case. Or an easier scenario would be, let's say we're in the same area, and then I move to San Francisco. So now I'm just not even on the board, you all get to make an appointment for my right. seat. But the area in which we both lived in this scenario, we've already designated as 2024, it doesn't change, even though you still live there. But your term would still expire in 2022 because unless you move, um, there's no election in that area until 2024. Right, so the only solution then becomes that you have to either go without or appoint. Right, and in theory, and you, the board could appoint someone who lives in that area, which could potentially be you. And if you choose not to appoint, then it can be forced to an election. Okay, so there could actually be an election if that happens. Yeah. Oh my God, right. we're, 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 but okay. I think we're getting much time. So, so let me let me uh, let me. Well enough that the sequencing is really not an issue based on where everybody lives, even if um, a trustee were to move soon or give the impression that they would. Right. We we we've. Okay, so uh, trustee Fairchild and then trustee Canova. Okay, so. Uh, trustee Gonzalez, Trustee Lieberman, Dr. Ryan are all on the board until 2024. Period. Period. Regardless right? Of where they live in the district. Regardless of where they, if they stay living in their trustee of one of the three trustee areas of which they were elected. Everyone understand? Got it. We are going to choose the four trustee areas because four of us are up for re-election. So that makes sense. We're gonna choose the four trustee areas that are up in 2022. It makes sense that those will probably correspond, but not necessarily to where we are seated right now. Right, and the reason for that would be if you picked any other area to be open for election in 2022, when there's a current board member already there, you're guaranteeing that there's going to be another area that has nobody living in. So when we're considering the sequencing, we're considering which areas aren't going to have representation if they don't have someone elected to it in 2022. After from the vac vac vacating of possible, vac you know, th those of us who are up for re-election. Yes. Okay. There are other considerations that don't factor in here because it sort of works out where everybody lives. But in theory, if all of you lived in area one and that's just where everybody happened to live and you didn't have this old system, um, there'd be a lot of choices to be made on sequencing. And those choices would mainly be based on the CVAP data and trying to give uh, communities that, uh, you know, protected classes with the higher percentages, the sooner opportunity to elect a candidate. But because that doesn't that scenario that I just made up with everyone living next to each other doesn't exist, and instead it sort of works out where you're going to get everybody represented either way, it's going to be fine. So, Jim, uh, Trustee Canova always like to talk about the brilliance of our hybrid, our hybrid system that we used to have, and one of the things I think we see here as a result of that hybrid system is we don't have three trustees living on the same block, because although we had to be elected at large, we had to live at least in three different areas. And so we're not in a situation except for in <laughs> one where we have trustees that, I mean, this hasn't been that contentious, thank goodness, regarding it, um, what's up for election and where we're gonna draw the lines because we, naturally live far enough apart away from each other because of the original three trustee system, three trustee area system. Yes, and it just happens to work out that way with this district, other districts as well. It might be where everybody ends up in their own area just because of where they lived or the old system where they lived. And then in other districts, there's a ton of pairings and that's just how it is. So, um, and that means that there's automatically going to be new people on the board in those scenarios. Could still be the case here because no one seat is guaranteed. You know, there's four seats open for election in 2022 and three in 2024. Where those are will depend on the map. Okay, come on, uh, trustee. <clears throat> yeah. So, and, and this has to do with your interaction with the public. So, under the current hybrid system we have, because it is a hybrid system, we have trustee areas, but we're elected at large, but we have to live within the boundaries of these various trustee areas. 
So the system we currently have, every voter across Santa Clara Unified can vote for or against every member of this board. That's our current system. Right. So as you're interacting with the community, are they understanding that when this is done, they will no longer be able to do that? They're only gonna be voting for one person. Yes, that's, and that's on, I think on slide three of every single presentation that's- and, the, and they're understanding this. Cause that's a big, that's a big change. That's a big difference. I mean, to be able to vote for or against every member of the sport and to go from that to voting for just one person. That's a big change. Jim, when I was campaigning last fall, people thought they already did that. So they didn't realize they voted for everybody. They thought they only voted for their trustee. I, I've heard that before, but that's not, that's not the interpretation of everyone. They, and they also think that this change is going to attend, uh, uh, change their attendance boundaries for school. So we can do as much as we can to explain, and we're doing, you know, everything we can. I would like to make. I'm just, I'm just making the point that that's sure. a big change. Yeah. And from my perspective, that's a big change. I, as a voter now, I, I live in this district. When I leave the board, I can't vote for or against everyone here. I'm only voting for one person every four years. Okay. So. Um, can I make a motion to close the hearing? Um, Second, as, soon as I summarize. Okay. Okay. So, um, in summary, we've we've been hearing about various members of the public and um, members of the board's preferences. So we don't decide that until December 9th. So we have these preferences. I don't think I've heard anyone ask for any lines to be moved um, or suggestions about changes in the map. So. It sounds like um, we will be keeping these maps um, up through December 9th. Just one moment and then I'll get to you. Um, but the one area that we've had some discussion is about the sequencing. And so um, you're going, uh, Mr. Salt, going to come up with different options for sequencing based on um, different scenarios. And, um, and that's what we will see is the change before December 9th. What I'll do is I'll create a PDF that we'll have posted on the website that'll be sequencing per map. And so it'll say scenario one, and then it'll have the sequencing. And then I'll say, or I have an alternative set of sequencing um, if it makes sense to do that. So based on what we talked about tonight, I will look at that and create a potential alternative scenario for you. Okay, thank you. And um, Trustee Fairchild, did I not capture something? Yes. Um, one of the things I had pointed out last time and this time, and obviously not as strongly as I could have, um, is that line on map one um, being on Lawrence and not going into Sunnyvale. Um, I think if you were to make all of the Sunnyvales look like map 2A and kind of um, work and, and work that, 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 I mean, the Sunnyvale residents, I, if, even if you look at the comments, they really like 2, 2A. But if you were to take that composition of Sunnyvale and apply it to the other maps, I think that would be interesting. So you're talking about map one, how the kind of the the, the orange area slides over into the, the upper part of the, the aqua area. Um, yeah, that that that's what, um, so my children go to the school that that's in and that's the comment I've gotten from people is like that felt gerrymandered to them. So I people, what I hear is they really like two, two A, and that's again, people look at it differently. Um, uh, and so it would be interesting to see what that, because Sunnyvale seems to have spoken <laughs> regarding that 2-2-A that and how that would impose on, on one and three. And, and, I'm just throwing out, I'm just yeah, throwing out a, some different ideas. It's a good thought. I, I, I suspect that the reason that kind of everything that is west of Lawrence can't all be, and it's not even on 2-A, either in that kind of aqua area seven is because I would imagine that there's just too many people that throws off the balance. And so even in 2A, it doesn't get everybody who is- it, But it's a little better. Sure, yeah. And then also in terms of the, the gerrymandering comment, there's nobody that lives in that area um, in that section that it's carved over. So it's it's not gerrymandered. Well. There's nobody that lives in the part that's west of Lawrence that's still in the orange area um, who's currently on the board. Not currently on the board. Well, obviously we don't know who they are, so we didn't uh -huh. for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, I don't I don't know who these people could be. Well, we don't have to pick this map. Yeah. I really don't like it. We we will. Um, she's talking about map one. Okay. So um, 
and you're also going to add the uh, attendance area overlay uh, onto the website so we can um, see those. And yes, I know the demographer just got them today, so they couldn't have been up before now, and so they'll be up soon. Okay, so Dr. Kemp, could you let us know when those go up so that we know to look for them? I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Motion um, to close public hearing. Second, Lieberman. Okay, so we have a motion from uh, Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Lieberman to close the public hearing. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, any opposed? Um, so that passes six to zero with um, Trustee Gonzalez stepped away for a moment. Um, okay. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you at our next meeting. President Murad, I have a request for the agenda. It's um, nine o'clock and so it's already getting to be late. And we have a superintendent here that's gonna make a presentation to us who's under planning right now. And by the time we get to planning, it's gonna be really, really, really late. So could we be kind and generous and perhaps move that up sooner? Okay. We, um, we also have some members of the public who are waiting to speak. So um, I hear you. Um, so we've got um, superintendent. Students, public comment. Um, can we, let's see, should we, where, where are you suggesting we move it? I leave it to your discretion, but certainly sooner than where it is. That, that, now's fine. Now's great. I'm sure nine o'clock will go very well. Um, Dr. Kemp, would that be okay if we move um, Q2 what? up right now and then I'll do my report? Yeah, we'll do Q2, the Silicon Valley CTE Metro Ed report, and then we'll um, go back. Because we've been going to midnight with some regularity, and by the time I get the planning, we'll be staring at midnight. <clears throat> um, I, I do want to respect the members of the public who came to speak, mm -hmm. um, who are present here to speak. So right. I would ask that we do the um, public um, comment on unagendized or agendized items first, then go to the report on Metro Ed and then proceed through the rest of the agenda. I can do that. That, that sounds, is that okay? Okay, so we'll do public comment, you're saying um, next, and then we'll do item Q2, our Metro Ed report, and then we'll go back um, and resume with the superintendent and go from there. Does that make sense, Dr. Kemp? Okay. Um, okay, then um, we are skipping uh, ahead to item J.1, which is public comment on unagendized items. So this is a time to speak on something that is not on our agenda, but is within our purview. So we have a few slips of um, public comment from people in the audience, and then we will go out to the um, webinar. So if you're on the webinar and you wanted to make comment on something that's not on the agenda, now would be a good time to um, raise your hand in the webinar. But we are starting uh, with the in-person. So uh, the first person I'm gonna call up is Lorena Guevara. And Ms. Guevara, do you need a translator? Yes, um, Mr. Gonzalez, can you translate for her? Okay, thank you. So you can come ahead and, and speak here. And you have, um, do we normally give three minutes, I think, for somebody who needs translation? So you'll have three minutes. You might need four minutes if they need to repeat. Yeah, we, it, uh, yeah we'll be flexible. Yes, please. Uh, buenas noches, mi nombre es Lorena Guevara. Uh, mi nieta uh, va a la escuela Brocker School al quinto grado. Uh, okay, yo... can, un momento. Oh. So, good evening. Uh, my my granddaughter goes to uh, uh, Brocker School and she's in fifth grade. Uh, yo no estoy de acuerdo uh, que están exigiendo la vacuna para poder ir a uh, I'll field trip. I am not. I am not uh, happy that that I need to have the vaccine in order to attend a field trip. Okay, esta policy is uh, 
ilegal e inconstitucional. Uh, so this policy is illegal and unconstitutional? Y es, un, y es uh, una policía discriminatoria. And it's a discriminatory policy. Uh, que tiene uh, que si la persona no tiene la vacuna, ¿por qué no puede presentar un test que sea negativo? If the person doesn't have a vaccine, why can they not uh, present a negative test? Y es, y además esta póliza está uh, violando los derechos uh, de los ciudadanos. Yo personalmente uh, me siento discriminada porque no voy a poder ir al field trip con mi nieta solo porque no tengo una vacuna. So, so this policy is discriminating against citizens and, uh, and this will uh, not allow me to go on a field trip with my granddaughter. Yeah, uh, yo como ciudadana uh, de este país, la verdad que me siento triste y, y es absurdo que no puedo ir con mi nieta a un field trip por una vacuna. As a citizen of this country, I feel this is absurd and, and uh, I feel bad that I'm not able to attend a field trip uh, with my granddaughter. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. Okay, next one is Alicia Maharis. Can you explain to this to the previous um, speaker that we can't talk or take action tonight? Le quiero explicar a la presidente de de la mesa directiva que no podemos hacer comentario o hablar sobre sobre esto. But we did hear and, and, la escucharon. and appreciate the comment. Y aprecian el comentario. It's asking what, what will be the next step after this? Um, so, uh, Dr. Kemp, is this something that you can follow up with the principal or is there... Um, so we have a district safety plan that's in place regarding uh, field trip, uh, field trip, uh, and and volunteers in the classroom, which includes field trips. Uh, I will follow up with the principal and uh, and be back in touch with uh, with this uh, parent. Okay. And do you need any contact information from the grandparent in Did order to follow? Put it on the form. Um, no. Okay. We could have her add it to the form, please. Si por favor puede agregar su información. En el formulario, la superintendente después hablará con usted. Dr. Kemp, do you also need the, the student's name? Or is that sufficient? Recker. Gracias. Okay. Um, Ms. Maharas, did I get that right? Yes, you did, thank you. Okay. Thank you for taking my comments. Uh, has this board applied for a grant under Assembly Bill 841 for the assessment, testing, adjustment, and repair or replacement of school ventilation systems? Hundreds of millions of dollars have been earmarked for the improvement of ventilation in California classrooms. If you have already applied, please make sure that your contractor is a licensed professional eligible under Division Three of the Business and Professional Code. Once your grant is awarded, please be sure to use certified TAB technicians and skilled, trained, and certified workers to make assessments, repairs, adjustments, and replacement of ventilating systems. Not following these guidelines can result in funds being withheld. If you have not applied, please consider doing so. Sheet Metal Workers Local 104 will be happy to help you with the application and with locating qualified contractors. The importance of air quality cannot be overstated as we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. A properly functioning ventilation system removes indoor pollutants like respiratory aerosols that are exhaled by all building occupants. Efficient ventilating systems also bring carbon dioxide particulates to healthy acceptable levels. <laughs> Studies have shown that low carbon dioxide levels may increase student performance, improve respiratory health, increase student attendance, and decrease airborne disease transmission. 
Air is life. I urge you to take advantage of the grants that are being offered under Assembly Bill 841. Sheet Metal Workers Local 104 can help you apply and locate qualified contractors. Thank you for your time. Trustee Ryan, I mean, Trustee. President Muirhead. President Muirhead. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if we could have, I mean, this is a subject that's come up and it's been extensively discussed. If maybe staff could present her with some information either right now or later. So, I mean. If you wanna leave your contact information then um, with the superintendent, then she can follow up with you uh, if we need more information or if, um, and if we have already done the necessary improvements. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next person is Tatiana Blandon. And do you need a translator? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, my name is Tatiana and I have a fifth grader at Bracker Elementary School. So they're currently gonna be going on a field trip in December to the Levi Stadium. So I did apply to be a chaperone and they called me and told me that I need, a ne that I need the vaccine in order to go. And then I asked um, you know, the secretary if I can take a negative COVID test showing that I don't have the vaccine. And on top of that, we are wearing a mask. Um, and she said, no, that that's the policy, that there's no way around it, that we need the vaccine. And to be honest, I think that's pretty ridiculous just because, just because somebody has a vaccine, that doesn't mean they're protected from getting COVID. It's just, you get the vaccine, you're getting it so you can get like, so you don't get COVID as severe, right? You're supposed to get less symptoms. It's more mild, but it doesn't stop you from spreading it. It doesn't stop you from um, getting, getting COVID. So I think the more safe route to go is to show that you don't have COVID. Um, it's just very, it's very sad that I'm not going to be able, that I'm not being allowed to go to my daughter's field trip because I don't, I don't have the vaccine. Um, whereas somebody, I mean, I can clearly show a negative COVID test. Okay. I don't have it, but then somebody who has the vaccine just because they have the vaccine doesn't mean they're protected or my daughter's protected around them because they can have, um, COVID, they can have COVID and not know it, or they can have COVID and not say anything, but just because they have that paper, they're fine to go. So I don't think that's okay. Um, and I honestly feel discriminated against because of that. And look at the core values. It says parental support and involvement. I'm not, I'm not being allowed to do that. As a single mom, I'm, I try to be as involved as possible. And that's not possible right now because of a vaccine. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, if we want, if the superintendent or the principal wants to follow up, are you at the same phone number? Okay, so if you want to list um, your phone number on your form so that we can follow up with you. Okay, thank you very much um, for speaking tonight and we'll have somebody follow up with you. We can't talk about it tonight because it's not on the agenda, but we can follow up. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, so now we are going out to the um, webinar for unagendized comments. So if you are out on the webinar and you wish to make a comment um, tonight on something that is not on the agenda, now is the time to raise your hand. And so I will pass it over to Ms. Strico to manage public comment. We have um, our first member of the public to speak is David Tong. And for um, to assist you with your comment, there will be a two minute timer on screen. And to ensure equitable speak time, we will have to move on to the next commenter at two minutes. Should be prompted to unmute, be prompted to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is David Tong. I have a son who's a ninth grader at Santa Clara High School. Uh, he is in the area that's the catchment area of the new school that's proposed at Zanka. 
he has an IEP, he has some difficulty making friends. And so I'm very concerned that if the school does go ahead with a 10th grade uh, intake, that he will be taken out of um, Santa Clara High School and will have to apply to stay there uh, with his friends. And there's no guarantee that he will get there. So I would ask the board to think seriously about the, um, the impact that having a 10th grade would have to all the children who are being dragged into the school from their existing schools. And I think the smart thing to do is just to keep it as a ninth grade intake. Uh, only. I'd also like to make a second point. My son and my daughter both went to Washington Open School, which had a number of field trips. And as a child, I was vaccinated against tuberculosis, and therefore I always show up as positive on any TB tests. In order to go on field trips, I had to have chest x-rays every time to demonstrate that I did not have tuberculosis because I showed up positive on the tests. Uh, and I willingly did that because I wanted to have part of my child, my children's uh, education. I think it's a damning indictment of the education in this country that so many people are reluctant to have a perfectly safe vaccine. I am very reluctant to have unvaccinated people around my children. So I would urge all these people who are saying they don't want to get vaccinated to learn a bit of science and get the vaccine. It's perfectly safe. I am boosted and I'm proud of it. And everybody should be. I do not want unvaccinated people around the children. And I yield the rest of my time. Okay, and uh, before we move on, I just want to comment that we're going to be talking about um, McDonald and um, its grade spans in item P.1. So you may want to stay uh, on the webinar until that point. Okay, Ms. Strico. And our next member to speak is Alicia Vasquez. Hi, um, so my name is Alicia Vasquez and I wanted to talk to you about something that you guys were talking about today because it's very personal to me and I see it uh, firsthand. Uh, and so you guys were talking about depression and how it's affecting kids and how the lack of uh, therapist um, is, has created a real problem. And, and it is, and I know that you guys are gonna work toward getting more therapists and more counselors available. It took uh, my daughter, I don't know, like, three months, we start, we tried to get somebody at the beginning of the year and we finally got somebody and it's been really helpful. Um, but one of the things that we're not talking about and that I think would really help students is empathy from the teachers and an understanding, even from principals, even from the district that we are talking about, oh, we understand and we wanna do something about this, but nobody is doing anything about the hours and hours of homework the kids are getting and what that causes. So my daughter has depression and she's got anxiety. And so the depression doesn't let her do the work because it immobilizes her and the anxiety kills her because she wants to really do good. And so it's, it's a really vicious cycle. And as a parent uh, to have, I, I would have never imagined my, my daughter was reading at fourth grade level when she was in first grade and I had all the hopes that every parent has. I would have never imagined that COVID would happen, that this would happen to her, but it is happening to her. And obviously I work for the district and I'm a huge advocate. So I fight and I go to everything, you know, that I have to do for her, but there's so many parents that can't do that for their kids and they're suffering. And so if we're gonna do something, let's do something with training um, teachers and staff to be empathetic to what kids are going through and to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. And President Muirhead, that was the final comment. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that last comment. Um, okay, we are um, then moving on. Um, our next item is public comment on agendized items. So this would be a time if you um, wanted to speak on something that's later in the agenda, but you didn't um, weren't able to wait, we'll give you a chance to speak now. So I wanna just double check, is there anyone in the room who wants to speak now instead of waiting until later? Um, or if you're on the webinar, now would be the time to raise your hand. Um, if you wanna speak now instead of speaking um, later on when we're dealing with an item. Um, so I see somebody in the webinar, so I'll turn it back over to Ms. Uh, the 
Member of the public to speak is Rupa. Rupa, you should be prompted to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Hi, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Um, I just Rupa? wanted to, can you, uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Rupa, we can hear you. Can you try to? Uh, oh. Is this better? We can hear you. Hello. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to make a comment um, regarding the new high school, McDonald, and um, possibly moving 10th graders over uh, next year. Um, I really have a, an issue with this. Um, you know, we're just getting back from, from COVID, uh, kids being isolated at home for a year and they're just really sort of starting new relationships and and kind of connecting to something. And I just don't think it's a good idea to pull someone who, um, you know, a 10th grader to a new school um, where I don't feel like things have been tested. Uh, I don't know if the um, sports programs will be up and running, uh, if, extracurricular stuff will be available like it is at the other high schools and I feel that they're going to be at a disadvantage not only emotionally but also academically and you know uh, being able to do other things at school so I would um, think the better thing to do is to start with the ninth grade and build from there um, adding a new grade every year uh, so that you know um, things can change and improve as the um, as the years go along. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, President Mirhad, that was the final comment. Okay, thank you. And, and just a reminder that we'll be talking about the grade span is item P.1. So I hope you can stay on until later. Okay, so now we are going to skip ahead to Q dot, Q dot, uh, to Silicon Valley CTE Metro Ed Report. Ms. Lynch, it's very nice to see you in person tonight. Sorry to, you had to wait for a while. No, no problem. Good <laughs> evening, board members and Superintendent Kemp. It's nice to see you all. Uh, if you don't know, um, I'm Superintendent for Metropolitan Education District. This is actually my eighth visit. So when I come here, I feel like uh, most of you already know about our program. Therefore, I have an abbreviated uh, presentation tonight really quick. Uh, short, brief, and to the point, just to kind of share with you, if you go to the next slide, um, what's new? And uh, it seems like so long ago, and so funny to be saying this right now, but it's all the way back to what did we do last year? Hard to remember what we did yesterday, right? But it was March last year that we reopened. Um, so when we reopened, it, we had 50% of our students that came back in person. And all of our classes, like many of the school districts, were delivered on Canvas online. Any students that didn't receive, um, I want to say, computers or Chromebooks from their home school district, then we were able to provide that to the students. And as far as uh, what else is new, uh, we received last year our first um, workforce or strong workforce grant, which was about $700,000. It was our third try, and so it took us three times till we got that. So we're really happy about that. And then despite the fact that we um, were in distance learning last year, by the end of the year, we had four students that competed in Skills USA, And that shows a lot of tenacity for the students because it, they still had to do it virtually. And we know that we were all in an uncomfortable situation. So next slide, please. Um, what's new at Metro Ed? We have a new chief business officer and then we have a new director of technology this year. And Dorothy Reconosi comes from Cupertino, 
uh, Union Elementary School District and Thomas comes from industry. So it's really exciting for him to come into education and bring a lot of new ideas. Next slide. And for uh, our programs, we have three new instructors this year. One of them is in dental. The second one is in the electrical maintenance program. And then we have a third one also in the sports medicine program. We too, kind of like what you were hearing um, from the public, uh, we're working a lot on the social emotional um, counseling aspect for our students. We're using our CTIG funds to fund a counselor. Uh, we're all in a situation where it's very difficult to find substitutes. And even though we have this new counselor, we find that we're sending her out into the classroom sometimes to substitute. That makes it hard sometimes to deliver your SEL, but uh, nonetheless, we're doing what all the other schools are doing as well. Something else that we have new on our campus this year, uh, you may have heard of an Opportunity Youth Partnership or Academy. Those are students that are returning to school, uh, weren't successful the first time, and we partnered with the County Office of Education to allow them to come into our programs. And although it's very small, we only have four students right now. Next semester, we'll have eight, and I expect years after that, it'll continue to grow. Um, we will be receiving, in fact, we received it yesterday, $1.7 million for COVID, and we spent about a million dollars last year, but um, we are dependent on our school districts, so typically we don't get the same funds, the CARES Act, and, and other dollars, so we we're really happy that they considered giving funds to centers like ours uh, for COVID as well. And finally, uh, we do have a foundation and we've transformed our foundation over the last couple of years. And this year we're really pleased that at the end of this month, they'll be offering 17 scholarships for students that backfill our programs, our, our high school programs, but uh, they still will be paying, or they will be paying, I should say about $3,750, $3,750 per semester for the students to attend. Those are students we either wouldn't have or wouldn't be going to school. So it's really kind of neat. Our foundation can do that. Next slide. This is really difficult to see. It's the data on your students and it shows you that a majority of them, um, like every year are, are seniors. We do have some juniors. It shows you how many of the students are have IEPs or 504 plans. Next slide. And then this one's a little easier to see. Last year you had, I wanna say off the top of my head, it was 68 students attending. Um, with COVID, um, all students, it was difficult. So we had 45 what we call pathway completers at the end of the year. Even though uh, 45 pathway completers, we had students, some students earned more than one certification. So we had students leave with 47 different certifications. We had students complete the programs with nine articulation agreements, five dual enrollment. Basically in short, that just means that they have college credit. And then you can see the other areas that students received uh, either UC, A through G, D, F or G, that kind of credit. So basically what that's saying is that we offer students um, college programs as well, or programs that will prepare students for college. Next slide. Uh, super hard to see. This is your data right now. And uh, so you have 89 students uh, at our center. And I wanna thank Andy and Jim and Stella for coming on our tour. Um, two of them yesterday and one of them today. Uh, to see our programs. And then this is a breakdown of showing you what programs that they're in. I don't have it in front of me and I can't see unless I look over here. Looks like your largest class is auto body refinishing and repair. And since we didn't get to that yesterday, we actually went to that on the second tour today first. Um, but that gives you an idea that you have students in a variety of different classes that we offer. Next slide. And then this is your data. Each year we show you your student data, basically where the students come from. You can see that a majority of them come from Wilcox High School. And next slide. And then this is the data. I always show you uh, five years worth of data. You can see again that your enrollment went up this year. So thank you very much. We appreciate that. And this one, again, just being short and brief and, and to the point, uh, we had Alex Lee, He's a local assembly person who was a champion for us last year. He helped us uh, speak with the state uh, numerous times for and asked for direct funding for Metro Ed. Hopefully that'll happen one day, <laughs> but he's been a champion um, and a really good partner to us uh, advocating for us in Sacramento. And that's my report. So thank you very much. 
respect Thank your you. time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any um, questions for our speaker? I really enjoyed the tour today. It was awesome. It, it was really it, what I always love. And I haven't been on the campus in a while. What I love about the campus is just, you know, Albert gets to see this because he's there on a regular basis and you get to see it in your board meetings. But just the the students eyes light up and the passion and the connections they make, you know, and a lot of on the tour it was students who were doing the presentations as you saw. And and they're just their, their confidence, their engagement, it, you know, it's just so wonderful to see a campus change kids lives that way. And, and as we've seen over the years, in some cases, we've had students tell us it's actually saved their lives. It's just a great program and that direct funding must be restored. It must be, it has to be. It'll take time, but it'll get done. Alrighty, any other comments? Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming out, spending the evening with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Giving us thank that you. update. All righty, so now we are going back to um, item H.1, report from the superintendent. And before we do that, um, I have something to share. Oh, there it is, thank you. Um, so uh, I was made aware that our very own superintendent Kemp um, uh, received uh, from um, Dr. Dewan on behalf of AXA Region 8 Women Leadership Network, that she has been selected as AXA Region 8 Women Leadership Network's November Profile in Leadership. And uh, it says, periodically throughout the year, we celebrate one leader in our crusade to honor women leaders in Santa Clara County. These profiles and leadership serve to inspire and empower. Um, and there's a little article, um, and I just wanted to read one little piece of it that um, I was proud of. It says, Dr. Kemp is recognized as a transformational leader who has success successfully led school and district improvement, including implementing fiscal recovery measures, successfully leading bond measures, and leading district visioning for equity transformation. So um, I'm very um, pleased uh, for Dr. Kemp and um, excited to share that we have uh, a winner uh, in our midst. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Kemp, for leading us and um, getting recognized for that leadership. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it's, it was, it's an honor to be selected, so appreciate it. Was it Mirahead? Any chance that we can cool things down just a little bit? I thought I was just having my own personal summer over um, here. I'm, I'm boiling. <clears throat> Somebody could maybe adjust the temperature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, everyone. And um, I just want to go ahead and start with the superintendent's report for November 18th, 2021. Uh, you'll hear an update on COVID-19 a little later in tonight's agenda. I wanted to share with you that following the last board meeting, I'm moving forward with the establishment of a superintendent school climate and culture advisory committee. Uh, the purpose of the advisory committee is to foster an inclusive, safe, and welcoming environment for all students in Santa Clara School District, facilitated by our Title IX coordinator, Lisa Strom. The advisory committee welcomes SUSD staff, students, parents, guardians, caregivers, and community members to participate in a discussion in discussions to make recommendations to me um, related to school climate and culture. And currently we're working on organizing the committee, which will include working groups. The whole committee, which launches in January, will initially meet via Zoom at least quarterly with working groups meeting more frequently between each committee meeting. The primary goal is to work collabor collaboratively with our stakeholders to identify, prioritize, and develop solutions to physical, emotional, and social barriers affecting SCUSD school climate and culture. For example, all, example, all gender access to the bathrooms, equitable dress codes, and bullying and cyberbullying. An announcement will be included in tomorrow's district's, uh, district update, including a link to a survey that will collect comments and participation interest. And I look forward to sharing updates with the board and the community as these important discussions move forward. Last night, the student, uh, the student, parent, staff, and community members of the Equity and Social Justice Committee held their third meeting. We heard from a guest presenter, Dr. Shelley Holt, who I have a connection with many years ago, we didn't realize it, to her days in Fontana, um, to learn more about educational equity means 
uh, challenges for equity and actions that create equity. Uh, they broke into small groups and looked at the four tenets of the equity work, staying engaged, experiencing discomfort, speaking the truth and expect and accept non-closure, which was similar to what the board had experienced when we did our equity workshop oh, a few weeks ago. Dr. Holt asked the group to engage in personal reflection and readings as they're part of their research and virtual learning opportunities. And they will continue this work next month before launching into planning for stakeholder listening sessions in the spring. Building on the successful collaboration to address the district challenges created by COVID-19 pandemic, the KUDOS Labor Management Partnership met on Wednesday, November the 10th, to hold the first in a series of meetings that will focus on addressing key challenges and needs in special education. A total of 29 district employees work together, including teachers, behavior team members, paraeducators, site and district administrators, representing SCUMA, uh, uh, as special education director, Kathy Alanis, myself, Phnom um, Amber Wacht, <laughs> and CSEA president, Lynn Villarreal. The KUDOS team identified special education program strengths and candidly discussed the top challenges facing our special education students and staff. Uh, they also began to brainstorm um, potential solutions that will be further developed at the next meeting. The, uh, a productive start was encouraged and the team has continued to meet regularly to address these pressing issues. And as collaboration moves forward and progress and outcomes will be shared, we're confident that working together, we can raise this challenge and become stronger and more effective special education program for our students. I wanna remind the board that the firehouse run is uh, coming up on December 5th through 12th. Uh, today, we found out that the Rotary Club of Santa Clara has ousted us out of first place. Uh, and so I just want to remind everybody that the firehouse run is organized by the Santa Clara Firefighters Foundation. They raise funds to support our students by donating all proceeds to the school's foundation. And this year will be virtual again. So I just want to remind everybody to sign up and we have a district team here that's going up against Rotary. So, all right. So it's been three weeks since our last board meeting and I've attended a number of community events and meetings, some virtual, some in person. On November 1st, I met with representatives from the county supervisor Otto Lee's office regarding a housing study that they're conducting in the county. And that same day, I attended PTA council with our principal, Ron Lay, here from uh, McDonald High School, who shared information about the school. On November 2nd, I attended the orientation for our new site principals and their leadership teams to learn about our kudos work and the role that SLT and provides uh, towards this partnership work at the school sites. Uh, we've had a couple CVRA forums since the last board meeting, including a virtual meeting this week. This week, I attended the SF Squared board and general meeting where we're planning for the upcoming CSBA AEC conference and the discuss of the impact of universal TK on community-based school districts like ours, or community-funded school districts. But I want to say that the most exciting thing that has happened to me since the last board meeting was attending the 49ers game this past Monday. It was so wonderful to see our 49ers beat LA. And um, so I just have to say that that was just awesome. And the, the camaraderie in the stadium was fantastic. So if you, hopefully they're gonna continue on their winning streak. Uh, this week, I also had um, my superintendent roundtables, And so I have some shout outs to give tonight. Um, Monica Martinez, the secretary at Santa Clara High School, you work so diligently and get sub coverage. Thank you so much. For Gail Berry, the new nursing assistant at Santa Clara High School, always smiling, even though she's experiencing baptism by fire. Um, Leslie Galvert, the lead BCBA, putting so much effort in providing training to her BCs in Paris. Uh, Sarah Cavalli for your fabulous tech skills. Gina Lau, AP uh, payroll technician, helping out with issues, prompt on emails, and patient with our department. Peterson's admin team, Krista, Chandra, Angela, unsung heroes at our school who are working hard and deserve some recognition. Thank you for being so positive. Mary Audrey, the clerk at Bowers Elementary School. Mary is an amazing person. She knows all the families who attend Bowers. Even if a family moves in new, she meets them there at the school to give them a head start on their first day of attendance. Principal Wakefield at Heyman. She makes time for everyone, is always there to listen and super supportive. 
Karen Kimichek, our district nurse, you have, she has, she has even killed all the time and super supportive. Katie Fernandez, the preschool, um, with the preschool team, first person who interacts with students and their families. She is magical. And I also want to share our donations. So this night, tonight on our consent agenda, we have, there's something that does, it's not a typo, I promise you. So Alice Gunnarsson Living Trust for donating $400,000 to Santa Clara Unified School District High Schools for their music department. And this is amazing. So but what you need to know about Alice is she actually worked in our school district for a number of years. She was here for a few years, um, for three years, then went and did some military work, came back a total of 35 years in the district, um, but retiring from the human resources department she was a classified employee of the year in 1977, loyal employee, lifelong musician, is known for her musical talents throughout the area, um, a woman of many talents. So thank you to Ms. Gunnarsson and her family for this generous gift to our music programs, and we promise to put it to good use. Raleigh Elementary PTA for donating $17,500 to the School for the Starting Arts Enrichment Classes. Zanker Road Resource Management for donating $10,000 to George Main Elementary for environmental projects, including field trips and assemblies. Santa Clara High School Athletic Boosters for donating $5,000 to school athletics. Heyman Elementary for donating $3,000 to the School for Technology. Uh, we also have uh, some other partner gifts, $12,000 from UTSC to sponsor this year's Family Resource Center holiday gift giving to support 120 families. $11,000 from UTSC to sponsor a new clothing closet at our Family Resource Center to support 110 families. $4,000 from CSEA Chapter 350 to also sponsor the Family Resource Center clothing closet and food pantry throughout the year. $1,000 from CSEA Chapter 350 to sponsor Thanksgiving meals for the FRC uh, supported homeless and foster youth to approximately 66 students. That's amazing. So November is a month where we take time to pause and reflect on the past year and to consider the gratitude or the things for which we are grateful. And so tonight I want to close my superintendent's report with sharing my personal gratitude. Thank you to our parents and guardians for having faith in Santa Clara Unified and for sending us your beautiful children. Your children come with strong values, respect, tolerance, and appreciation. Thank you for your commitment to ensuring both their success and ours. Thank you to those who've engaged through strong community service and partnerships. Your support for our district and our schools bring opportunities that take us beyond our means. Groups such as, and not limited to the PTAs, DAC, our mayor and city council members and city departments of public safety, planning and development and parks and rec. Thank you to our schools foundation, the 49ers foundation, the Rotary Club of Santa Clara, the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, and to our business partners and trade associations for contributions of time, money, and in-kind donations that are not, not only go to support academic goals of schools, but often go directly to our social, to our social economically disadvantaged students and their families, as well as to sponsoring health and wellness events for our staff, Lockheed Martin, Huawei USA, Intel, Roche, NVIDIA, Global Foundries, KLA, Mission College, UTSC, CSEA, Strom Construction, Swinnerton, LPA Design, Fugro, BKF Engineers, and Ernst & Young. Just since July, we've been blessed with a community support of over 90 hours of time of service for our students and their families of more than $111,000 in grants and gifts to the district and donations that often go directly to socioeconomically disadvantaged families through our Family Resource Center. Thank you to our, para, to our school professionals our school professionals for the commitment that you make every day to the students of Santa Clara Unified. I thank you for your dedication to educational and organizational excellence. I thank you for striving to meet every expectation that we've set for our district. Thank you for your ongoing professionalism and cooperation. The last few years disrupted by the pandemic have been extremely challenging, yet you have stepped up in every single way, pushing your own learning and thinking becoming creative in ways you approach and carry out your work. Whether you're a teacher, support staff, or a manager, we truly have the best of the educators here in Santa Clara Unified. 
Thank you, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving. Okay, thank you so much uh, for those words, Superintendent Kim. Okay, so now we are moving on um, to our reports from student board representatives. I just have to step out a minute. I have these two, two child, children issues that I need to take care of. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, can you queue up the student? Hey, it's Crystal Escalera, and I'm here to let you know what has been going on this month of November here in New Valley High School. Of November. Here First off, I'd like to say that we are still First continuing off, to do COVID testing, and that is taking place on Wednesdays. Right now, Hey, it's Crystal Escalera, and I'm here to let you know what has been going on this month of November here in New Valley High School. First off, I'd like to say that we are still continuing to do COVID testing, and that is taking place on Wednesdays. Right now, our leadership class is currently planning upcoming events for the upcoming holidays, including doing a five days of winter spirit, and there will be further details about that in December's video. First off, to start off with the events, there will be a turkey trot taking place on November 23rd, and it will be a two-mile run. There will be prizes for first, second, and third place winners. Including in those prizes, first place will receive a turkey with the pumpkin pie for their family. Second place winner will receive a $20 gift card, any of their choice. And third place winner will receive a $10 gift card, any of their choice. And good season to our volleyball team. They did good this season. Congratulations to Melody and Jonah for being the MVPs of their team. Also, on a personal note, I'd like to thank SVCTE for giving us the chance and the opportunity to prepare us for college and giving us the knowledge that they're giving us. Good job to the students still attending. That's it for this video. Thank you for listening to this month's announcements. And if you guys have any questions or comments, please let us know. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Pollock, and this is my board report for this week. Um, on Tuesday, the seniors took their panoramic picture, and yesterday, Wilcox had its open house at 530, featuring our respective subject departments like world languages, um, athletics, after-school clubs like uh, the Wilcox Business Experience, um, and more to prospective students who might be interested in attending Wilcox next year. Um, last Friday, the 12th, our varsity football team had their first CCS game against Santa Cruz, and since this was a CCS game, you could only purchase tickets through an online platform. Uh, because they weren't selling them at the gate. Um, we took a victory last Friday and we have our second CCS game tomorrow versus St. Ignatius. Um, our boys cross country team also had their CCS meet last Saturday and won second place. And speaking of athletics, season two sports are in full swing. So that includes boys and girls basketball, soccer, and wrestling. Um, ASB is holding their annual toy drive. And so they are accepting new toys that are worth about $5 or cash donations. Um, for the students at George Main Elementary School, each $5 worth toy is equal to one point, and then all the third period classes are competing against each other. Um, first place gets a pizza party, second place gets a donut party, and third place gets candy canes. And I think that this is a great way to sort of show that this is the season of giving. Um, and then the Wilcox Stage Company, which is our drama group, had their fall showcase, Not Completely Hopeless, last Friday and Saturday. Um, I want to give a shout out to everyone who was in the showcase. I heard it was a huge success and there were over 200 people that showed up. Um, so anyways, that's it for this week's board report. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving and enjoy your break next week. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's Faith Montemtola and I'm back here to report what's going on at the Santa Clara campus. So to start off my report, I'll be addressing how our fall sports season came to a close. About two weeks ago, we had senior nights for football, cheer, dance, band, volleyball, water polo, and many other sports, as seen here. So with the fall sports season coming to a close, we've had our tryouts for the winter sports. We've had tryouts for both basketball and soccer for both girls and guys teams. And hosted by our leadership class, we had our second harvest food drive. And so for this, we actually made a website for donations instead of donating physical cans. And with our $500 goal, we raised $607. Just a little insight of how our website is. Something else that's happening this month is our family giving tree toy drive, but this will be happening on the 22nd. So I'll update you on details at the next meeting. That is all for my updates today. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus, and I'm going to be telling you guys about what's been happening here at MEX since the last time we spoke. Uh, I believe it was on the 28th that we had our last meeting. The day after, um, the 29th, we had our freshman fall festival. 
uh, along with our Halloween celebration, which uh, was very fun and went off without a hitch, which is uh, very exciting. And it was a great way for us to uh, strengthen our community here at Max. Um, in the same vein as festivals, uh, we also have uh, plans for a winter festival coming up very soon. Uh, haven't, ironed out the, iron, haven't ironed out all the details on it, but I will keep you all posted. Um, continuing, uh, our college classes have begun to die down, which is a uh, much needed stress relief. And, but with our college classes dying down, that does mean that our finals are coming up shortly. So we do have to be prepared for those. Um, besides that, uh, that's pretty much it. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Superintendent Kemp and the uh, three other board members that uh, visited uh, Max on Monday. It was a pleasure to have you guys uh, at Max. Um, and that's about it. Uh, uh, thanks for listening. Alrighty, thank you to all of our students for their reports. Uh, it's always enjoyable to hear. We are now moving on to uh, consent items. So this is item L.1. Motion and, to approve, uh, we, we it, Just a moment, we are making a motion. We pulled a few items. So this would be a motion to approve items 11.2 through 11.36 with the exception of L.15, L.18, L.31, and L.32 now. We still move to approve, Rotterman. Okay, thank you. We have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. And I did want to make one other mention that um, there was a couple of corrections made to the um, board minutes at the um, in the last day or so. So um, I had it all queued up, and now I lost it. So. Um, there so was, was L, um, here we go. L dot five, five uh, four and L dot six. So the minutes for the 10 dot 28 meeting were missing the closed session readout. So that got added. And the minutes for the um, work study session um, on uh, November 4th was missing the member of the public who spoke. So those were added. Okay. So now we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, any opposed? And Trustee Ryan is absent. So that passes six to zero. Thank you. Now we um, will go on to um, L.15, which is service provider agreement between San Andreas Regional Center and Santa Clara Unified School District. And um, uh, Trustee Fairchild, you pulled this. Do you want to start us off? Yes. Um, I don't know if these are related. I apologize first. I always do consent on the day of the board meeting. There's a lot to get through, so I kind of prioritize it. So I apologize. I didn't. Usually, there's not issues with consent items. However, this is an item that's related to a direction the board gave at the beginning of January. A very specific direction. Um, and yet we haven't gotten that information back. So I wanted to know, because um, Andy Ratterman, Trustee Ratterman made the motion, it passed unanimously, that we would get a report on what it would take to get licensed. And um, we would. there was lots of things in that motion. So I wanna know how this relates to the motion and direction that was given back in the beginning of September. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes, we uh, met in September, September 9th, and we did have a lot happen between then and now. So I'm glad to be reporting at this time, because each week something new is happening, which is good. We were having a lot of movement with SARC. So with the last meeting, we had told you that we were waiting for the program design to be approved. The new one. We were waiting to find out if SARC was going to assist with helping to find caregivers for the students who needed personal care. And um, what we learned, we in the beginning of October, we had a meeting with leadership at SARC. Prior to that, sorry, they um, we 
we were not getting any communication from them because they were understaffed. We were assigned a new resource specialist. And since she came on, we've had a tremendous amount of communication and things have been moving very quickly. So that's been very good. Um, so we have, she assigned us, she started looking over our, our program design and the, we met with leadership at SARC in the beginning of October and they were just waiting they were looking into um, the community care licensing piece, which is completely separate, you know, from our program design licensing and SARC are mm -hmm. two separate things. They were wanted to make sure that licensing would approve having personal caregivers on an unlicensed at an unlicensed facility. So that's why they were holding, giving one-on-one um, -on -one caregivers for students. And they met with us to tell us that licensing did confirm that it is okay to have caregivers at an unlicensed facility. The next day, we had students receive one-on-one -on -one caregiver from SARC. So since that time, four students have been approved to have caregivers come with them to school. Six are now in process. Three have chosen alternative schedules that are working for them. So they're able to come on their own, maybe just in the morning, afternoon, that's working for them. Two students do not have caregivers and have not made any movement on that. One of them is trying, is going to take steps to the self-determination program. That's where you can decide on your own where your, your funding from SARC is spent. And he would possibly be able to have it spent at um, Independence Network. And then three students um, are no longer in the program. Two students went to other programs and unfortunately one student passed away. His name is James Saxon and he's been with the program for many years. So that's where we are with Sark and the caregivers. And we talked about being creative with them because Trustee Ratterman talked about that when we left the, the last meeting and how we can serve those that are not yet having caregivers, which are just a few at this point. Um, one of the things is the um, possibility of having caregivers who SARC work with more than one student, depending on their level of need. So at this point, they're looking into that. Um, and then we talked about the grand, uh, grandparent and senior companion program, which is an, also an MOU that was just on the consent item. That's not so much to provide personal care, but it's additional just uh, support in the classroom. And so that, that's just helpful to have more people there um, in person. And so though right now, um, the service providers are working with those students who need, who need an aid. And then at this, at the, on the other end of that, um, we are trying to come up with ways on how, how students could afford a private care uh, a caregiver if they needed to. So the uh, Friends of Independence, uh, Friends of Independence Network students, FINS, um, they had told us in July that they were planning on dissolving in fall and that they're having um, discussions about that right now in November and they're going to get back to us. But in those discussions with FINS, they have about $70,000 and they want to know where, how we could best use it. So our recommendation to them was to um, donate the funds to the Santa Clara Schools Foundation, where they would create a caregiver scholarship fund. And, um, and so any of the families that still needed a caregiver and weren't for some reason able to get them through SARC, although at this point, we think they're all gonna be able to get them through SARC, um, but that way, that money is used to, for our existing students who need caregivers. And um, so Steve Neese has met with Santa Clara Schools Foundation. They are on board. We just need to find out from FINS if they're ready to donate the money to them or if they wanna donate it directly to the program. But if they donate it directly to the program, we wouldn't be able to support getting caregivers. So that's where we are with the current program design is ready to go. This is an agreement that needs to be signed. Um, and then we can move forward in that sense. As far as licensing goes, we looked into it as much as we possibly could. It's, they don't give a lot of information. Um, so 
we would essentially have to hire uh, someone to, to do this for us. I don't have the bandwidth to do it. We don't have a supervisor for that program. So um, we would have to somehow hire a consultant to prepare the application. Um, they would have to attend the required orientation. So that's where you get all the information of what it takes to get licensed. So I haven't attended that. Um, and then we uh, would submit an application. At that time, we would need to hire a full-time program supervisor for Independence Network to take care of this. Um, and then CCSL, CCL would give us uh, a sign an agent, a licensing agent. And at that time, they would do a facility audit. They would need, they need blueprints of the, of the buildings. They would, um, the drawings and everything on the buildings, and they would decide if there were any upgrades to the facility that needed to be done. Um, the program supervisor would have to attend CCL, CCL administration uh, administrator training and then get an administrator certification. And if we were to get licensed, we would then have to hire probably seven to 10 uh, life skills paraeducators that are 12 months in order to provide personal care. And then we would have some significant changes in the budget. Um, and then I think, so the questions that I had at the end of the last board meeting that I walked away with was, what would it cost for caregivers without licensing? None of our current families, looked into it. So we just kind of ballparked it and um, at like $20 an hour. And it would be significant amount of money for a full school year, but that's why we're looking into the caregiver scholarship fund with FINS and our other recommendations, then the, it was what would the staff recommendations would be. And the recommendations are that we move forward, forward with um, our current program design or a new program design. This new agreement is the first time it's been updated since 1991. I think it's the right direction to go for the program and for the students. Motion to approve, Fairchild. Okay, thank you very much um, for all that information. So it um, uh, sounds like you're recommending that we don't do the licensing because we've It'd be very expensive. We found other ways around it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. So we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild and a second by Trustee Gonzalez um, to approve. Uh, Trustee Raderman, you have a question or comment? I do. So I appreciate it. It looks like you did a lot of the work that we had asked you to do. Um, the only piece of that that maybe uh, I would have liked to have seen was, I mean, you've given us an oral report. I would have liked to have seen you know, a direct response back, okay, here's, here's the options, here's the cost, that type of thing. Um, because we might still, I mean, it, from what you said, it sounds like we probably would accept the staff recommendation, but I would want to see it and make a, you know, a determination is that, or we go a different way, we provide additional resources, whatever it is. So I would still like to see that come back. Um, we can certainly, this service provider agreement goes a long way towards accomplishing the goals that prompted the questions initially. So I'm certainly gonna support this, but I still would like to see that come back um, uh, to us. So we've got that information here. The other thing, you know, sometimes you get these, the, you get challenges that are created by legislative, they're beyond, you know, the local control. And those are some where we can become advocates. We can talk to, uh, folks and say, hey, you know, our, our elected officials and say, hey, you know, look, here, here's a consequence of some of the stuff you did. I think it's well intended, it's well meaning, but look what you look at what look at what happened as a result of this. You need more flexibility in this program, or you need other, you need to make some exceptions, or uh, et cetera. So I'd still like to get the report back if that's something that we can do. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the work you put into it. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but I still want to see that information. Thank sure. you. I have it, and I appreciate that. No problem. Okay. Thank so I, I've made a note um, that we want that to come back to the board. It may just be a, as a report. Um, it sounds like, report's fine. yeah, we, um, we've had the discussion tonight. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild and a second by Trustee Gonzalez to approve um, this item. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so that passes six to zero uh, with Trustee Ryan being absent at the moment. So thank you very much, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is L.18, which is a consulting service agreement with Envision Learning Partners. And uh, Trustee Farrell, Fairchild, you pulled this one. Again, I apologize that these weren't submitted earlier, uh, but I look at consent last when I go through the agenda. So that my issue is um, that the administrative summary and then the scope of work don't necessarily match. Um, so in the administrative summary, we um, talk about them working with us for three years and mainly working with the high schools, but their submitted scope of work is for two years. And then they talk about um, only the graduate portrait. They do not talk about uh, performance assessments or school, uh, any of the things that are in that first part, their, their scope of work just focuses on the graduate portrait. So are they working? It, it just didn't seem to match for me. So I'm a little confused as to that. My other question is, I, I would love to see us implement something in Vision 2035 without the help of a consultant. Absolutely. We're hiring a lot of consultants, guys. Yes. No, completely understand. And this is, um, this is an area of capacity building. And what this is, is a natural follow on to our PBL initiative. So as we're winding down our work with PBL Works, which has really helped teachers and principals understand the dimensions of high quality project based learning, what's been lacking is the assessment of those projects. So right now we don't have any consistent criteria for high quality performance assessments. And there are five dimensions to the scope of work. Um, one of them has to do with vertically articulating the graduate portrait, which I believe you've referred to in terms of benchmarking it at different grade levels and turning it into I can statements that students can actually understand and their parents can understand. And we can use to design different projects, capstones, exhibitions, performance assessments around. But the, the bulk of their work actually is building a shared understanding of high quality performance assessment across the district. We don't have any consistent definitions right now. It's up to individual teacher practice. Our TOSAs aren't necessarily trained or calibrated around this. And as we're moving more towards standards mastery and competency-based education, it's critical that we have a common and calibrated understanding of what constitutes high quality performance assessment. Um, and, the, the, and they are best in class nationally, um, and they're located in the Bay Area around this. Um, they're also going to help. We have several schools that are ready to go with uh, Envision Learning Partners um, to build performance assessments into their projects. Um, and we have clear desire from McDonald and Huerta and Agnew um, to work with them as part of their, it's, this is a critical part of their instructional model. Um, and then they will also support teacher teams um, who are participating in the current PBL cohorts to pilot these new high quality performance tasks tied to PBL. So it's basically ensuring that ensuring the rigor um, and then eventually the alignment to the grad portrait of all of our project based learning um, efforts that are going on across the district here. So is it for two or three years? We can... so, it, so it is through um, June 2023. Um, so I guess that is two years um, and not three years. So I apologize if we said three years, but I think um, what we're referring to is kind of the, the way that the, the June summer of 2023 would, would tee up the third year. So I apologize if there was a little bit of a misalignment. So I guess what you say sounds really great, but it doesn't really align with what they wrote as to what they're going to do. And so that's where I, why I brought it forward is the, I felt like the administrative summary and their statement of their scope of work didn't quite match. They only focus on the graduate. It seemed like they only, they were mainly focused on the graduate portrait and rather, and not all these other things. I, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm reading directly from the scope of work and it's, yeah. Three days of service related to building shared understanding of high quality performance assessment. 20 days related to building performance assessment systems at selected school sites. 
seven days piloting high quality performance assessment. I'm, go, I'm talking at their first, their first as they. Well, this is, this actually details the exactly what the services are in the scope. So I, I guess there's a, a different one that I was looking at. Sorry, I didn't bring my laptop. To Perhaps me. you were looking at the contract instead of the scope of work. That, that could be. Uh, so it just, it, um, so it's like, what, what was it, where was it? It just seemed to be over, like, if you look at a, how, what will our learn, our system learn how to do? And it was all, it seemed to be all about the graduate portrait. And, um, so I can see what you're saying as far as the other, sorry, I'm trying to use Stella's computer. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. Um, but I also would like to see us um, use our own staff more to implement um, all of these things because it seems like the this vision and graduate portrait can't it costs us money every single board meeting, and so. Um, I am a little concerned. Sure, I completely understand the concern. And I guess I would offer by way of example that we're winding down our partnership with PBL Works now because we have built the training and the capacity in the system on the part of our TOSAs, lead teachers, and site administrators to be able to support that internally. And this is the same capacity building plan with performance assessment. It's just staggered a year and a half later than the PBL Works. So we absolutely are not interested in developing a dependency on them. Uh, a clear part of this strategy is with the teachers who already have PBL under their belts, this is the actual next step. And the same thing with our TOSA cadre. We have, they're responsible for supporting a lot of the assessments out in the system. And this is gonna build their capacity to calibrate about making sure that they're high quality and ultimately aligned to our graduate portrait. So I'm, 100% behind you around this is building our own bench strength to do this on our own going forward. I'm excited to see us do it on our own. Okay, uh, Trustee Rodman. Yeah, um, so I've been watching this and, and um, I don't want this to come across negatively. I think there is a, a positive to, to my comment. But we seem to, I feel like I'm constantly in a reactive mode. Um, I don't know what's coming down the pike. Now, you may well have planned out and have this beautiful pathway figured out as to what's gonna happen, what we need. Let's bring some outside, outside consultants in, let's buoy this up. Let's get some short-term help to get these up to speed, all of that stuff. From my perspective, it's just like, oh, here's a contract for another consulting. Here's a contract for another consulting. What's this about? Why do they have to do that? Why can't they do this in-house? What are the issues? What's the ultimate goal and objective? So not necessarily that you're being reactive, but from my perception, it feels reactive. And so if there were some way you could sit there and come down and say to us, okay, look, we've plotted out the next 12 months or six months or whatever it is. And here's our objective. We want to create this environment, this type of training, this type of thing. In-house, we can do X. We want to supplement that with Y, okay? And so that when these, because right now what happens the first time we see these, the first time we have an inkling that you want to do something, it's to approve a contract. And I have trouble with that because I'm trying to figure out, well, is this something we really need to do? Is this, you know, is this the best allocation of our resources, et cetera? Because they don't have the big picture. I do have the grand picture. I have the, the strategic plan, the portrait, all that, but I don't see how the pieces are fitting together. The puzzle, it's, it's a big puzzle with pieces all over and I'm getting asked to pick, the, pick a piece and do something with it. And so I think if there was something you could do to bring to us sort of your, your, your pathway that you're going to take what types of resources you anticipate needing. Now, you may not know you need this particular company, but you know there's going to be a need because our PBL people, we need an additional supplemental 
support to get the people up to speed. We need to do some training, whatever. So that's my comment to you because I think we're having a lot of these get challenged because we don't know what's happening. And I appreciate us challenging those because that's part of our job. But I think it would be better for everyone involved and we would get out of what I think of is every time we challenge it, there's a little, there's a tiny bit of negativity that sneaks into it because it's like, well, why are we doing this? How do you have to do that? And that's not what we want to be. We want to be hey, fantastic. You told us about that and we're really excited. you got a great solution there. Thank you very much. I want to see a shift to thank you very much. So that's my comments. I'm going to support this because I suspect you've done a really good job of figuring out what you need to do. But I do somewhat echo the concerns that trustee Fairchild. Thank you. Fair, Fairchild has come up with. Um, so I think that anyway, that's enough said. So um, Trustee Ratterman, are you, um, to summarize, are you asking for them to come back to us with uh, some sort of map or plan or? Um, I wasn't making a specific request. However, my suspicion would be that for things to work better, that might be a very good suggestion for you and you might want to do that on your own. I don't really wanna be the person who says to you, you have to do this. You figure out, and there might be an alternative that works better than that. I just wanted to share you with what my concerns were, and then you can decide how to react to that. I think that part of this is that you haven't set, seen yet the action plans that have been developed out of the strategic plan, and the Nothing. those things are those things are being developed right now. Um, but we had some parts that are moving faster than others, and this is one example where. We're starting to put things in place to get prepared for the next step. So um, I'm going to encourage that um, I'm going to encourage staff to get those action plans prepared so we can start to bring them to the board. And they can so, see the big picture. So my comment to that would be, I appreciate that. The tendency I've seen is that what's being brought to the board is a, I call it a red ribbon deal. It's a finalized version. We've looked through all the options. We've got what we want. Here's our perfect solution. As you're working on it, I would like to see some type of, hey, we're going to start working on the following. Okay, here's a progress report on this, what we're doing. Is there anything you want to do some input? That way, when we get a final product that does come in, the Red Ribbon deal, it's all ready to roll. We've been involved in the process all along, and we don't go take and pull the ribbon off and take the wrapping off the thing and say, hey, what's going on and screw it all up. So I think that it would be better if we can have that progression so that we, and it doesn't have to be a lot. There's little short reports, we're doing this, et cetera, or we would like some direction. We have three directions we can go. We're just like, you know, we think direction A is the best, but you know, we're here's B and C. Stuff like that will give us a great deal of confidence to know what's happening, how it's coming together, what the plan is. So that's my, if, if you dare ask another question, I'll answer it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, I'm being um, very aware of um, their doing their plans of what they're going to do because it's their plans for Dr. Kim. Um, these are not necessarily things that we would approve. You're asking for them to ask for our approval. Well, okay, so, you know, we've had many different styles of management and I try to always be tolerant of whatever the management style happens to be. But, uh, in the past, the more common practice was to do just what I said, to bring this information forward. So whether, and that's also why I didn't want to direct um, Dr. Stam to do anything. This is the superintendent's responsibility. Um, she has a style that she likes to work with. Um, I'm suggesting that a small modification to that to bring us into the loop, to keep us up to speed, keep us informed earlier would reduce the number of times we're getting surprised by something and saying, hey, what is this? Well, how come you're spending a bunch of money? I don't want us to have to do that. I want us to go be able to say, oh yeah, that's great. Fantastic, we've been hearing about that. Finally, come together, we're, we're really excited about what you're doing. That's what I'd like to see us do. You guys are really talented people and you've got really good ideas, but we just have to know what's coming down the pike. Otherwise, we're gonna be concerned particularly when there's a lot of money involved and we see a tremendous number of consultants, a tremendous number of outside external expenses. This is just my point of view. Let's see what the rest of the board thinks. Okay, thank you for your point of view. Uh, Trustee Canova. 
and because Andy and I have served on the board for so long, I think I think what I hear you saying is, I don't believe I hear you saying that you want to micromanage or have the board approve every little thing that that you're engaged in. But if you compared it to like uh, you hired a bunch of uh, contractors to to build your house, um, you're the kind of client who wants to see the the process. You want to you want to see the progress as that construction is going on. You don't want to simply pay the contractors and then have that red ribbon day to see the finished house when it's all done. You want to see the process en route to that finished product. Okay, I understand that. I think that's reasonable. Okay. Um, Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, I think for me um, is that I, it, it, everything kind of comes piecemeal and I, it's hard for, at least for me to see the bigger picture of how the pieces fit together. Um, and so there's no, like if I had a chart or something that showed the consultants we've hired and what they're doing and how that fits into the strategic plan, it would be a lot easier for me to not question every contract we get because it's not, I don't, like I said, I don't have a big picture. I, I, we get contracts for training a principal and we get contracts for PBL and we get, con so it's, there's no, overarching strategy that I'm going, oh, okay, that makes sense. I understand why we're doing that. So I think at, for, for me, and, and I think maybe not speaking for trustee Ratterman, but I, I think we share the same issue in that is if I had a better sense of where we're going, I, I, we wouldn't keep having this conversation where we pull contracts and what, why do you need $83,000 to do that? We just approved a contract at the last meeting for a consultant, seems like for the same thing for you know $100,000. So I, I think context here is what's lacking, um, at least in my estimation. And so I think we could avoid this if the board had a better understanding of where we're going. Um, at least that's how all these contracts fit how together. Fit? Yeah. yeah, how they all fit together and uh, how they fit together <laughs> and why we're spending the money and what what's the, what's the end goal of all of this. Um, I just I think a lot of the anxiety and the angst about approving these would be alleviated. I appreciate that all those comments and I think at the with the regard to the the strategic plan progress update, I think we can provide that. What I will say with regard to this contract in particular is that this is primarily in direct support of our three new schools and their instructional model, which is four square around a performance assessment and competency-based model. So this is to support them first and foremost, and then secondly, to support our schools that have invested heavily in PBL um, and then thirdly, to support the, what you might call the unpacking of the graduate portrait to actually bring it to life and have it make sense to people in terms of how does this connect to actually what students know and be able to do at different key grade levels from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. So if, if I could just break it down into three pieces, those are the three key pieces of this, of this, uh, this contract. And this firm is superb. I mean, I've, I've worked with them in multiple school districts um, and they're very teacher focused, teacher driven. Um, what they do makes sense. They've got a load of different examples. In fact, there's multiple links on their scope of work that you can, including videos, where you can see the results of how it really can transform students' life to really own their learning and demonstrate it to their peers and, and to authentic audiences as well is the direction that we're going, similar to CTE. I mean, what you see in CTE. We have a very cute video about a fifth grader showing, proving the work that she's learned. Um, and I thought it was just interesting to see how they were using the idea of how do you show that you've learned something? Said that that, that was one way, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, okay, thank you for that explanation. And that maybe that describes why we keep pulling these things and having discussions and then approving them. It's like seeing the bigger picture um, is, is partly what's, what's missing. And so maybe we can 
work on that a bit more as we go forward. So um, is there a motion to approve? Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Lieberman. Is there any other uh, comments or discussion? So we'll take a vote on this. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And uh, no, I think I see that aside. Okay, so, and any opposed? No. Okay, so um, that passes five to one with um, C. Fairchild, no, and Dr. Ryan, Trustee Ryan is uh, absent. Okay. Yeah. Wanna... Oh, it is time. Um, so we need to extend the meeting because it's almost 1030, our magic hour. And um, we have two more items on consent to get through, plus our action items, plus our information items, and a discussion item. So um, I would say midnight, and we will move quickly. Well moved, Fairchild. Second. OK. So that's a motion by Trustee Fairchild and a second by Trustee Lieberman to continue uh, to extend till midnight. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all those opposed? OK, so sorry, that passes five to one with Trustee Canova against, Trustee Ryan absent. Uh, okay, so now we can move back up and continue. We, um, okay, so we finished uh, L.18. The next one is L.31. President, is... your head, I would like to ask that this item be tabled, please. Okay. So the superintendent has asked for this to be tabled. So we will um, bring it back at uh, a future meeting. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, then the next item is L.32. Um, L.32, which is the amendment to the 2021-2022 uh, consulting contract with Glenn Ishiwata for principal coaching services. Mr. Approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Second, Roderick. Okay, by uh, motion by Trustee Gonzalez, second by Trustee Ratterman, and um, Trustee Fairchild, you wanted to. So um, I pulled this contract because it contained no scope of work, it's, and it didn't have a daily rate. It so, just says 20000 Yeah, so this is actually an amendment to an existing contract, so this particular uh, consultant um, mentors three principles we've added a fourth principle to the um to the caseload basically for um mr ishiwata and um the scope of work was in the first contract uh we're using these new templates and i think that that's where the problem was it also wasn't clear what the increase is in his contract it was an increase of five thousand dollars for a total of twenty thousand dollars so he's currently earning 15 from us for three principles. We have another principle that uh, we provide, as the board knows, we provide two years of coaching from a retired uh, successful administrator for our principles. And this particular principle is in the second year, had turned down coaching for the second year, but we are seeing that coaching is needed now. And so we've added this, this back in there. So I know we need to make some, make some adjustments in the way that we're writing our cover memos because it was unclear in the cover memo that it was a $5,000 increase to an existing contract to add one more principle to this person's uh, scope of work. And we also need to make sure we're using the right template for the amendment to the contract. Now, generally with all of our principal mentors, the, um, we don't have like the number of hours they're gonna do because they're available 24 seven for our principals. And we talked about this at a previous board meeting um, last, last fall. So can I explain what my concern was? Yes. We had a, and I have no issue with principal coaching. I think that's wonderful. My issue was we had a contract said $20,000. There was, I would expect the, if it's an amendment, the original contract would be up there. I didn't know if it was additional 20,000. I didn't know. No, there was, yeah. there was nothing 
to on here that would make me feel comfortable approving it, even though it's only twenty thousand, because there was just there was nothing. Now, as I, as I read it, uh, Trustee Fairchild, I can see the confusion there because it is unclear in the contract, and I'm going to take ownership for not having reviewed this before it got posted, um, and we'll make sure that um, that uh, Dr. Gonzalez and Mr. Shiel and I work more closely together to make sure that these are clear. Uh, that the amendment was a five thousand dollar increase to an existing contract, and that you you include the existing contract, so yes. we even know. It yeah, was, exactly. It just said. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was uh, they used the, well because we transitioned also contracts from earlier this year, so we prepared a new contract, and the amendment should have it just was not clear, but it's just a five thousand dollar increase to an existing contract. Can the board still be sent the existing contract and the amended this so it's clear? Yeah, we can, um, or the, we are, you're just approving the increase of an existing contract by $5,000. So, yeah, but can we still be sent the correct forms? Yes, you can be sent the correct forms if the board so chooses, if it's the desire of the board for this. I would feel more comfortable approving a contract knowing that I will be sent the correct forms of what I'm apparently expected to approve. Why don't we go and pull right now, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, can you pull the original contract where we approved the scope of work and shared with the board what date that that was brought to the board because it's still available online? If you'll look that up, please. Yes, let me do that. So before you spend a lot of effort on it, if you'd let me speak just a moment. This contract doesn't work at all in the print in the context of the contract you've got the complete understanding modification. This agreement together all attachments here to constitutes a full and complete understanding of the agreement and the parties related to the subject, therefore supersedes all prior or contemporaneous understandings of the agreements related to such subject matter. In other words, this contract is superseding your prior agreement it's not amending it it's completely replacing it and only the items in this contract are the ones that apply. So this is the area where our contract issues, we need to, I know we're doing a lot of work in that, but we need to get the right contract in here. This one doesn't work. Now we might get away with it um, because there might not ever be a legal action related to it, but this contract as it sits right now completely supersedes the prior and leaves you with no scope of work and no, no information on it. All right, let me see whether Mr. Shield is in the audience. He is uh, texted him to see whether he would raise his hand. We can move him over. There he is. Yeah. <clears throat> so part of, part of the issue here is that we have new contracts where some contracts were in process while making the migration to the new contracts. Um, and we're still um, training individuals on how to use the new contracts. Um, so this is actually the old contract document and staff had already been working on inputting the new contract or had already entered into this contract with the vendor. Um, and so we're what we have here is a little bit of a transition period. And I'm sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. But um, we started, um, there was a little bit of a transition period here between what we had at the last board meeting in regards to our new contract processes and some of our contracts were already in process before this change. And so, um, and, and as you know, in one of the issues with our old contracts was not a clear way to go ahead and do a modification to an existing contract. And so um, I understand the concerns here, the new contract process will actually clean a lot of this up because of the review processes that are already in place with that as well. And so I don't disagree that, and I mentioned that you're working on fixing some of the contracts, contract language, and I understand some of those. There, this is a resolvable issue with this contract. What you have to do is take all of the information from the prior one, incorporate it into this, then this becomes the full and complete record. And then this new contract then has all the provisions from the old one. So it may be possible, depending on what the old one looks like, to take the addendum and the scope of work, et cetera, from that contract, add it to this one and make sure that it's specifically included so that when this document is signed, all of the prior information that you're relying on is also in this new document because the way this is stated, this new document replaces the old one. And so if you've got the data in it, then it's no problem, but you can't rely on, if you sign this one, you have no legal right to enforce anything in the prior contract. 
Trustee Radman, tell me where it says that this one supersedes the previous one. I'm not seeing that. Sure. Can you just yeah, point it out to me? Yeah, let me get it to you. It's modifications. Uh, I got out of that area. It's it's section 13 that he's referring to where it refers to this agreement being Contract. together with all other attachments. It's 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 section number 13 on the bottom of page four. Bottom of page four. So, uh, Mr. Shield, so we're looking at the contract that was approved by the board on August the 12th, 2021. And I'm looking at the contract and comparing them side by side. The only difference is that uh, on page six of six, the term of the contract is the same. The description of services is exactly the same, except it says four principles instead of three principles. The payment of services is exactly the same, except that it now instead of 15,000, it says 20,000. Nothing else in the old contract or in the new contract has changed here. All the language is the same. This is why we were transitioning over, over our contracts because so he's using the old template with just the added three to four and 15 to 20. So Trustee Rotterman, this actually would um, indicate a, uh, it is replacing the previous contract. Yeah, and in that case, the original concern that Trustee Fairchild brought up about scope of work applies because the response to her question was, well, that's in the original contract. So it wasn't in the original contract. So the, uh, when we brought these to the board, we brought a series of them to the board in August. And the question came up uh, in August regarding the principal mentors and why we don't have a scope of work, meaning uh, they meet once a week, once a month, whatever. We, we explained to the board at that time in August that our mentors for our principals are available 24 seven to our principals. They set up regular meetings with our principals over the course of the year Sometimes they meet twice a month in person. Sometimes they meet virtually, but they're available to support our principals around some targeted focus areas that we have outlined with our coaches that we want our principals to focus on and get support. So you can't do a scope of work and say they do X number of hours. You're giving them sort of a, a, a higher, higher order um, direct, uh, directive or uh, project that they're working on that is focused on supporting and helping our principals to improve. This particular coach has been very successful with our principals that we've assigned him to. And, um, and so we, you know, would like to add this third person to the, to the fourth person, excuse me, the fourth person to the contract. So this principal can get the needed support that's, um, that's required to be successful. Okay. I'd like to um, take a vote. Do you have a quick comment? Yeah. Then we'll vote. Okay. Thank you, President Earhead. I just have a quick question for Mr. Scheel. Um, given that this is an amendment to an existing contract, is there a reason why the whole contract was restated and an amendment number one wasn't drafted just to make it clear that nothing was changing? Because under section 13, it says that the agreement together with all attachments. So to me, if it was just amendment number one, it would be one entire agreement, just amending Appendix A. Um, but the whole agreement was restated, but it wasn't, there's no indication that this is an amended and restated independent contractor agreement. So I'm just, I'm trying to understand kind of the, the steps or that are involved when a contract is being amended, because um, it's, it, we're not making it clear. In the in the original contract process, so this goes back to we we started out with the old contract process. In the old contract process, we did not have a clear way of amending the contract. In the new contract process, we do, but that would have mixed using old documents and new documents. So we stuck with the old documents through this process since the original contract with Mr. Ishiwata uh, was using the old contract documents. So it sounds like we'll have the newer system on the- The newer right. system will clean this process up. Okay, so I'd like to call for a vote. This is uh, item L.32. We have a motion by Trustee Gonzalez, a second by Trustee Ratterman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that passes seven to zero.
Okay, and we are moving on to our action items. The first one is M.1, resolution number 21-41, SCOSD proclaiming a local emergency, ratifying the pro proclamation of a state of emergency by Governor Newsom dated March 4th, 2020, and authorizing remote teleconferencing meeting for the period November 18th, 2021 through December 17th, 2021. And um, just to give a little background, we had this on a previous agenda, we discussed it um, and um, we decided not to pass it. But the question came up, um, it was could uh, Dr. Kemp and I talk with legal counsel if there was a way to have this um, uh, resolution come back where it limits the reasons for a trustee's absence to COVID related issues. And um, so we did uh, ask legal counsel who said we could not limit this resolution. We couldn't put anything in specifying uh, you know, a medical reason for the trustee's absence. So I put this in here so that we could, I could share that information with all of you. Um, I am not recommending that we pass this resolution. It's the same resolution as before. Um, we had, um, you know, we did discuss it last time. So I just wanted to share um, that additional information that I did follow up with legal counsel about it and um, who felt that we could not um, limit the use of it to just COVID related illnesses. Are there um, any questions? Move to approve. No, I don't want to approve. Yeah, but he can move to approve. Oh, you could still, sorry. I'll, I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> no, you cannot. No. Sorry, okay. So there's a motion from uh, Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Ryan. Okay, so do we have a uh, discussion on this item? Jody? Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, Trustee Fairchild. So when we talked about this resolution in September, we concluded that we did not have an imminent threat from COVID or public violence that would qualify us to use this option. Our county COVID numbers are still low. And we have yet to have issues with in-person public participation, as you all can see. I asked for a request, on November 1st, I submitted a request that if we were considering that we receive a legal opinion stating that it was okay, and we haven't gotten that because I believe it's, we don't qualify. I also talked with our CSBA consultant about this and where it was used in other districts. And she indicated that it was used in districts where they were having issues with in-person public participation and actual threats of violence or in areas where they had really high COVID numbers, none of which apply to us. I recommend that we do not pass this resolution. Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee Ratterman. So the last time I voted to have the remote meetings, this time I'm not inclined to do that. We made a decision. I'm going to stay with the decision, even though it wasn't the one I wanted to do. But I do have a question relative to, there have been places where violence has erupted related to a lot of issues, a lot of the current issues out there. And then violence has been geared towards boards and it puts all the personnel, everybody at risk. So should that happen, the question I have is, is there a way we can implement this resolution quickly so that we can then go ahead and take preventative measures? I'm perfectly happy continuing to meet in person and do what we're doing now, but should we suddenly have an angry mob out here, um, that might not be the case. I might feel much less comfortable with the fact that we're both for the mob's sake as well as our employees' sake. But do we have a mechanism to put this in place in an emergency? Should we need to? Um, so as part of our um, protocols, that uh, our security protocols that we've um, set up uh, includes if we had uh, a situation like that, that we can, um, we can either end the meeting right then or we can go to remote meetings. So that's already built in. That addresses my concern, thank you. Okay, and I and I um, could also add that at our county school board association meeting that we had yesterday, this topic came up, and um, it came up that nobody has in the county has passed this resolution um, except for the county board. So they're the only ones who've just, 
who have decided that they need it. Yes, uh, Trustee Canova. And if I'm reading it correctly, I mean, even if you were to adopt this, it looks like the uh, end date is December 17th. Yes, it has to be done every month. We're all, it's the, the way this was set up, you have to do it monthly, or it can only last for 30 days or a month. Well, since you've um, pointed to the safety provisions we already have, then um, I, I would be disinclined to support this. Okay, um, Trustee Gonzalez. Uh, I'm aware of a one board. I, I don't remember if it was Gatos, but there was somebody that was a board that they, uh, was having some public issue and they basically, uh, somebody who was compromised and could not get the vaccine, but, uh, but they wouldn't state his home address basically uh, passed a resolution in that case. I'm looking at it more from a perspective as if, if somebody were to get COVID, and I could tell you that I'm vaccinated and I had COVID in August, it's not, you don't want to come to the boardroom. You might still want to participate. And uh, in that, that instance, uh, um, you know, it might be where you're within uh, the 72 hour notice or, or whatever that you cannot have the post, you know, meeting posted, even if you want to give out your home address, which you might might not want to do. So I was looking at it more from a perspective that we can pass this and uh, if needed, I don't think anybody's going to use it, but uh, be able to utilize it if, if, uh, if that was the case. I think uh, every one of your voices is important and I think that it's, uh, that's, that's the only reason why uh, I, I plan to move to approve. Um, Trustee Ryan. Yeah. Um, I, well, clearly some, some agencies are finding reasons to pass it. I think the Santa Clara City Council is still meeting remotely. Um, but I think this came up as we were discussing, uh, maybe it was the governance retreat or some other meeting where if I, if I'll use myself as an example, if someone in my household tested positive for COVID this past Monday, there would not be time for me to even participate remote, like to turn in the, my teleconferencing information in time, even if I was willing to have my house listed on the agenda, which uh, I don't know that I would want that. Um, there wouldn't be enough time to post that because we would be within the 72 hours. So I would not be able to participate because there wasn't, there wouldn't be enough time. We couldn't pass the resolution in time to the point of should an angry mob show up, you can't pass the resolution that night if it's not on the agenda. So you have to have the, you have to have the resolution passed already before you can move to that. So you'd have to have yet another meeting. If let's say we showed up and there was the angry mob, now we want this resolution. Well, we're gonna to have to meet in person to pass that resolution to be able to go back to remote meetings. So I think as a safety measure to have it done, I don't anticipate, you know, uh, using it in any other way, but it has to be done in advance. You can't do it last minute. And so to ensure that anyone doesn't feel torn between wanting to be here and then, but wanting also to keep people safe, um, I, I think we need to have it taken care of. And it's every 30 days. I don't anticipate people using it um, uh, for purposes that it shouldn't be used, but it doesn't even mean that you have COVID. It could mean someone in your household and that you should not be going anywhere. Um, and, and we have, but we have to have this in place beforehand because um, it, there's not enough time if it happens the week of. Okay, thank you. I wanna respond about the angry mob. That's a whole different situation than COVID because there's already mechanisms if there's an angry mob type of situation or disruptions to board meetings that there's already legislation about um, being able to, meet in a, you know, in a safe location. Um, so we don't need to concern uh, with that situation. Um, it would just be the, the COVID. I could be it, concerned about me, it. It would so, just be the COVID situation it, that we would um, need don't to. don't think we're just a moment. Discussion. Uh, Trustee Ryan. So Trustee Canova, you're next. Just kind of going to say, you know, we've seen it in industry now where they're going to these hybrid work models where, you know, they go into the office and then uh, quite a bit of work is still done, you know, in the virtual way. They're doing both things. And when I'm thinking about um, the, what we have, this archaic, the thing that we have is so archaic that, that if you, you're in the olden days, you would call in from your hotel on, on vacation um, and hang a little thing outside your hotel, hotel room saying that this is a public meeting. 
uh, we do need to, coming off COVID, this is something Sacramento is going to need to do to make some adjustments, but we need more flexibility. But for example, I think there's a lot of staff that shouldn't have to physically be here with us till midnight. I, I would prefer that they would be with us virtually because this is just a, a really horrible thing to do to staff to have them sit with us until midnight. Uh, for board meetings, when we have our retreats, our governance retreats, I would, we don't need to come into a space together for a governance retreat. We can do that virtually. You know, um, I, I don't want to do governance retreats together. I, I would rather join because they can go long. They can be very long hours. It's a Saturday or it's a weekend. I think that I, I would hope that the Sacramento could give some flexibility to um, school districts and other local government to be able to utilize virtual meetings um, in a more free way. Because, uh, and, and like I say, at a minimum, at a minimum, and I've said it's, you know, since we've gotten back together again, uh, we should be able to allow staff to be able to join us for these very long board meetings virtually. They shouldn't have to be sitting with us in this room until midnight. Okay, Trustee Kirchhoff. When we talked about this resolution in this, this September and with the advice of legal counsel, we concluded that we did not have an imminent threat from COVID or public violence that would qualify us to use this option. Staff obviously does not have the same rules as we do. If um, Dr. Kemp wanted to allow, allow them to participate remotely, staff doesn't have the same rules as an elected official. They don't have to notice anyone if they participate from remotely. However, I think considering and what the comments, I want to remind people the comments we got at our last board meeting um, and, and comments I got afterwards from staff who are teaching every day, who are coming into work every day and couldn't believe that we were considering using this resolution that says we have, and it says imminent threat. It's very clear. Um, we could not get a lawyer to write that we could use this. They refused to write, I assume, because I asked, I said, if this is gonna be considered, I want a lawyer, one of our lawyers, to say that it's okay. There is nothing attached to the agenda. If the situation changes, we will go there, but right now, we do not have an imminent threat from COVID or public violence. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez with a second by Trustee Ryan. Um, so let's take a vote on this and I'm gonna do a roll call so it's very clear. Uh, Trustee Canova? Trustee Fairchild? No. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? No. Uh, Trustee Ratterman? No. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And um, I say no. Uh, so that um, fails. I one, two, that just you'll... a moment. One, two, three, four, five to two with um, trustees um, Gonzalez. Oh, sorry, it fails five to two with Gonzalez, Trustee Gonzalez and Trustee Ryan's uh, saying yes. Um, Trustee Ryan, did you have? I just want to confirm that board members will not come if they have to a meeting in person. Then, if anyone in their household is right, we all we we did talk about that last time. Remember, and we right. and we made that commitment that um, we. I, I don't remember hearing that commitment from every board member, and I do know a previous board member picked up something from another board member, and his whole family got pneumonia. So I'm a little concerned about it. I don't know of that situation in my time on the board, yeah, but was, okay. Yeah. Um, but I asked last time if we all had a commitment to stay home if we were sick or exposed to being sick. sick. Not just okay, sick. or being exposed to being sick. Can I have a thumbs up from everyone that they're committed to keeping everyone safe? Happy to stay home if I have COVID or anyone else in my family has COVID. Trustee. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we have uh, we have that commitment. Um, 
So now we are moving on to item M.2, second reading of policy update of BB 9322, um, which is. Um, Can I point out a typo? Of course. I'm just noticing at the bottom of page one. There's a word missing. So the sentence should read um, at the very end, it says, if any comma at least 10 days before the scheduled meeting date. Oh yeah, that was the, okay. That was the one I was yes. gonna mention was it, it says that um, any board member or member of the public may request that a matter within the jurisdiction of the board be placed on the agenda of a regular meeting the request shall be submitted in writing to the superintendent or designee with supporting documents and information, if any, at least 10 days before the scheduled meeting date um, and not at exactly 10 days. Um, superintendent, I thought, uh, Dr. Kemp, I thought that it was that, um, no, okay, at least 10 days, that, that was the change, okay. Um, and I, and just FYI, I pulled this off from the other ones because these, this um, policy had uh, district specific language versus the other ones, which were all just CSBA changes. And so going forward, you'll see that where ones with district changes will be a separate action item from the CSBA standard. Um, Trustee Fairchild, do you have a comment? Yes, I wanted to thank uh, trustees um, Gonzalez and Lieberman for cleaning this up. I think you've done a great job. I did ask a question, and since we got our questions and answers so late this time, um, one of the points that has gone back and forth is, does the 10-day agenda item request apply to the board president? We've had a couple of times where that's come up as a board. The answer was the policy of, applies to all trustees. However, since the agenda is set by the board president in consultation with superintendent, adjustments, it may include adjustments to the agenda within the 10 day window as the need arises. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would like to um, mention that I would like to see in this policy that occurred to me today when we got this is it's very helpful if the board receives our answers to our questions before the meeting, uh, like the day before. I think as a board, and even if, if there's not an answer, like say Wednesday at five, then the, it, the answer could be, this will be answered at the board meeting. But it's very difficult if we are getting the answers to our questions as we're walking in the door to the board meeting. So it would be helpful for me as a board member to get the answers at least by a certain time the day before. I don't know if that could be. And again, if the answer is not ready, then it can be answered at the board meeting, but at least what is completed by a certain time should be sent out. Does that make sense? Sure, Dr. Kemp, um, since that's to be your responsibility. It is generally our practice to get them to the board on Wednesday, but as you know, I've been um, short staff and, and some other things took party and I had to ask some clarifying questions before I could post it, but we do make every effort to get them to the board um, at the latest by Thursday, by Thursday at noon, um, but preferably Wednesday afternoon. Thank you for your patience and understanding as we're transitioning executive support in my office. Trustee Ratterman. Because of the late hour, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there's some suggestions that I've wanted to make to this. Right now, I believe we have responsible individuals. And so this is not a comment about any individuals, but a policy should be independent of the individuals that work in there. And so one of the clauses in here that's always bothered me a bit is that the board president and superintendent can decide whether or not something is uh, whether or not something is, so a public person of the public asks for an agenda item, they can decide whether or not that meets the jurisdiction of the board. So done responsibly, that's not a problem. However, it could also be a tool that's used to keep things that they don't wanna see off the agenda. So I would love to see something in here about the fact that any, any items rejected similarly to that, there's a report of the rejection of the request and the rejection that is given to the rest of the board. And then, 
it's it, actually it in the double check it's in there it's on page two it's in the first so it's the second paragraph it says if the board president superintendent deny a request from a board member to place an item on the agenda the board member may request the board to take action to determine whether the item shall be placed on the agenda i appreciate it. that's a board member i'm talking about an item from the a member from the public a member of the public has a right to put something on the board agenda so you're saying if so you uh, if a member it. of the public wants to ask to put something on the agenda the board president denies it you want the rest of the board to know about it or just change that paragraph that the sentence i just said if a member if a member of the board or public doesn't do it then it can be brought to the board as a whole i don't think it works well for that so the other way to do it is do a report back to the board if we see something in there we think that's an abuse we can then suddenly take we put the thing before it and then it can come back to the full board so it's just a matter of having a check a balance a check and balance on the on the process mm -hmm. um yeah i have concerns about having the person from the public come in and pitch it because if it's really something that's not our purview then i don't even want to take i i would think the board president would not the board want should know time, yeah. but the board should know the board the board could um very well yeah, um, be told about it so um so should we i i'm not wordsmithing in a meeting at um well should we send it back to policy committee yes please so um i would say we're we won't approve it tonight we'll send it back to board policy committee and, and come back to it I have, so i still have the time i i have a couple other issues i'm not going to bring them up tonight policy committee can call me and or whatever you do with it okay um really quick if you have other co comments about this if you could send them to the superintendent and she can get them to the policy committee. My best attempt to do yeah, okay, Trustee Fairchild. Uh, I just wanna point out that we have had members of the public speak during a request for items on the agenda. We had our um, union presidents request specific items for the agenda. So that has been done. But it gets, it usually gets approved, you're saying? Well, approved. yeah, but I'm saying members of the public have requested items during oh, absolutely. that time. Yeah, absolutely. My hand is raised. Oh, okay. Trustee Ryan. So, <laughs> well, Sorry. you did. I did. So, so in my nine years on the board, it has happened where members of the public have begged for items to be on the agenda. They did not, they, they did, couldn't come to ask in person. And so I submitted the request. They submitted requests to the board president. It never got on the agenda. And the board never knew other than me who would help encourage them to email the board president and the superintendent. This is not current, anyone currently board president or superintendent, but it didn't get on the agenda. And, and the rest of the board never knew that it was even a request. So yes, I think if there are members of the public who have submitted requests, they don't need to come here in person and ask for it. They can submit mm -hmm. it by email. Mm -hmm. If it's denied and not put on, the board needs to know that that was not, that there was a request and it was denied. So, so I'd like to strongly re recommend it's 11 o'clock. We have some very major items that have to get through. Can we bring this back at another time? Yep, absolutely. So we will move it back to policy. Okay, and um, then we didn't even get a motion, so we can just move on. Thank you. Okay, next item is M.5, Santa Clara County Committee on School District Organization for the District 1. What, sorry? Oh, are we on item three? Okay, sorry, M.3. Santa Clara County Committee on School District Organization for the District 1, 3, and 5 seats election. This is uh, an election that um, I have the vote from our district to make. So I am asking for the board's um, thoughts on how I should vote. Make it. And um, I um, would um, like to ask Trustee Gonzalez to go first because he's uh, knowledgeable about this group. Yeah, so Madam President, um, I would uh, make a motion to, uh, to vote for in District 1, Denise Ramon Herrera. She is currently serving on the county committee and school district organization and she's done a good job she was the past uh, chair of that committee uh, last year um the district committee i'm not sure why he's on an opposed uh, he's unopposed. opposed is basically uh should already be uh 
I mean, he's, he's, he, we can vote for him, I guess, but he's, he's already gonna take that slot. And for District 5, Ellen Wheeler, who is a sitting board member out in Mountain View, Wisman, has done a great job and uh, brings a great perspective as well. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee um, Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Fairchild to um, recommend Denise Ramon Herrera in District 1, Jim Van Furness in District 3, and Ellen Wheeler in District 5. Do you have any comments or questions? Okay, then uh, we can go ahead and take a vote on this. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all, any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Moving right along. Uh, the next item is M.4, uh, CSBA delegate nomination, Region 20. Um, I am currently a delegate and I am asking for a I nomination. To approve Jody Muirhead as delegate. Second, Fairchild. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions? I will do a good job, I promise. Okay, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to human resources. Uh, N.1, ratification of the appointment of the executive assistant to the superintendent and board of education. And um, uh, we are not ready to consider this position. So we are skipping this item. Uh, next one is N.2, ratification of the appointment of the manager information systems. Uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Gonzalez. Move to approve. Second, Gonzalez. Good evening, board members. Um, it is my pleasure to announce uh, Tracy Bond as our manager of information systems in the IT department. Tracy received her BS in political science from Sonoma State and her master's in management organization development from JFK University. Tracy is coming to Santa Clara Unified School District from Campbell Union High School District, where she has been the technology project manager. Prior to working for Campbell, she was the IT director for Los Gatos Saratoga Union High School District for two years and was the chief technology officer for Dublin Unified School District for four years. Some of her professional experience included an oversight of 69 million uh, bond projects for IT components for facilities departments, uh, creating scopes uh, files for QSS, work with architects, site supervisors, and construction subcontractors to ensure all IT standards are followed for retrofit and new buildings. She introduced progressive PD model, including remote meeting structures well before COVID-19, created opportunity for teachers and staff to explore video creation and lesson plan delivery as a one uh, EdTech goal for two years in a row, implemented a 2 million technology bond project with RFQ design and oversight, and created an IT re uh, refresh plan optimizing ref refreshment and new equipment and successfully manage print services solutions with realized cost savings and better support for staff in partnerships with the CBO. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was just mesmerized by all that you had to say about her. Um, so we have a motion um, from Trustee Fairchild and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any other comments or questions? Then we'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Great, that passes seven to zero. Next one is the um, N.3, ratification of the appointment of the interim vice principal for Bookser Middle School. Motion to approve, Rodderman. And I'm happy to introduce Danielle Ash. Uh, Danielle received her Bachelor of Science in Liberal Studies from California State University in Sacramento. Her teaching credential from San Jose State and her master's from National University. In 2009, Danielle started working for Santa Clara as a cert certificated substitute teacher. In 2011, she was hired as a permanent certificated teacher at Peterson Middle School, where she's currently a sixth grade teacher. Danielle has held a, uh, many leadership roles while teaching at Peterson. Some of those roles are uh, being an English department chair, the Peterson Steering Committee, School Site Council, English Writing a PBA Committee, Induction Mentor, Support Provider, Gains Advisor, and Grading for Equity. Her experience in administration began in 2020 when she was selected as the Vice Principal for the Middle School Summer School Program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Then all those, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman, second by Trustee Gonzalez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? 
Okay, that passes seven to zero. Thank you. Um, next item, O.1, resolution number 21-45, Santa Clara USD 2022, refunding lease purchase, forward delivery. And I don't see Mr. Scheel or, um, oh, there he is. Yeah, they're all Mo second, Fairchild. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez, a second from Trustee Fairchild. Um, due to the late hour, Mr. Scheel, I hope you can make this brief. Is there a presentation that you need to give us? There is no presentation that I need to give you other than just to remind the trustees that this is in regards to a presentation you've seen previously about the refunding of the 2013 COPS that um, were issued to um, refund uh, previous debt issued for the Santa Clara Tax or uh, Teachers Housing Foundation. Uh, Ms. Ranieri is here and uh, available for any questions if there are any, uh, but the, uh, approving this resolution will allow us to proceed with this debt refunding. You did, you did a really good job last time. Uh, we're feeling really good about it. Okay, then um, we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez, a second by Trustee Fairchild. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes seven to zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Shiel. Okay, we're up to um, item P.1, uh, opening grade span and annual grade level addition through 2025-26 for McDonald High School. And um, Dr. Kemp, am I right to understand? I think I recall you saying that we were gonna take this one and the next one together, but have two separate motions, but you're gonna to present together? Yes, we could do that. Okay, so this is also going to be the presentation for P.2, grandfathering rule for McDonald High School, since they're kind of um, related. So I will turn it over to Dr. Kemp and our principal, Dr. Good evening, Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Ron Lay, and for and Matt Baldwin for being here this evening. So um, we had a presentation to the board of maybe two months ago regarding the uh, plan for McDonald High School. Uh, as we were going in and researching the, um, the board's action that was taken in 2018 regarding the opening grade spans for our schools, we realized that the board had not taken action on the opening grade span for the high school. So as a reminder, the elementary school uh, opened with multiple grades, it was K3, uh, K2, K3, I can't even remember. Uh, the middle school, one grade, just sixth grade for the first year. And so tonight we're, we're bringing uh, information to you with our recommendation to open the high school with just one grade to allow us to um, properly set the culture and the foundation for this school for years to come. And Dr. Ronley, it's over to you now. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Dr. Kemp. Last time I was here, I had the opportunity to provide updates about McDonald High School and specifically to share about the vision for teaching and learning, as well as overall details about the design for the school. Since the last time I was here, I've had the opportunity to have discussions with our cabinet about the various factors impacting our opening grade span recommendation. Um, we've reached an agreement about this, and we would like to recommend that McDonald High School open for the ninth grade only for the 2022-2023 school year. Next slide, please. Outlined in the slide are the various advantages of opening for the ninth grade only. First and foremost, we believe that by opening with the ninth grade only, we will be able to develop a very positive climate and culture and really ensure a smooth transition for each and every student coming to McDonald High School. Um, we are really wanting our eighth graders to have a very strong and um, smooth transition to the ninth grade. We know that it's a huge milestone in a young person's life to begin high school, and we really want to do this right. We also really wanna have a vibrant climate and culture um, and we want McDonald High School to just be an amazing place for kids and families, as well as our staff. We also feel that we will be able to meet the individual needs of our staff who are joining us um, in the coming months. We feel that if we open with ninth grade only, we will be able to really personalize the support that we're gonna be providing our staff. Um, and we have plans to provide personalized coaching for teachers to ensure that our K-12 instructional framework is implemented successfully. 
The other thing that we are really interested in, in doing is making sure that every student is known very well. And we believe that if we start with the ninth grade only, we can do exactly that. We will be able to meet the individual needs of every child that comes to us. Next slide, please. In opening with the ninth grade, we can assure our board that we will provide A through G coursework um, starting in the ninth grade. And we will ensure that our students make timely progress towards A through G eligibility for CSU and UC admissions. We will ensure that all levels of courses that students need are provided for A through G eligibility and progression towards that, including any level of math our students need, as well as honors level coursework. And an additional, additional online options can be made available to extend the offerings that we're able to provide our ninth grade students. We will also be implementing inclusive models for students with IEPs and 504 plans, and we will be providing embedded supports for students who are emergent bilinguals and who are struggling readers. With regards to our athletics program, we are, are really excited about kicking off our Condor athletics. We plan to start with freshman level athletics and support a gradual build out of our program. In doing this, our freshmen will benefit from playing time um, and more playing time than they typically would. Additionally, more of our athletes will have the ability to um, go through tryouts and a greater number of students will be able to play, which we know will lead to their ability to compete at, at greater levels um, as they move on through the grades. McDonald High School has been accepted to the Santa Clara Valley Athletic League. We've applied for membership to the Central Coast Section and the California Interscholastic Federation. And we're excited to compete at every level, at the league level, the section level, and the state level. For these reasons stated here, um, we would like to make the recommendation to open with ninth grade only. Thank you for considering this recommendation. I'd also like to invite um, Dr. Gary Hochlander, president of ConnectEd, uh, to offer some national perspective on opening of high schools um, and the merits of a ninth grade only opening as well. Sure. Good evening, board members, Dr. Kemp, um, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Stam. Um, I would echo everything that has been said so far and would add this. Um, what really excites us about being able to partner with you as a district, with McDonald, and eventually, I think, uh, Wilcox and Santa Clara, uh, is the opportunity uh, to create a high school that offers students comprehensive pathways, college and career pathways uh, that integrate career and technical education with challenging college preparatory academics, emphasizing much more uh, real world application in the core academics, uh, performance assessment, project-based learning. That's a heavy lift. Um, we have worked with dozens of districts in California over the years. We're now working in 10 states around the country. This is hard work uh, and it, it's really important. And you have a wonderful opportunity here uh, to take the time to really design um, a high quality, comprehensive ninth grade that looks ahead to what's happening in grades 10, 11, and 12, and provides those students with the foundation that they need to successfully pursue uh, a comprehensive college and career pathway uh, in a range of industry sectors uh, at McDonald. So, um, I can say unequivocally uh, in almost all of the schools with which we've worked over the years, when they have the opportunity uh, to implement incrementally uh, and begin with a ninth grade, that's what they choose to do. They don't always have that choice. I mean, there, there are times when it's simply not possible to do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to do that, I would strongly urge you to do so. Be happy to answer any additional questions, but uh, uh, very much looking forward to working with you, uh, with the staff at McDonald to really make McDonald uh, a transformative um, high school uh, and one that, that can also serve, I think, as 
a, a demonstration for what can be done throughout the district as we work with you uh, to plan this through systemically. So thanks very much for letting me be with you tonight. And I will look forward to uh, being able to uh, talk and work with you in the future. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Dr. Runley, were you gonna go right into the other presentation or would you like us to give you comments uh, on this first part? Whichever you prefer. I would like us to do one at a time. One at a time. One affects the other. Yeah, th I think it will, the, this will affect the other one. So that's why I was trying to keep them together, but we'll do questions. I saw Dr, uh, sorry, Trustee Gonzalez, and then Trustee Ryderman. I think, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think it definitely highlights uh, what we probably should be uh, moving forward with. Um, so I'll make a motion to open up uh, McDonald High School with ninth grade only. Okay, do we have a second for that motion? Okay, a motion by Trustee Gonzalez and a second by Trustee Canova uh, to open ninth grade only. Um, was that it, Trustee Gonzalez? Okay, um, Trustee Ratterman. Yeah, I appreciate, I mean, a lot of work's going on. It's obvious of that. Um, the presentation showed us a lot of the benefits of doing the ninth grade. Didn't talk about any of the deficits. It didn't talk about any of the advantages of doing a nine ten. I don't think anything past 10. So the, the comments I've heard from the street, a lot of it on the pro a nine ten opening. Personally, I'm ambivalent. I don't care that we open ninth or ninth tenth. What I do care about is making sure that we can consider our constituents' concerns and our students' concerns and make sure that we give them the best possible package. We have an expert, and thank you very much for participating, that's suggesting the ninth grade. But I do wanna know a little bit more about how this affects some of the extracurricular activities like band. You've talked briefly about um, athletics. Of course, one of the downsides is you don't have mentorship. You don't have other older uh, people to help. A theater, whether theater's possible, um, and there's a variety of other electives that may be difficult. Like for instance, I've already had one parent complain that, hey, they wanted to, their, their child has been doing Japanese and they wanna continue Japanese, but it won't be offered there. Because we have the problem with the comprehensive high schools currently. Also, our voters have been very anxious for this school to open. They worked very hard. A lot of them worked very hard with the idea their kids would get to go to this school. And so now it's become a lot of them, it's no longer an option because of the way things are unfolding. So if you open with a single grade, um, that's versus two grades, that, that narrows the options even further. Um, I, what I would love to see us do, and maybe you've done it, is a survey of all um, existing ninth graders and existing eighth graders, their families, with a survey that's not coercive, that's, that's just giving clear facts, giving the benefits and the deficits to, to uh, a nine only or a 10, nine, 10, and seeing what the community comes back with. If they're supportive of the nine for, for the most part, the other thing is you'd need a critical mass to open the 10th grade anyway. So if not enough people are interested in that, it's a really quick, easy decision. But I don't know if you have any feedback on the few things I just suggested. I apologize that we're doing this so late in the night. Thank you for your questions. We did distribute an MHS interest survey and the survey went out to current eighth and ninth grade families. In fact, the survey went out to 565 families and of the 506, of the 287 families that are currently in the ninth grade, we had 62 respondents. Um, and of the 278, 10th grade families, we had 20 respondents. When you say 10th grade, they're currently in nine, would have been, would go into 10th, or they're already in 10th, so they'd be looking at it for a junior. So when I say ninth, there, those are the students that are currently in the eighth grade. And okay. then when I- So the ones that would be ninth graders would be 10th graders, thank you. Yes. And uh, one thing would be great is to have those kind of, that material with us when we get these presentations. Pre appreciate you doing it. Um, and so you only had 20 respond. How did they respond? So there were, uh, so for the 20 current ninth graders that responded, the would be 10th graders, um, four of those students have siblings at Santa Clara or Wilcox. And out of the four, three indicated that 
they would prefer that their their child attend with their sibling at Wilcox or Santa Clara. So one indicator <coughs> out of the four that have siblings that they would prefer to come to McDonald. And on the ninth, would be ninth graders? The so, 62 of them? Yes, out of the 62 that responded, nine indicated that they had siblings that were attending Santa Clara or Wilcox. And out of the nine, five indicated that they would attend Santa Clara or Wilcox instead of McDonald with their sibling. So I'm assuming then that the other 50, 53 uh, that didn't have siblings all wanted to go to their home school. Yes, be- they, they had indicated interest and um, provided us information about what electives they'd be interested in, whether they'd be interested in joining leadership ASB, whether they, they'd like to participate in band. Um, they also indicated which sports they'd be interested in playing. Um, and we've been collating that data. Um, our plan is to follow up with families so that we can start convening athletics teams, as well as with the numbers um, and interest indicating um, what students would like to be in band and be part of leadership, we can follow up with them as well to make sure that those programs are built out well. So perhaps this is a a question for the consultant. On the band and some of the other curricular, curricular, when you have relatively limited uh, pool of people to pull from, normal band can pull from four years worth of kids. Um, Do you, what experience do you have with that? Is there, can you give any feedback on that? So um, I'm sorry, what's the gentleman's name? Oh, I'm sorry, was that question Gary? directed to me? Gary. Was that question directed to me? I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand that. Yeah, so um, do I have, ex- do, do we have a lot of experience with, with um, address- well, I, I, let, me, let me answer it this way. I, I think it's very possible to make uh, ninth grade uh, opportunities in athletics and band available to ninth graders uh, in ways that are are are, are quite positive. Uh, they are. Yeah, there's no way that I can tell you that they are the same as would be in, uh, available to them in a full nine to twelve completely built out high school. That's I you know I I certainly can't tell you that. Um, I would say that I would say that. Sorry, Gary. Uh, there is a plan that we've been working with Vivian, Vivian on for music because Huerta is not all the way full yet and she won't be full yet that we can, um, the music teacher can draw from both, both schools as part of her, um, his or her first um, few years. Right now we have uh, the music teacher, Monica at Huerta actually serving some of our elementary and Huerta. And so the plan is next year that she would serve, that she she's there at Huerta and was hired for Huerta. She would serve the first year um, to both bands. And then the following year, um, then we would hire once there was enough students at the high school. So we're, we're figuring out different ways to still offer everything. Well, I wasn't really concerned about, I wasn't really concerned about the teaching piece of this. I was more concerned with the student participation piece. And so you've got a sixth grade only at Huerta, which by then will be a six, seven, and you've got a nine only at the other. And to do something like a marching band, for instance, I don't know, you've got a critical mass to make that happen. Um, and so those are the kind of things, and, and there may be creative solutions to those. And this, since it's late, maybe this is too much discussion, I don't know, but it's a big decision. And I wanna be sure that after we make it, we don't have a ton of people coming back going, hey, well, how come I didn't get to go to that school? That's my biggest concern. And it doesn't look like the numbers support that. So I think probably the smart thing for me to do is to let's go ahead and make the approval for the nine only, but then I would like to have you come back to us and let us know what things you can do to mitigate the challenges of a diminished, a diminished student body at a, at a comprehensive high school. Um, I call it a comprehensive high school. I know there's a slightly different model there, but um, because I want to make sure these kids have the best possible advantage. I don't think you're going to get the critical. Trustee Rodman, I'm going to have to cut you off because you're way over. I'm 
tend to be that way. Yeah. Okay, uh, Trustee Fairchild. Thank you, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I feel a little bit panicked. I've been called by parents, staff, various people who attended the presentations who, are, who left very confused and mainly by the themes. And um, because they felt like they didn't want to choose for their 14 year old which theme and have that dictate which electives they could take. And um, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I had to go find your presentation. And I, I left a little confused. And one of the concerns I have even looking, hearing how few people have responded is we need to do a better job selling and marketing this because we, if people are leaving confused about what you're doing, they're not, they don't have buy-in. And you need to have people have buy-in to this, this whole idea. And they, they don't understand what you're selling them. Um, I would like to see the data. I mean, you say you've gotten surveys back and I went and I looked at the survey because I had people ask me questions. And so I went and I, I didn't turn it in, but I went and I went through the survey. And so I know you asked which pathway they'd be interested in. There were eight there. So I guess my question is, do you have the preliminary data? Because I, I don't think some of those were probably chosen very much. Yes, I, yes, I do have some preliminary data from the respondents that we had, um, 82 in total. Right now, the top four choices as indicated by those respondents include um, a top choice, we have academic choice, followed by invention and entrepreneurship. Can you give the numbers? 24 indicated that their top choice was academic choice. For invention and entrepreneurship, 19 indicated that that was their top choice. Um, in third, we have the life sciences health, and 12 indicated that that was their top choice. And that's currently followed by cybersecurity and data analytics. 10 indicating that that was their top choice. Oh, so my, my concern about this high school is that these children, these students get an equitable access to education. And that's why I had asked for us to, and it's, although you listed the classes, I wanted a side-by-side -side comparison with the other high schools as to what options these ninth graders are going to have. A shiny new school is going to get a certain amount of people to come no matter what. But we have some very savvy parents who are going to look at Santa Clara High with its STEM program and marching band and all the bells and whistles there and Wilcox with all of its bells and whistles. And we have to sell your school that this is going to be a great opportunity. Now, some people like the small size. Uh, as a former athlete, I, you're not selling me on athletics, no offense. I want to be in an established program, um, but you know there are some people that will want that, and that's great. But they didn't even know what sports we were going to be doing, and and open enrollment starts. And we're talking like four weeks. I mean, it's like tomorrow in Edge Speak, and so these parents, if they're going to go, they they're making the decision right now if they're going to enroll here or they're going to try to get their soon to be ninth grader. And so I'm just concerned that we've had so few respondents and just, we don't even have a lot of data from you as to what pe how people are reacting other than the word on the street and people calling us and other things. And, and we know we always hear I gotta cut you off. the negative. Yeah. Yes, please cut me off. So is, uh, is there a question in there about how are we doing outreach to more of our eighth grade students or what? Yeah, what's so, your yeah, there? because they're really briefly, be, what's your question in there? How, how are we going to get more, more information and how are we going to sell this? Because other high schools will be going in and students will start comparing what they can take at Santa Clara high versus what they can take at McDonald high or a private school for that. or a private school. They will talk to each other. Okay. about what's available. What are answers? 
So on October 27th, we initially sent out our survey, our interest survey, and a little bit of preliminary information about the high school. Um, we sent out reminders on November 10th and the 16th and the 18th, primarily via text to encourage our families to take the survey and to visit our website. We have an additional family information scheduled for January 25th. And we are also planning to conduct eighth grade visits during the last week of January. We will also be holding a series of events after winter break. And parents are more than welcome to set up an appointment via Zoom and or in person. Um, I currently hold an office at Huerta Middle School and I'm available to meet with students, students and parents. In fact, I have. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet one parent in person, one parent via Zoom, and I'm open to continuing to meet um, on an appointment only basis, as well as at these different events that we'll hold in the spring, in addition to eighth grade visits. We're really excited to share about our programming. And I know um, part of uh, our ability to go out to the community was to first bring the information to the board, um, but we're excited to, we're excited to get out there and, and really share what we have to offer. I want to also point out that um, that Dr. Ronlay and Mr. Baldwin have been uh, have been meeting with community members to sort of finalize out what this uh, model will look like and getting input. And they've been they've met already. I think is it, have you met twice or just once? You've met twice with the yes to finalize out what this what the process will look like and um, and the program. Uh, can you go over if you guys, because I, I hear the question the board is asking, I think we still need to put this, put this to rest is what is a typical course scheduled for a ninth grader and what would it look like at McDonald high school? So what does a typical freshman take in terms of their coursework? A typical freshman um, at any, any high school, as well as at McDonald high school will take English nine or English nine honors. They'll take a math class. So that kind of depends on their, the math level that they had in the eighth grade. They'll all take biology. And as part of the state requirement, they'll take PE. Um, we highly encourage students to take a world language since it is an A through G requirement and also an additional A through G elective um, in various categories. Oftentimes we encourage students to take a visual and performing arts A through G elective. So that would be like a typical ninth grade schedule. Um, sometimes that sixth elective class may fall under other content area categories as electives, but that's a typical freshman schedule. And at McDonald High School, we will ensure that students have access to all of those A through G courses as well. One of the challenges with a small high school is staffing up when you have students that are in like an honors English versus a regular English or you know, as you're growing the school, because I, I was a staff, I was a vice principal that opened a new high school in Texas. And I it got to experience what it was like um, having, you know, we had smaller classes initially, but then the school grew uh, into what it became. And it took a while for the football team to, to you know, be competitive. But I want you to share a little bit about how, how can, how does the staffing, how do you do creative staffing in this scenario? There are a few ways to do creative staffing. One way is to create combination honors and regular classes, um, especially at the, in English. Um, and this is a great opportunity for teachers to really explore their content and to create a higher level of rigor, but also encourage teachers to figure out differ, different, differentiated approaches to providing instruction to all students and to raising the level of rigor for all students in their classes. Okay, um, thank you for that. Trustee Ratterman. So I don't know a lot about the model that you're putting together, but I've heard a little of it. You just mentioned that there were interests in engineering, in, in um, academics, et cetera. And the little bit I've heard is that, well, you choose one of these, you choose to be in a STEM program. And so you make that decision at the beginning, and then you stay in that track or that pathway all the way through. So the question I have is if I'm a sophomore and I decide I was a freshman, I take, I take uh, STEM, I get about a thing and I get 
I hate it, you know, so I want to go to humanities, whatever the humanities option is. Can you change pathways? Do you get stuck in this track all the way through? What's the, how do you envision that piece of this working? And, and I'd love to know a little more, unfortunately, we have hardly any time, but I'd like to know a little more about what this, this model is, because we, I don't, if we've you've shared it with us, I don't, I apologize, it didn't. Uh. I'll just say that the typical linked learning pathways approach allows students at the end of the freshman year to change pathways if they really don't like it. Typically, the data is quite low because students become essentially part of a community and the relationships that they have with the other students and their teachers tend to outweigh their, this, the career theme. And it is really more of a theme that helps to integrate the academic courses to create thematic connections. So it really gives kind of a real world applied context to what frequently is more abstract academic learning. And the courses only really get sort of more substantially CTE in the 11th and 12th grade. And by then the students are clear on where their interest lies. So they're not locked in in the ninth grade. They're fluid, they can go from one thing to another. You know, at some point. Are they locked in in the tenth grade? Fewer than fewer than ten. What, Gary? Five to ten percent of kids typically change, um, and this is based on national data. Um, so there's of not. I mean, many? if a kid, we don't want a kid feeling like they're locked in. Period. So, but the the number of kids who are seeking to change is very very low. So, so is I don't what's, think we would want to create a model that locks a kid. Yeah, I think what's really important to understand is that the the courses are thematic based on. Uh, the the particular pathway that they're in, but we are all what, what we'll also do is we're going to core the classes so they'll be cored, and so if they want to change a theme, they could if they could change, uh, and it wouldn't cost them any credits or anything like that. It just means they're going to shift from one team to the other, and and so the way they're designing this out, the the students will be cored by a set of three classes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just briefly add. Um, Okay. Brad's correct. Um, Gentleman online is trying to speak, but he's muted. No, I'm not. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Yes. Yeah, just to just to briefly add, I the purpose of the theme is not to certainly not to force or even encourage uh, students to choose a career. Uh, the purpose of the theme is to provide some focus and some coherence that enables teachers, both academic and career and technical education, uh, to bring a lot more relevance and real world application uh, to both the, you know, especially the core academics, obviously it already exists in, in career and technical education. So uh, I think it's important that students understand that, the parents understand that. It's perfectly fair. I mean, it's to expect students to choose a career in ninth grade is simply not, not it's not only unrealistic, it's not appropriate for many students. So being clear about what the purpose of the theme is, is important. Uh, and that in turn, I think, helps mitigate the, um, uh, the concerns that people have about the numbers of students who want to change pathways. They certainly can do that. Uh, in most of the schools where we work, they ask students to stay with it for a year. Um, but at the end of the year, if they want to make a, a switch, they can. Okay, can we, um, can we go ahead and vote on this? And if we have further questions about the, the program, maybe we can um, send those questions to Dr. Kemp to get answered. So we do have a motion on the table for opening ninth grade only, um, made by Trustee Gonzalez and seconded by Trustee Canova. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero, thank you. Can um, we get a present, a, an actual full comprehensive presentation? I mean, I'm just sitting here. I, I went through the whole. We brought yeah. it, We had a presentation to the board a while back about the concept. Now, as we're getting closer to finishing the design of it, we'll bring another presentation back to the board. Yes. So, um, I'm thinking maybe January. To, okay. To see more on what the how the program's laying out and survey results and all that. Okay. 
I know we've got a short time and I haven't got the, the mic yet officially, but I really want to thank you for the presentation. I think uh, you've put your heart and soul in this and I can see that there was a lot of effort and work that was put into it. And I want you to know it was appreciated. We ask a lot of difficult questions and I'm sorry about that's just the character of it, but we really appreciate what you've been doing. Thank you very much for all the hard work and, and effort. Absolutely. She's, she's not walking away because we have um, P.2. So don't, don't thank her until we're done with her. Um, we do have this uh, item, grandfathering rule for McDonald High School. Um, so if you could quickly, you know, we are motion to rapidly approve. running out of time. Um, okay, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from uh, Trustee Gonzalez. And this is um, the grandfathering rule. Um, which, Can we put it up there? Yeah, it says that um, all 2022, 2023 ninth graders living within the McDonald High School boundary will attend um, unless the grandfathering rule applies or they are accepted on open enrollment. Um, parents of rising ninth graders who have another child who will be enrolled at Santa Clara or Wilcox next year may request that the rising ninth grader attend the same school as their sibling instead of um, McDonald High School. Transportation will continue to be provided for grandfathered students through 24-25, so for those students. Um, the rec this recommendation is aligned with Agnew and Huerta. So that is the grandfathering rule that we are looking to accept. Um, I think, have I just read your slide for you? Yes, I think thank I have. You. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm just trying to move this along. Trustee Fairchild. Okay, so um, I've already alluded to this, but I do have a concern because so um, the school's going to be so small and it, who knows what they're is going to be offered that students who have a specific interest in say, um, being part of the auto shop at Wilcox, or, I mean, the other high schools just have so much more. And um, I'm really struggling, you know, like you have a student who's been, you know, wanting to play for Wilcox football, their whole career, you know, since they're a little kid saying, no, you hopefully you'll get in there and open enrollment because there are other opportunities and classes available. As a parent, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm not so far away from this. I'm saying, wow, electives online, please don't make me go back to online or my child go back to online. And so while I'm glad this, uh, I'm happy with this, I also am worried about those kids that- You're out of time. So wind, it, wind up your question. Okay, I'm worried about those kids that maybe decline for uh, open enrollment that have real, that have needs that will only be addressed at the high schools, the other high schools, because of the uh, number of courses you can offer, the number of electives you have, your, um, your sports and various um, things. So I think it needs to be a little more comprehensive. So um, I don't know if we have anyone in the room who can, um, Dr. Kemp, Tell us about how um, it, it, how successful our open enrollment process has been in, in letting kids attend other high schools than what they wanted in the past. I, I don't have that data, but this, um, you know, the open enrollment process exists. So this is almost a guarantee for those who have, this is a grandfathering rule. Then we have the regular open enrollment. So it depends on, on the capacity at the high school where they're going to uh, whether or not there's going to be the space available. These are growing pains. This is this problem with the lack of access to electives is only the beginning because the first the first two years, once we be once we have a junior class and a senior class at McDonald High School, we're going to have the same offerings that we have at our other schools and opportunities for our students. And many of them are based on what the student need is. So this is part of the growing pains. A freshman class, they don't take a bunch of electives. Some some electives freshmen don't take and they're not available to them. So, you know, it's it's this is gonna be part of that process. But what we're offering here is saying this, if uh, we wanna give families some flexibility outside of our traditional open enrollment process, if we went with a straight boundary, then it would require that every student who wanted to grandfather had to do, go through this open enrollment. Here we're saying we're going to grant it to you if you want it. 
And if you don't, then, then you go to the new high school. And we're saying, if you're not within this open enrollment, like let's say you're a freshman and you have no sibling that goes to Wilcox or Santa Clara High School, you're gonna follow the open enrollment process. And that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a way to do that. But we can't grant every student carte blanche to go to any high school in this city. Uh, we in our in our school district, we have to have some parameters and this actually gives more flexibility to families through the grandfathering for existing students that are attending the high school. And it's the same process that the board approved in 2018. Okay, Trustee Gonzalez and then Trustee Radman. Really, uh, we've worked with students, we've worked with uh, the community to make sure that we provide you know, the best that we can and grandfathering is one of the, those aspects that we've done historically and I think that doing it here is uh, is something to the testament to the board and and staff and, and uh, our district that we you know we definitely want to make sure that we can provide for our students in the manner that they choose obviously if if they don't have a sibling at one of the other high schools then they're not going to have that uh, that grandfathering rule and they'll have to go to the open enrollment as Dr. Kemp has mentioned um, but uh, I believe that the district has really gone beyond even offering transportation into 24, 25. I mean, we we have transportation. Other districts have gotten rid of the transportation. Okay, so we, we're doing a lot in our district to, to provide for our students, their parents, and the community. And I, I think this is just a testament to what we're doing. And I think that uh, you know, we should pass this grandfathering recommendation. And uh, obviously, there are there are growing pains. You know, this is not going to be a four year out the bat high school, and we understand that. But uh, hey, thank you. Wind that up. Okay, um, Trustee Raderman, and then we'll call for a vote. The other thing to keep in mind is that the open enrollment is going to work two ways. Uh, one, some of the people are going to want to get into the McDonald High School. They'll be really excited about the new school, and that's the direction they're going to want to go. Um, and a certain number of kids will obviously go to McDonald's. So our comprehensive high schools that have currently had diff have been difficult to get into because they're running close to 2,000 each will suddenly drop down to much, much lower attendance. So open enrollment should be easier to get into them should someone want to, because they've got a, an existing thing that they've been looking to continue. So I don't think it's gonna be as big a problem. Uh, if it is, then we will have to take a look at it after. I, I don't think we're gonna know until it, it develops. Um, and so and I, I believe say, that all the kids who um, tried for open enrollment um, got in. The last couple of and years. And that's my point. I think they're going to, I think they're going to get, it's an issue. I think they're getting, one thing we might want to take a look at is there has been a ban on open enrollment because somebody wants to play on a particular football team. I think that maybe needs to be taken a close look at um, because that was one of the examples that was there. And somebody's got their heart set on being a, a star quarterback. He might not really want to do that. And we might give them options. Okay, thank you for that. That's that's a really good point. I think there's some CIF rules related to that. Yeah, there are. It's out of our control. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Raderman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez to do the um, grandfathering as uh, recommended um, by the staff. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Ida. Thank you so much. Now I can say thank you as you walk away. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, okay, P.3 okay. waiver of administrative hearing regarding student 11182.1a.1. Second, Rotterman. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Ratterman. Um, any comments or questions? We've seen this. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? That passes seven to zero, thank you. Okay, we have um, a few minutes. I think we're gonna go a little over 12 because I don't want to cut our uh, union presidents off. Um, the COVID-19 update um, was in the packet. Um, if there's anything further on that or the reports from facility development planning and, and bonds, can, um, we get that from you, Dr. Kemp, or if you have questions, you can ask Dr. Kemp directly because we've run out of time. The educator- oh, yeah. Can I just ask one question quickly? Uh, no, because we don't have time. And I've got two union presidents on the line. If uh, they go fast, then we might have a few minutes, but um, you'll need to email Dr. Kemp. It doesn't work. Okay, so um, I'll go to reports from union presidents. 
can you um, bring um, our UTSC and our uh, and Lynn? I see Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn. Yes, um, I was excited at the beginning of this meeting because it's been a while since I was able to give a report and I was looking forward to giving the report. But to be honest, we are both each supposed to get five minutes. There isn't 10 minutes left in the meeting, so I'm going to um, not give my report tonight. I did have a report prepared and I would just like to conclude by respectfully asking that can you it's just 10 minutes. If you could please consider putting us earlier on the agenda so that I don't sit here for seven hours or six hours or five hours or whatever it is um, to give my report, that would be greatly appreciated and I, I would appreciate that. So that's all I have to say for tonight. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Um, this is Amber. In solidarity with Lynn, I am to declining my report. And, um, and asking that we be moved up so that we have adequate time to share information. So I'll conclude my report with that and um, have a good Thanksgiving. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so that was Q.1. We've already gotten the report on Q.2. Um, so you've got a one minute. Trustee Fairchild, which one did you want to make a comment on? So I had submitted this as an agenda item request and it wasn't added. So then I put it in and it's a question under the facility development planning. And that is regarding the music room at Cabrillo. And in the response I got, it said, well, we looked at the possibility of relocating an existing portable and, and it didn't work because of the height. Our, we have options other than one of our existing portables. We can actually look out and look at purchasing a portable. Um, when we were looking at creating the temporary campus, when we didn't um, have McDonald High, we looked at lots of options. And so I am requesting that this come back. I'm requesting that we consider the equity for the Cabrillo students and um, look at what we can do and to solve this problem. We heard from so many parents and students and it needs to be on the agenda and it continues not to be. I'm gonna make a motion to add the music uh, discussion about the music room to the next agenda. Second. Um, Okay, add um, music room at. Okay, and that was made by uh, add uh, to the next agenda an update on the music room at Cabrillo. That was made by Trustee Ratterman and seconded by, is that uh, Trustee Gonzalez? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, any other comments or can, should we just take a vote on that? All those discussion with options and, and something that's broad enough we can have a discussion without having limits. A solution. Solutions. Okay, solution options. Got it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that passes seven to zero. Okay. Um, to adjourn? No, hang on. We need to do R2, R1. R1, uh, discussion item on educator effectiveness block grant. What do you what do you need from us as a discussion item? We wanna know if the board has any questions regarding the proposal for the block grant. Uh, if there are none, we wanna bring it back for action the next board meeting as we're required to meet a deadline established by the state. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice sum of money for professional development. Absolutely. Okay, does anyone have any uh, so comments we'll or concerns? To, we'll to, if you have comments or you're gonna to need to submit them, I think, because you only have four minutes. Yes, so if you have questions, otherwise I'll, we'll bring it back as an action item at the next meeting. Okay, um, sounds good. Um, okay, um, we have um, a governance retreat on Saturday um, at 9 a.m. It will not be streamed um, or on webinar. Um, and then our next regular meeting is on December 9th um, at six, well, uh, time to be determined. Okay, uh, motion to adjourn. Rotterman. By, okay, and second by. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? And we are adjourned.
at 1157.